Okay, welcome back everybody for uh, this long session of today, Friday. Um, uh, we are now uh, streaming live on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to uh, have Vishwesha Guttal from the Indian Institute of Science uh, uh, to deliver a set of lectures. And uh, uh, the title of today's lecture is uh, uh, Stochasticity and Bistability in Ecological Systems, uh, Part 1. Uh, so, uh, as always, you can uh, uh, raise your hand and uh, you can type your questions in the chat and uh, Vishwesh and myself will keep uh, an eye on it. Uh, uh, and then, uh, depending on uh, uh, on how this question want to deal with that, you can answer immediately or at the end of the lecture. Okay. So with that, I leave you the floor. Looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, delivering these uh, talks at an ICTP meeting. Um, I was very much hoping to visit ICTP, but unfortunately, as you all know. <laughs> Everything is uh, virtual uh, these days. The last time, uh, there was only one time I did really visit ICTP. That was when I was an MSc student. And uh, it was in 2002 in the summer. Um, so, but hopefully, uh, maybe again in the near future, I will do a real visit to ICTP. Um, OK, so uh, welcome, everyone. I'm going to share my slides now. So I would like to keep it. Uh, you know, interactive. So if you have a question, uh, type it out. If it's uh, something absolutely not clear, you know, you, you know, just I think you should just unmute and also speak. And that's, that, that makes it easy for me as well. So I have some plan uh, to cover topics, but I'm not, I don't have to cover everything as I just want to make sure everybody's uh, with me. Um, so the broad, uh, goal of the three talks that I have planned is to sort of introduce you all to uh, bi-stability in ecological systems and, uh, and the role of stochasticity. How do we apply these models in the context of real data as well? So it's going to be a combination of theory and how do we look at real systems in the context of these theories that are sort of deeply uh, inspired by nonlinear dynamical literature, uh, nonlinear dynamical systems literature. Okay, so the three part of my talks are sort of planned this way. So in the first part, which is today, I am going to talk about what we call mean field approach. Uh, so I would imagine that you would have heard the word mean field in some talks throughout these last two weeks of fascinating talks. So I'm going to look at a mean field approach in this uh, first hour today. Uh, and how do we understand uh, ecological systems, those with bi-stability uh, using mean field approaches, okay? So one specific question that are the aim for today would be, can we predict? So whenever we have this bi-stability, uh, we have something called tipping points. Okay, now the question, the main question or the main motivation for today's Sort of discussion would be how can we use these main field approaches to predict or anticipate tipping points in ecological systems. So the second part, uh, which would be I think next Tuesday, uh, it will be on you know the same question but looking at spatial dynamics. Uh, okay, the real ecosystems are spatially spread, spatially extended. Uh, what can we do something better than what we do today? Okay. And uh, the part three would be something more general, more interest, uh, equally interesting, hopefully. So, but you know, part three, uh, how much of that I will cover um, will depend on how much I'm able to accomplish my goals for the part one and part two, okay? So, so the main, uh, so let me, so this is the outline for today's talk. Uh, so the main motivation uh, to study by stability comes from, uh, the idea of tipping points and abrupt transitions. So I will uh, provide that motivation, why we must be interested in bi-stability in ecological systems. I will then move on 
to describe simple mathematical theories uh, uh, of bistability and tipping points. And then I will introduce some mathematical techniques intuitively, you know, I, there will not be too many calculations and so on. Uh, and then how can we use these mathematical theories and intuition that we build to predict or anticipate tipping points in real ecological systems. And finally, the last part of my talk would be a discussion on and the demonstration of empirical evidence for these mathematical predictions. Okay, so that's the broad goal. And I'm, I, I understand that, you know, Carla Staver has already covered some aspects of some examples of, uh, you know, uh, what I'm going to present today. Uh, so, so I hope there might be some repetition, some overlap. Uh, so please bear me with that if uh, it is, there is some overlap. But uh, to make my talk self-contained, I have assumed that you may not have heard her talk or you may not have, you may have forgotten some of the details from her talk. Okay, so here is an example of, uh, you know, I'm going to give some examples, empirically documented examples of abrupt transitions in ecological system. So this is an example of a large scale abrupt change, large scale desertification. So what you are seeing here is the Northern Africa. Uh, if you look at uh, various proxies for vegetation in this huge landscape, okay, let me see, um, let me switch on the pointer. Okay. So if you look at this large landscape, if you look at proxies for this large landscape over last 10,000 years, you find that uh, preceding 5,000 years uh, before present day, uh, the vegetation sediments were dramatically different from what you see today. So this, this current phase, current state of Northern Africa, which is Sahara, which is desert, uh, was not always a desert. In fact, the sediments indicate that they were in an entirely different, different state of vegetation. In fact, it had a pretty, uh, you know, decent level of vegetation in the landscape for several, for several thousands of years before it suddenly tipped and became the current state. Here is another example of the opposite type, and this is on a much more local scale. So what you are seeing here is not a continental scale, but really a scale of half a kilometer by half a kilometer area in China, where uh, over the last 60 to 65 years, the 60 year in this graph presents, represents 2010 also, uh, the grass cover in this area has changed. It used to be a low grass cover area, and then it has now settled down to a larger grass cover area. So this was an example of a restoration of grassland ecosystem. Uh, and uh, it has, it stayed in this low state for several decades before sort of switching and becoming a uh, moderately covered grassland state in the present day. Here is a third example of a lake eutrophication. Um, you know, data is obviously noisy from many, many ecological systems, but indicates some very interesting features. For the same amount, same values of drivers, you can have, you know, different values of the state variable. The state variable here is the sort of, you know, some measure of fraction of the lake surface covered by, uh, you know, vegetation. Okay. So what you see here is that, uh, you know, what uh, physicists would call hysteresis, when 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 the lake underwent. Uh, when the lake had a very high level of phosphorus concentration. So that's those are the red dots in this right extreme and, and, uh, and a very low amount of the vegetation. As the, as this phosphorus values came down, it continued to remain in that state of low vegetation. However, it increased and, uh, and a reverse transition, however, happened for, across a different route entirely, different direction. So this is called hysteresis in the, using the language of, uh, that is also used in physics and magnetic systems. Here is a, another example, classically cited as that of, you know, abrupt transition, which is that of stock market crashes. So where the stock markets often are in, even when they're in a, a very 
state of boom, there could be sudden crashes in the indices. That is uh, remarkable over a very, very short period of time. Okay, so sort of the, if I, if I sort of summarize and uh, look at all these transitions uh, that happened, so they often are abrupt. They are abrupt changes in the state of complex systems. And once the change has happened, it's not just abrupt, it actually remains in that new state once the change has happened. It's a persistent change as well. And typically, they seem to have happened for no obvious changes in the driver values. So in every one of the example I gave, uh, no, people don't quite know what was the driver that changed dramatically that could have also caused an abrupt change in the state of ecosystems. So, so the basic idea is that even for gradual changes in the known drivers, system can respond in an abrupt way. And sometimes these changes are irreversible. For example, if vegetation is lost, uh, if certain species are lost, you can not really recover them back. And even when you can recover, uh, they could still be irreversible on time scales that human sort of you know deal with. So in uh, so in studying this now, you know, these are the empirical phenomena I have just described. We're going to hear a whole bunch of terms that which you may or may not have heard. Regime shift. So so many of these sudden ecological changes from one ecological state to others, they are also called regime shifts. They are also genetically called abrupt transitions or tipping point events and more terms like critical transitions. So you will hear some of these terms, I will sort of clarify as and when necessary. Uh, stochastic transitions because they're, they're often driven by a large amount of stochasticity in the drivers. And the mathematical concept called bifurcation, which I'm assuming you may be familiar now uh, with many, many of these talks and hysteresis. Okay, so I'm going to uh, use some of these terms and define them more precisely when necessary. Okay, so with these examples I showed you, this is the example of this large scale continental scale desertification. This is a relatively local scale recovery of a grassland and then a stock market crash. So what are the important questions that people in the ecology literature or people more broadly in the complex system literature are interested in? Okay, so one is, you know, how do we mathematically model these systems? Okay, so do you build a very detailed process-based model to understand the systems? Yes, that is one approach. Or can we sort of develop fairly simple heuristic mathematical models that only captures essential details? The second question that people have been interested, you know, can we really uh, have predictions for these kind of transitions? Uh, are there early warning signals before these transitions happen. So if there were such warnings, then one can do something to stop these events from happening. So for example, in this specific case, imagine hypothetically you were somewhere here, and if you had been given data from here to here, likewise, if you were somewhere before this dotted line here, you had somewhere here, let us say, if you had been given data, time series of cross cover, could you have anticipated this abrupt transition? Likewise, in the stock market, which of course has you know really huge applications. Okay, so so that sort of sets motivation for studying these phenomena and to study them, uh, you know, mathematicians, applied mathematicians, physicists, as well as ecologists, and many of them have you know applied mathematicians and physicists and ecologists. They have been using mathematical theory, theories of bistability and tipping points. So I'm going to describe those simple models uh, now and, uh, and see how we can model them and how do we to do, try to do predictions of these models. Okay. So, so here is a very simple model of ecosystem collapse. So here in, in this model, you know, you know, ecosystem is represented by a single variable. The ecosystem is really a large interacting system of species, right? However, one can think of ecosystem or you know sort of lump all of those into a single quantity called biomass density and one can think of you know how this biomass density is changing over time and what is the dynamics and the, and the simplest models 
of these ecosystem uh, dynamics have this concept called carrying capacity and an intrinsic growth rate R under carrying capacity K. And, uh, and in the, you know, uh, as long as this uh, intrinsic growth rate is R, R is positive, the, the, the biomass density V will reach a carrying capacity K over a period of time. This is also called the logistic growth model. Okay. Now, ecosystems are under constant pressure, not on, uh, both internally and externally. One such important, uh, you know, one such important process is that of grazing. Grazing could be driven entirely by uh, herbivores within the system. It could also be driven by livestock, that human settlements that are there nearby forests. And usually this is modeled as this um, uh, sigmoidal rate function. So v squared divided by v squared plus v zero squared. This is represents loss due to grazing. This is a nonlinear term. Um, so basically, this assumes that uh, if the v is low, the the grazing rate is small. But if it increases, it increases nonlinearly and saturates to a value of c. So what is the what are the uh, equilibrium values of this uh, of this simple mathematical model of ecosystem. So equilibrium will be achieved when the logistic growth term will be equal to loss due to grazing. And if you calculate uh, the equilibrium points, what you find for some values of R, K, this is what you will find. So on the x-axis, the driver, which is the grazing rate, C here. Okay, and y-axis is the steady state or the equilibrium biomass density. So what you find here is, uh, you know, when the grazing rates are low, of course, you will still have, um, you know, uh, for example, here I have chosen a value of k is equal to 10. So the steady state biomass density will be still close to the original carrying capacity. However, as you increase the grazing rate, that does reduce. But what is really interesting is there is a threshold value of this grazing rate. And once the system reaches the threshold value, the system will collapse into a low widget, low biomass density state. And now if you do a reversal, it doesn't go back at the same point, but the system will stay in this low biomass density state before undergoing a transition back to a high biomass density states. Okay. So to understand these systems, uh, one can uh, think of uh, this simple intuitive picture, which is that of a ball rolling in a landscape. So what is this landscape? Think of x-axis on the landscape as, um, let me see if I can also write. Okay. Think of this as the biomass density eco ecosystem state. And uh, so wherever the ball settles, that becomes the stable state. So in this case, it will settle in this point or in here. So this is, a, this is a low biomass density state and a high biomass density state. And they both can coexist. And depending on where you start this ball, it can go here or it can go here. So this simple intuitive landscape picture can actually capture uh, how, the, how a system can have two stable states. So the one stable state is the low, uh, the, the deep well here. And the other one is the shallower, but a local minima here. Okay, so this is an example of what is called a bi-stability. Okay, uh, so you can think of ecosystem stable states as a balling roll in a cup or wherever it settles in this rolling cup or loading landscape. Okay, and then, you know, there's also this important concept of basin of attraction. So, so anywhere, if I, if I drop the ball anywhere to the left of this line, right, we will have the ball rolling to this side. This is the basin of attraction for um, this a low biomass density state, and this is the basin of attraction for the large biomass density state. And then this leads to the concept of resilience and because there is always a possibility that this ball will you know, switch over to other minima. Uh, so how resilient is a system is a question uh, that's extremely important from an ecological point of view. So mathematically, how do we define this potential? It turns out that if we have a simple model where x, x basically is, uh, is a dynamical variable, you can define x by x, a simple integration 
of this rate function. You know, some x zero to x. So this function uh, is precisely what I have plotted in the previous graph to obtain this uh, obtain the potential landscape. So this potential landscape is not just an intuitive picture. For simple models, one can actually uh, mathematically uh, represent them as well. Okay. So uh, I'm going to skip some of those. So no, the, clearly this landscape picture is quite useful because we can think of minima as corresponding to stable equilibrium, maxima as corresponding to unstable equilibrium, and it captures features like hysteresis. You know, you know, and the fact that there is an initial condition dependence in these systems, and also that system, many biological systems are sort of you know irreversible, or you know, or they take long time to reverse once they are in another state. So all this can be nicely captured from this potential landscape picture. So one can also do the following. This was whatever I have been discussing so far is a deterministic picture. So what, however, what we can do is introduce some stochasticity to these models. So I'm calling them ad hoc stochasticity because I have, what I've done here is I have taken the deterministic mean field model and, uh, and then I have just added stochasticity, stochastic term to this. Basically here, sigma v is the strength of stochasticity and eta v is the uh, a random number which is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And we also assume that the random numbers are uncorrelated over time. So we can, you know, incorporate these kind of simple stochasticities and one has to be a bit cautious while doing so. Uh, for example, you want to ensure that the biomass density is never really negative. So I'm not going to go into those kind of technical details here. So, so what happens in, in when we introduce the stochasticity is we can now capture much more realistic features of dynamics. For example, here's an example of a vegetation system that is undergoing a collapse from a, you know, you know some, some value of near the carrying capacity to a low value and almost in this case, really uh, value of zero or close to zero. So this, this is an example of simulation where a system has undergone a tipping from a, uh, you know, moderate or high value of vegetation density to close to zero. On the other hand, you can also have a scenario where the system will sort of, you know, fluctuate between two stable states. You know, there is one stable state here, other stable state here, and the system can actually fluctuate between the two states depending on the uh, nature of stochasticity. So this is where I want to clarify a few terms here. So in this diagram, this is also, this is called, sometimes called stability diagram. It's also called bifurcation diagram. So in this bifurcation diagram, this point where the green branch is ending or this point where the black branch is ending, those are called bifurcation points or also tipping points and critical points in the context of nonlinear dynamical systems. Uh, and the transition that happen near this critical point, they are called critical transitions, abrupt transitions, and if they have catastrophic consequences, you also call them catastrophic transitions. However, you know, these transitions can also happen um, when you are not necessarily close to critical points. Imagine you're really, this is a critical point, right? So this 2.6 in this specific case. However, if the system is somewhere near in the middle of this bistable region. So there is this region of bistability from values, uh, you know, close to you know, 1.5 to 2.6. If you're in the middle of this region, but I'm the stochasticity, the external stochasticity is high, even then the system can fluctuate between these two states. And which means that even far from a tipping point, far from critical point, you can actually have uh, you know, abrupt transitions from one state to other state. And these are called stochastic transitions. And what is interesting is this can actually take you back and forth. It doesn't necessarily take you to one side, it can take you back and forth. Okay, so remember these classifications, of course I will revise these. So there are two types of transitions I just mentioned here. One is that of critical transitions or tipping point transitions. The other one is a stochastic transitions. So there's something that happens far from the tipping point or the critical point, okay? So this provides, so whatever I have done so far is, you know, 
some a very simple mathematical model which has single variable and uh, and uh, it can sort of capture various properties of empirically observed phenomena so we had in the empirical systems we had observed abrupt transitions right we had observed hysteresis and uh, these two simple uh, empirically observed phenomena they can be nicely captured with this simple model of bistability so that's the point of the uh, my talk so far and then i have also introduced you to this concept of potentials and this was helpful to intuitively understand uh, uh, you know intuitively understand uh, how do we think of the dynamics so now can we go for you know one purpose of mathematics is not just to reproduce empirically observed features of course we do want to do that that's the bare minimum but can we do something more and something more in this context is can you provide can you predict tipping points can you anticipate tipping points can you forecast tipping points that's the question i am now going to address so uh, so for example in this context of bifurcation diagram let's imagine there is a real system that exactly follows this bifurcation diagram however we want to we want to know uh, we know that the grazing rates are increasing but i don't know if i am here or if i am here where am i is there some way of knowing where is the current parameter value okay that's the question that we are interested in now i just want to check if there are any questions at this stage so i'm sort of halfway through my talk today i have a question sure so uh, in that equation where you uh, go to the equation slides sure so yeah yeah here here what is the functional form of v you always show a plot v versus c with some bi stability and s shaped curve mm -hmm. yeah so what's the mathematical functional form of v yeah yeah ha huh. uh, so basically v i don't have that with me right now uh, but you know if you set the condition for equilibrium which would be that you know this logistic term becomes equal to grazing term right you will have a cubic equation oh, oh, okay then from that bifurcation analysis you got yeah, plot okay exactly exactly yeah you set this and you get a cubic equation to solve you have of course mm -hmm. v equal to 0 is one equilibrium yeah and then you have a cubic equation to solve yeah yeah, yeah. and the, those are the roots of the cubic equation any other questions yeah and this is the mathematical form you assume but is it also common in real data that's an excellent question so these are you know um, you know sort of you know one can think of them as uh, somewhat like toy models they are uh, inspired by the terms that have in included they are inspired by ecological processes but you know depending on the ecosystem that i'm thinking of okay uh, the exact terms can be dramatically different uh, so the question is how useful are they okay so so my answer so the one way to think about that is to go back to this potential picture any sorry if I, can we think of a, another bistable ecological system let's say i don't know the equation right yes, yes. Uh, but i know but i know the i know that the uh, the ecosystem has bistability as long as i can think of them in this potential well form okay no how do you know that your system has bistability you are given just a time series with some abundance or land cover data ha huh, but i showed you that it does show um, right you know it shows the abrupt transitions it shows hysteresis and both of these are consistent with the existence of bistability but that's 5000 year long desert time series yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah or i showed you several others i also showed you one grassland lake data right which is uh, much lesser in like more like 50 to 60 years and then um, we also there are also many many more data sets you know i will show you some references towards the end uh, so obviously you know there is no one model that will capture all of those in one equation right so i am using sort of you know uh, what are called stylistic features and try to capture them using the models so the idea is not to cap you know compare the models with data directly but idea is to compare the predictions and the sort of you know 
so with that so i know with the what happens in data okay So let me go to the next part now. Okay. So, so the question I, we are trying to going to address now is, um, uh, you know, if somebody, you know, if 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 you, if you had time series data, could you somehow tell? I am far from. This is the tipping point, right? This is the bifurcation point. Am I far from the bifurcation point, or am I really close to? It? Is there some way of finding signatures of that from the? Let's say time series data of the type that's available in nature. Uh, okay, that's the question we're addressing. So this is uh, so what you now need to do is uh, look at these potential wells I showed you as a function of the grazing rate in the specific model I showed you. So, for example, in this grazing rate, you know we are quite far from the uh, critical point here. This is much closer to the critical point, right? Now observe this landscape features, which I have computed from the mathematical model. This is the landscape far from the threshold point. This is the landscape close to the threshold point or the bifurcation point. Okay. So the landscape here has, you know, is symmetrical, right? It also is relatively deep. In contrast, the landscape in this case, right, landscape where the ball is rolling is actually has two features. One is there is an asymmetric feature compared to this. It also is shallower. It's also shallow around the you know uh, minima. So one can ask, do these features of the landscape, do they have effect on the observed dynamics of the data? So what I am now going to do is whether these two features, the shallower landscape in this case, and also an asymmetric landscape. How do these affect the dynamics of the ecosystem? If the model was right, okay? So obviously we're going to assume the model is right and we're studying within the context of these models. So again, I'm showing you this is, you know, far from the threshold. This is close to the threshold. And, you know, basically we need to think of this as, you know, this ball rolling in this landscape, what happens? So if you know, now do simulations of this model, uh, what you find is far from the threshold, uh, you know, this uh, the vegetation biomass, uh, of course, fluctuates because of stochasticity around the, around the minima. And so does in this case, closer to the threshold. But, you know, one can visually compare these two time series and observe that there are notable differences. One is that in this case, the amplitude of these fluctuations are large. Right. And secondly, there are these, you know, sort of, you know, you know, uh, spikes that you're observing towards the lower values. In some sense, there are no analogs of that in this, you know, there is an asymmetry in the time series again that you're observing here, which is a consequence of asymmetry in this, uh, you know, potential landscape. Okay. So, and so what this tells you is there is something about the dynamics that is fundamentally different between you know, these two values. One is that there's another point which I forgot to mention, sorry. You know, as you are, if you are in a deeper well as compared to a shallower well, the system will take much longer to return to the equilibrium if you are in a shallower well. If there was a perturbation, it takes longer to come back. And in fact, that again is quite sort of evident in this diagram. Just look at, you know, there was this perturbation here, right? And it does come back. And then observe the perturbations here. They are, you know, much more closely spaced. The, the return to the equilibrium value is much more faster. Okay. So what happens is because of the shallower potential, the system responds slowly to perturbations. And one can actually measure this from what is called autocorrelation function or the autocorrelation within the time series, autocorrelation coefficient. And secondly, because of this shallow potential again. The, the system now fluctuates a lot more around the equilibrium value. And because of the asymmetric potential, the, the system also, the time series also shows uh, increased asymmetry. So if you measure the ACF of time series, auto, auto regressive coefficient, if you measure the variance in time series, which the skewness in time series, all of them we expect will increase as system is going from you know, far away 
to the closer values. So let us plot this. Let me let me demonstrate this principle. This is a uh, very important principle. So here, what we have done in this simulation is the following: as the time is increasing, the, the grazing rate or an equivalent parameter is being increased. System is going towards the you know uh, tipping point. The green line is the driver value. Note the driver value itself is gradually changing, but the system is responding in an abrupt way here, right? It suddenly collapses at around thousand units of time. So, what do we expect if the if the the theory that I have shown you correctly is correct? What we expect is that if I were to plot autocorrelation at autocorrelation regressive coefficient, that should also increase, right? Likewise, if I were to plot the variance, that should also increase. And likewise, if I were to plot the skewness. You know, skewness is a you know, is a value of symmetry. It could be positive or negative. Basically, the magnitude of skewness basically must increase before the actual collapse happens. So all of these must show these kind of trends before an actual collapse. So therefore, the idea is if you do observe these, maybe we are approaching uh, abrupt transitions or critical transitions. So in fact, uh, this is an example of simulation in, from the models. So the autocorrelation at lag one. Uh, standard deviation and skewness, they're all showing the expected trends. And these expected trends can therefore be used as you know, indicators that I'm approaching a tipping point. Okay. So that's the sort of you know, how we sort of use this mathematical models to make some predictions about systems that might show, uh, that might show uh, abrupt transitions. Okay, now here is the important thing. So although I showed you one specific model, one specific equation, and then and, and simulated and uh, analyzed all of this, the mathematical theory behind this is much more general. It only relies on the fact that the, the threshold point in ecological systems maps on to what is called bifurcations in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in our models. For example, these are bifurcation points, right? So, so basically, as, as we are going towards bifurcation points, these features are sort of universally observed. So therefore, although I have used one specific model, these trends that I'm showing you in this, although for this specific model, are likely to be true in a large number of cases uh, of abrupt transitions. So that's the theoretical <coughs> prediction, right? You know, if, uh, if a person is approaching, if an ecosystem is approaching tipping points, by measuring these simple dynamical quantities, uh, you know, one may be able to anticipate that uh, you are approaching critical points or tipping points. Okay. So that brings me, okay, there is one paper, you know, for those who are interested, I, you know, in the statistical aspects of it, which I am not going to cover at all in this uh, paper, uh, there is a paper in PLOS one in 2012. There's also a toolbox that actually applies these theoretical principles and uh, provides you a statistical estimator of how good uh, can you actually measure these in real data sets. Okay, so I'm not going to go into details of this statistical aspects. Okay, so now uh, I have basically covered the mathematical theory of uh, tipping points and how we can use them to offer early warning signals. Okay, so now the last part of my talk will be, are they really true in real world data? Okay. So let's ask the following question. How do we ask this question? So how do we look for empirical evidence? Imagine if you had a laboratory system, if we can somehow subject a system to tipping point in a laboratory and then push that beyond tipping point, do you actually find the, those trends in the autocorrelation uh, values? Do you actually find trends in increasing variability? Do you find this warning signal before the transition happened in your laboratory system? That's one way to ask this question. Of course, in the we eventually want to apply these to field systems. So, so for example, if you take data, long-term time series data, uh, and if you look at uh, that they have actually undergone abrupt transition. Did this system actually exhibit uh, trends that we have uh, predicted from mathematical models? So I'm going to address these two questions from, I'm going to show you what people have found. 
Okay, so this is a work by John Drake and others. So what they did was they uh, uh, did simple experiments where they uh, where they sort of grew back, you know populations of Daphnia in the laboratories. And what they also did was they subjected these Daphnia populations to increasing stress over time. Basically, increasing stress um, can be sort of manip, you know, sort of you know, mimicked by reducing their you know, food uh, that's given to them. Okay, and what they do is they basically study them under also a controlled condition where they don't do it, and a condition where they are deteriorating their food supply over time. And what they do is they study four early warning signals in time series, variance, skewness, uh, and correlations in time. And what they do is because they had an empirical system, they were also able to estimate what is the tipping point. And in their experiments, they you know it's a year-long experiment. They subject these populations to increasing stress over time, over a period of one year, and they estimate that they reach tipping point in their and in their, in, their, in their data on day 300. And what they then do is they analyze early warning signals. So what I'm showing you here is coefficient of variation and skewness. What they find, interestingly, is this is you know, the dotted line here represents when uh, the tipping point in their, you know, in their uh, experiment actually happened. The, the, the small gray line in the bottom here, that's the control data. And what you're the, the 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 one subjected to stress, they are showing these you know much bigger trends. So what they basically show is that they were able to find signals of the upcoming tipping point in their experiments almost hundred days ahead of actual tipping point. Okay, and in fact this effect was most uh, visible among the four indicators in coefficient of variation and skewness. And of course, since then, there have been more experimental verifications of these ideas. For example, in yeast population, this is an example of yeast population density, you know, in sort of, you know, stable conditions. And this is uh, the dilution factor, again, you know, mimicking stress. And what's remarkable about this diagram is, you know, it looks almost like the mathematical model I showed you, right? It almost shows, it looks like the bifurcation diagram of the mathematical model I showed you. A stable fixed point, unstable fixed point, and another stable fixed point, which corresponds to extinction. And what they do in this, again, they subject these populations to stress. What they find is that uh, the coefficient of variation, standard deviation, autocorrelation, they all increase. However, in this specific experiments, they did not find strong evidence for increasing skewness. Uh, so this is then there have been more experiments and uh, you know, uh, more other microcosm experiments. Uh, I won't be able to show you all of them, but the point is that, you know, certain interesting features and the mathematical predictions are actually testable using experiments in this case, okay? So, uh, so in, the, in the last part of the talk, what I'm going to do is uh, to find empirical evidence for these early warning signals, uh, which are predictions of mathematical models in, you know, in the field, in the, in the data from field. So I spoke about, I mentioned this uh, ecosystem in China, right? Where there was a grassland restoration. Okay, so what they found, what they found was that uh, there was this uh, low grass cover for about four decades, and then there is a high grass cover, which is the current state. And you know, intermediately there were these strong fluctuations that preceded before the actual transition happened. Okay, so what you find is that if you look at the histogram of this time series, it shows this nice uh, bimodality. And the, the, typically the bimodality is a strong signature of bistability yeah, in the underlying system. So this bimodality in the data here shows that maybe the system is indeed quite stable. And uh, what we were also able to show in this paper was that uh, the dynamics of the system sort of dramatically changes around year 40 uh, using something called a change point method. Okay, so what we then did was, okay, now we know that this system has undergone this abrupt change in the grass cover from a low grass cover to a high grass cover. Did it exhibit early warning signals that the mathematical theory predicts? So what we did was we sort of drew this line uh, at which the transition happens and we were only looking at data before that, before this year 40. 
And here we are, we are calculating autocorrelation at lag one, and we're also calculating spectral density ratio. So now don't bother the spectral density ratio um, because I haven't described that to you. So what we find is that, interestingly, there is no evidence for this signature of critical slowing down in this data set. So one of the main predictions of the mathematical models, we did not find that to be true in this case, in this data set. However, if you look at variance, standard deviation, that shows a very clear increasing trend. Likewise, if you look at skewness, we again find a very clear increasing trend. So in other words, there is a very strong evidence for rising variability. But you know, if you remember, the mathematical theory predicts that all of these must actually increase, not only this. So, okay, but our data shows we rise only one of them to be true. So how do we really reconcile this? How do we explain the fact that there was no critical slowing down before the abrupt transition? However, there was rising variability. Okay, how do we explain this? Okay, so you know, this is where I would like to remind the slide I showed you long back, which is distinction between critical transitions and stochastic transitions. So critical transitions are those which happen at this tipping point or the bifurcation point. So your system is very close to the tipping point and then a small amount of noise pushes it down. On the other hand, you can have stochastic transition where the system is actually far from the tipping point, but a large amount of noise can kick it to the other state. So now what we did was we looked at uh, all the signatures for critical transition as well as stochastic transition. So this is critical transition, the sort of you know standard theory which I have presented so far. All of the four sort of you know show these signatures. However, if you have a stochastic transition where a large constant noise pushes system from one state to the other, you don't find any of the signatures. <coughs> Excuse me. However, there is a th second type of stochastic transition where the strength of noise is uh, actually increasing. If you consider this scenario, you do not find these two signatures. These two signatures measure slowing down of the ecosystem, slow response of ecosystems. However, you do find that the variance and skewness increases. And in fact, this is precisely what we found in our data. Our data do not correspond to critical transition, not to constant noise stochastic transition, but to the increasing noise stochastic transition. So therefore, what we conclude is that the dryland transition that we analyzed is a case of stochastic transition where there was no critical slowing down, but there was a rising variability. Uh, one slide that I have skipped because of time is that this rising, this sort of counterintuitive pattern is given by uh, you know, stochastic rainfall. The rainfall is increasingly becoming variable over time. That seems to explain this phenomenon. Okay. So I don't know how much time do you have now. I have about uh, seven minutes, right? Okay. So let me now present one more uh, such study we did to look at these early warning signals. So can we apply these tools to anticipate financial market crashes? So the, our motivation for this came from, uh, you know, many papers that look at uh, critical transitions. So for example, if you read this uh, uh, famous and classic paper by Sheffer et al in Nature 2009, uh, complex dynamical systems ranging from ecosystems to financial markets and climate have tipping points at which a sudden shift to contrasting dynamical regime may occur. So basically financial systems are sort of often quoted as examples of tipping points. But is it, therefore, then are the predictions of tipping point models, are they valid? That's what we uh, try to understand. Specifically, we ask two questions. Do we find evidence for critical slowing down? Uh, which is basically increasing in the autocorrelation as markets approaches a crash. Do these markets exhibit increased variability prior to a crash? So what we did was we, uh, we took a, a data from a whole range of uh, stock market indices. This is an example of uh, uh, one specific uh, uh, stock market, which is a famous Dow Jones index. What, if, what we know historically is that there are four well-studied uh, uh, crashes, uh, 1927, 1987, 
1991 and then 2008 okay so what we did was we took each of these windows and we analyzed all the four metrics okay so here also what you find is that the autocorrelation at lag one, which is a measure of critical slowing down, has no clear patterns. In fact, as we are approaching, as we are approaching uh, the crash, it actually suddenly reduces. So therefore, there is no critical slowing down in this financial markets. However, if you look at the variance in time series, that shows a very strong and clear trend. So there is a rising variability prior to stock market crash downs. Okay, this is not one market and one index we have studied. We studied this for a whole range of markets and whole range of crashes in 1929, 87, 2000, 2008. For all of them, we find that the autocorrelation at lag one, the critical slowing down doesn't show expected trends, but the variance always shows the expected trends. You know, I don't need to do any sort of statistics for this, then you can just see by eye that the fluctuations in the stock market indices are dramatically increasing prior to crashes. And this is true not only for Dow Jones, we also found this for S&P, NASDAQ and other markets as well. Again, how do we explain this lack of critical slowing down, but with rising variability? Again, I want to remind you about critical and stochastic transitions. In stochastic transitions, we don't find autocorrelation at lag one increasing, but we do find variance. So most likely our data corresponds to, you know, stochastic transition. The stock market data might correspond to stochastically driven transitions rather than the transition that happened near the bifurcation points. However, I want to highlight that there were also many, many instances of false positives. If one were to rely only on variance, there were also a large number of false positives that occur. Okay, so therefore, you know, one can't just rely on variance as a predictor. So it's only a tool that may provide some signal, but it's not a predictive tool. So therefore, we can conclude, even in the case of financial markets, that they're not critical transitions. They don't happen near a bifurcation point. Their features are better explained by stochastic transitions. Okay, so, uh, so with that sort of, you know, I, I want to summarize the first today's talk, which is that uh, there are many, many in the real world examples of abrupt transitions, and we mathematically model them as tipping points or bifurcation points. And you know, it's important to understand that there are these models can capture critical transitions which happen near critical points, and also stochastic transitions that are strongly driven by uh, stochastic forces. Okay. And, uh, and these critical transitions, even stochastic transitions can have early warning signals. And uh, the, the two classic ones are that of critical slowing down, which is rising autocorrelation and increasing fluctuations measured by variance, QNS and other metrics. And, uh, and we have, uh, we, there is no quite a bit of empirical evidence that these metrics may indeed work in real systems. And, uh, and uh, our specific analysis showed that stochastic transitions are better, uh, you know, many ecosystems and including financial markets are uh, probably thought of as stochastic transitions because there is a lot of stochasticity in these systems. They are not slowly going towards bifurcation points, but probably they are strongly driven by many stochastic factors. And this also provides an interesting case that, you know, mathematical models can not only explain and provide insights, they can also provide tools for the assessment of ecosystem resilience. For example, observing these metrics could sort of indicate to us uh, how close one is to, uh, you know, are we approaching um, low resilience states? Are we approaching potential uh, catastrophic transitions? Okay, that's a summary of my talk so far. Okay, so I will uh, take more questions now. And in the next, uh, the, the next talk on Tuesday, I plan to discuss more about the spatial patterns. Okay. And before I forget, and you know, before I take on question, I want to thank and acknowledge my collaborators. I started working with Professor Jay Prakash on these problems. And uh, I worked with uh, Nikunj and uh, uh, Srinivas Raghavan on the financial market problem and uh, uh, Chen Ning on the, the grassland data.
Okay. So thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Vishwesha. So we have a couple of questions from the chat. If you want to. So how do I look open the chat now? I'm, should I close my screen sharing, by the way? Yeah. Oh, okay, I can open the chat. Okay, you can also look at the chat now. Okay. So there's one question. Is the asymmetry and shallowness correlated? Um, uh, yes. Uh, so yes and no. Uh, so they're correlated in the sense that they happen simultaneously. Okay. Now, but they're, but they're not happening by the same causal factor. So if I were to explain this mathematically, I, so okay, I, I think I have a slide that may even explain this sort of mathematically. Okay, so if I look at, if you look at, if you think of, you know, classic and simple models of catastrophic transitions. So they have this, you know, linear term. Okay, let me see if I can switch on the, Okay, can you see this? Okay. Okay, in this equation I have, you know, this bifurcation model with noise. There's this linear time term R times U, and there is this cubic term, right? So uh, the shallowness is, can be entirely explained by the linear term, but the, the, you know, the asymmetry requires you to use this cubic term. So you cannot obtain asymmetry without having a cubic term. And uh, so abrupt transitions in complex systems are typically modeled by saddle node bifurcations, right? And saddle node bifurcations does require you to have this cubic term. So, so yeah, so they are related, but they, they, they are correlated in the sense that they happen simultaneously, but the causal factors are different. And the second question I have is, you know, is it somehow related to curvature? Absolutely, yes. So the, so the shallowness is, is absolutely basically equivalent to curvature. So shallowness means reduced curvature, and that is what is causing reduced return rate to equilibrium. That is also what causes increased fluctuations. So they're all same basically. Shallowness and curvature are basically the same. Uh, and the third question is uh, by similar question, are some of the drivers more often correlated or they vary largely case by case uh, before it's important to consider all? So yeah, I mean, I don't have a good answer for this question because this question, um, one has to look at a specific system and try to understand what drives, well, how are the drivers placed? For example, if you were to think of a vegetation system, typically uh, rainfall and fire are very, very important drivers, right? So, so we need to know the mechanistics of the system to sort of Sort of you know address this question on a case by case basis and, and in, in all of the model analysis i showed you uh, they were all assuming that a single driver is changing single driver is changing slowly towards the bifurcation point or the stochasticity in the single driver is what is really causing it okay the next question um, stock market indices are often fat tailed this leads to divergence of moments is it then meaningful to analyze the trends or trends? Yeah, this is a good question. You know, I'm not an expert on uh, financial stock markets. So, uh, so, uh, so I will not be able to provide a very, very good answer to this uh, question. Uh, so my, my own interest was, you know, more of academic, uh, specific academic question, since it is often used as an example of uh, tipping points. Does it, and we have really, very, very, really good high resolution and long term time series data. Does it show critical slowdown? Does it show the simple feature? Let's ignore the moments part. I agree. You know, moments are complicated. I fully agree. Uh, you know, even if you ignore the moments part that I showed you, uh, can we calculate uh, the autocorrelation function and the properties of it, right? Uh, so I think that can be done without being worried about fat tail distribution parts. And we do not find evidence uh, for the mathematical prediction that there is a critical slowing down. And of course, you know, when it comes to, so thinking a bit more about the fat tailness, I think that if you think of, uh, you know, uh, mean and variance rather higher moments, uh, you know, you to really observe divergence, you need a, you technically need infinitely large data. But we are obviously analyzing data for a finite window. So I think in that limit, uh, it might still be reasonable to calculate them. 
trouble to do drastic uh, transitions due to noise happen for specific values of noise? Is it a feature of stochastic resonance? So I think it is uh, related to, you know, uh, you know, you need a, uh, uh, um, so basically, you know, if you're, if you're the, the noise term in your model is a Gaussian noise term, right? Technically, the smallest noise can also cause, you know, transitions between two stable states, any small amount of noise. But, you know, you may just have to wait so long that it's meaningless now, right? But if you now say, okay, no, I want to observe uh, transitions within a given time scale, and I'm going to be interested only in those time scales. Yes, you do need a minimum amount of noise before a transition can happen. And in fact, that's the point that, in fact, my very first paper in my PhD thesis, I tried to address that uh, way, that specific question in a fairly, uh, this slide that I'm showing right now. So we basically, we, sh we in fact, we showed that assuming that the noise is bounded, uh, you need to have a minimum amount of noise for you to sort of induce transitions and you need a minimum amount of noise to also to fluctuate back and forth. And I think it is related to stochastic resonance. You're right about that too. Okay, there's one more question. Is it possible at least in principle to uh, amenable to account for feedback mechanisms? For example, rainfall sustains its own raining rate Driver is not an external driver. Yeah, so so I'm sorry that you know in this talk today I have absolutely not paid attention to mechanisms in some sense, right? I just used a model that showed the features I am interested. In. Uh, so what uh, so what I'm hoping to do in the next one where I will discuss spatial models is that positive feedback mechanism is really important, and uh, if we have weak positive mechanism, weak positive feedback you do not have abrupt transitions. Only when you have a strong positive feedback is, if, uh, is when you will actually observe, uh, you know, uh, uh, abrupt transitions. And, uh, and in fact, it is precisely because of the positive feedbacks that, you know, two states, you know, in this slide, right? You know, there are two states, right? You know, the green uh, high vegetation state and the black low vegetation state, um, you know, so the green line and the black lines, they coexist because both of these forest states are stabilized by their own positive feedback mechanisms. And therefore, you know, it could be, for example, rainfall under a rainforest. It could, for example, be the, you know, uh, it could even be much more local scale. For example, uh, the presence of trees, a patch of trees will enhance the water infiltration that will in turn help the tree to go better, better that will in turn help a local uh, establishment of seeds and therefore the entire patch is sustained. On the other extreme, if there is nothing to start with, it's very hard to germinate a new seed because the water doesn't sustain there for long enough for a seedling to arise. Um, so so the, both the alternative stable states are often maintained by these kind of feedback mechanisms. That's a great question, thank you. Okay, I think we we had a, a rich discussion session, and uh, uh, thank again uh, Vishwasha for uh, a nice lecture. Uh, now we have time for a short break, and we'll be back in uh, uh, about six to seven minutes uh, for next uh, for the next lecture by Andrea Rinaldo. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you again next week. Sure. Bye. Antonio. Antonio, non occorre che io faccia altre prove, no? Perché tanto sono qui. No, direi di no. Direi che... Vai, però sono pronto qua. Buon buon. Sono, sono... Perfetto. A tra poco. A dopo.
ti prenderò 
Okay, I think we are ready to start over again. And uh, it's a pleasure to have once more Andre Rinaldo from EPFL for uh, his third uh, and final lecture. Please, Andre. Thank you so much, uh, Antonio. And um, here, let me let me share my screen. And uh, um, I've had today um, a few issues with the connection of the Wi-Fi. I hope uh, it doesn't happen. But uh, because I you know I happen to have uh, a few kids back home, so everybody's using the van. But anyways, should be okay. So um, here's lecture three. Uh, let me close this up. Uh, yep, uh, of the series that we had. And um, let me see where we are. Um, remember what um, uh, you may remember what we had discussed, uh, uh, like in the first class, in the context of neutral uh, uh, meta community or meta population model, uh, which is essentially something in which, if you look now at the right uh, at the right plot only compared to the so-called the pure lattice model of interactions, um, you have a sequence of interactions in the sense that the dynamics proceeds by canceling at random. Um, like uh, uh, a, a color, if you want, or a, an individual, or a species, if you take a meta community model, it won't change the main result in a particular place, randomly chosen, you keep going with that, and you replace it with um, either a non existing color, slash, species, splash, individual, uh, uh, with a certain um, a probability, the diversification ratio, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, or you replace it with some uh, nearest neighbor or some neighbor which was uh, chosen with respect to a kernel of a domain of influence for which you choose the most numerous. Or uh, in a mean field sense, whether you uh, choose it from anywhere else uh, based simply on abundance. And um, that, of course, entails neutrality in the sense that the preference is simply due to sheer numbers, sheer abundance. And that's the essence of a neutrality assumption. And the patterns that, uh, that uh, we've seen in there are quite different depending on a sole modification, which is in this case, the directional dispersal, which is embedded in the network structure, the tree-like structure, if you please, or the open to any, uh, I'm sorry, nearest direction uh, from a sorry start back. So let's see how we can exploit this. This is Ignacio Rodriguez Turbe, emeritus professor at Princeton, currently now uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, after like uh, a couple of decades in Princeton, in which he said, well, uh, why don't we uh, assume that each branch of a network structure here uh, becomes like a, a meta population, which is called a directly tributary area, but is a local community within a meta community. One of the points that I made in the first class was that the result that um, uh, the directional dispersal, which is embedded in a network structure for interaction, that is, that defines your nearest neighbors or away neighbors in a selective manner, is uh, rather insensitive of whether you're talking about an individual based or a meta community based approach. The result still stands. And what later on we have done, like uh, field uh, verification of the same result, studies theoretical or empirical on migration. Uh, fronts, for instance, that feel the structure of a directional dispersal, or laboratory, in fact, experiments we ran in my lab, in which there was nothing neutral, there was a living community, the results still stand. So the idea is um, here is to assume that the larger the system, um, this uh, elementary the unit on which you have reactions of physical, biological, chemical nature, in this case, biological, could be a directly a tributary area, which is a local community carved within the community, like at their each scale. And um, we thought of doing so with reference to something which is quite important. We took on the, uh, the uh, whole archive of local species diversity of fish populations in Mississippi, Missouri River system. And uh, LSR means local species richness, however defined, essentially you can count the observed number of species which you have. So in a DTA, in one of the nodes of the links in which you can partition, I'll be showing you now, you can extract that objectively and manipulate it, uh, I mean, remotely acquire and objectively manipulate the structure of the Mississippi 
uh, in fact, uh, uh, acronym means annual average runoff production, which is essentially uh, runoff. I mean, the, the, the total volume of runoff that passes through any particular cross section that is the hydrology. Now, uh, it doesn't take an expert statistician, but simply uh, a, a, a not a particularly a trained eye to see if there is a correlation between how much runoff you have in a particular place and different directly tributary area, that is the hydrology, the hydrologic control, and the local species diversity. But to formalize this, what you can do, you can extract objectively um, even humongously large networks to detail which is exquisite. In fact, one of the reasons why, in fact, uh, over the debate of critical self-organization, that is why, in fact, certain recurrent characters embedded in a power law distribution of um, some aggregation structure of a catchment is the same regardless of uh, uh, climate, uh, vegetation, exposed lithology, the scale, et cetera. There's something truly remarkable or even networks that generated uh, files like, um, or, or data sets like this one, in which you can characterize uh, a structure from the scale of one meter or less to the scale of thousands of kilometers, and in terms of area, even more. So that can be done. I hinted that that uh, briefly in the first class and not touching on it, but I assume that this is something which, uh, when you can trust me, we've been working for like 20 years in characterizing those network shapes like uh, these ones. So uh, let me see how uh, essentially the model proceeds. It's, it's um, well, I have a few notes here, but um, it's not gonna be particularly, in, but the idea is that um, uh, it's like the experiment you've seen the neutral meta community or meta population experiment that I showed you in the animation I showed before, they showed also in lecture one. So these, um, um, the assumptions in this case is every DTA, that is every unit, is uh, essentially saturated uh, at its capacity. That is no resource available to fish is assumed to be left unexploited. Now, of course, you're talking about some sort of an upper limit uh, to, the, uh, to the fish uh, diversity, but that's also quite remarkable how close I will show you this will be reproduced. So the model dynamics proceed as in the other case, which you have seen, uh, uh, that is at each time step, uh, a, you randomly select a fish unit, selected from all the fish units in the, in, the, in the whole system, and you assume it to die. And the resources that um, uh, previously sustained that unit are freed and available up for grabs for a new fish unit. So with a certain probability, which we term, again, the diversification rate, uh, the new unit, the fish unit, will, um, will be a new species. It will probability one minus new, in fact, is going to be one of the existing species that colonizes the spot. And uh, the, of course, diversification rate, uh, rate in this case could represent um, uh, external introduction of non-native species. We have seen how foreign invasions are so important ecologically for a variety of ecosystems, or it could be immigration or re-immigration, in fact, of a new species from outside the region. You have seen the case of the example, if you may recall from lecture two, when we studied the breeding birds of, uh, uh, of North America as a, uh, or the Kansas prairie uh, uh, species or Bassius species, in fact, that um, in fact, the, the concept of persistence time, local persistence and local extinction has to be seen in the context of the geographical uh, area in which this is done. So um, uh, with the, the probability one minus two, the new unit can belong in fact to the, to the species, to the, uh, to the thing, et cetera. And the idea is that in this case, you don't uh, touch only nearest neighbors, but essentially you characterize a probability PJ, IJ, I'm sorry, that the empty unit in the ith uh, DTA, in the ith node, the directly tributary area, whatever you want to call it, is colonized by a species which is elsewhere in the J uh, uh, DTAs that appear in the system through a kernel, a dispersal kernel that you had in the sense, which uh, uh, specifies and measures the range of a species colonization. Now, what is important here is a non-neutral effect um, which is, uh, however, not dictated by, uh, by uh, a calibration, not dictated by uh, uh, biological dynamics, but essentially dictated by hydrologic controls because it's geomorphological. So you assume that the habitat capacity determines the resources in the place 
is the fluvial habitat capacity, which is established on the scale of the basis of a scaling geomorphic relations we had uh, hinted at that characterize the fact that um, you can decide based on certain metric properties, which are remarkably obeyed in the runoff producing area of any river worldwide and are dictated by the aggregation structures. So essentially the habitat capacity in the place is essentially dictated by how much area you had behind your back. How many nodes do you collect through the structure of a network again, which is a given. Now, what is interesting that the dispersal kernel has certain features of which I shall not uh, uh, discuss, but essentially what you have, I won't uh, study the particular back-to-back -back exponential, which has a tradition in ecology, uh, one uh, or another. In fact, uh, we tested several of them. Um, uh, we were asked by the nature reviewers, in fact, to, uh, to run a comparative analysis, and we apparently convinced them because we got published. But the idea is that, for instance, if you assume the two uh, units, two nodes, two DTAs are uh, I, J, what is the distance that separates them? Now, that's interesting for colonizers because if you assume the colonizer are strong fish units, right, um, the uh, path, uh, path that connects you, uh, I to J could be partly downstream and partly upstream, or could be strictly downstream or strictly upstream, depending on I, J. Now, the question is, uh, you may bias the path. Because if you are a weak juvenile fish, for instance, a small one, you may be way more affected by the velocity, that is the drift, which is embedded in the stream flow direction, that is the oriented nature of the graph, than it could be for a strong adult big fish, right? So either way, they, uh, you may bias and weigh, in fact, the downstream direction, the upstream direction distances which you have in the system which makes it reasonable, and this is a tunable parameter in a sense. But in a neutral case, we kill it, and we assume that all species are equally important at the capital, uh, at, the, at the per capita level. So briefly, uh, the result of what you're seeing here is in, uh, the frequency distribution of local species richness by letting the model run to stationary state. Now, uh, it may be uh, you may like it, you may dislike it, etc. But for us, it was totally remarkable how simply the nature of a connected uh, um, of a connected system and the habitat size, which is produced by scaling relations being embedded in geomorphological laws, which is the aggregation structure, um, can allow us to reproduce uh, wonderfully well um, how the alpha diversity, the distance to outlet. I'm sorry, this is I, I, I made a mistake. I, I was anticipating what I saw in here. In fact, so this is not a frequency distribution. This is the how the alpha diversity unfolds from the outlet to the upstream distances with obvious differences which you have in a certain place. For instance, um, uh, this is blown out because you may have that the data are telling you that um, some freshwater tolerating uh, coastal fish species, in fact, uh, could or human disturbance, in fact, uh, or or pollution for that matter, um, alter what you would have. Otherwise, a distribution that is what the data show, uh, are showing you the new regional New Orleans, and the same applies to the same thing. Uh, at the same time, which is also remarkable, how the frequency distribution with respect to the distance to be out, the frequency of local species with respect to the thing, that is, you count essentially the number of species that are equally distant from the outlet, you got some sort of a range which is reproduced without any tuning by the model, signifying once more one of the main tenets of my classes, that um, there is something inherent in the directional dispersal implied by the network structure, which is the substrate for ecological interactions, which is giving the system, granting the system uh, reliability and predictability. What is interesting also is that if you run the same exercise without changing the habitat capacity per every node embedded as proportional through um, predictive geomorphological laws by the uh, structure, the aggregation structure, which is essentially dictated by the total contributing area at any point deciding how big is your river. Um, then what you see, you screw up completely, in fact, uh, the, uh, the exercise. And you see the hydrologic controls embedded in any neutral model, which is the simplest possible zero order approximation. There's no description of, a, of the properties on which uh, fish biology spending lifetimes of scientific work um, are mostly explained by the hierarchical size structure of a fluvial network. And it's embedded 
topology, which is also reinforcing what uh, we have seen before. Now, uh, things become slightly more complicated if you go into not only studying local species richness by the correlation structure. It is a beta diversity. It is, um, what is the probability that the existence of a species in one place is uh, uh, matched by the probability of existence of a safe species at a certain distance, distance being uh, measured in so-called chemical distance, which is along the network structure. So this can be done. You can generate equiprobability maps. That is the ratio between the number of common species that you have and the species in the center of DTA to see how the system behaves, in fact. So this uh, um, reinforces the, uh, the main tenet that I've been hammering on for quite a few times. And I am now ready to um, move on following uh, what Marino Gatto has told you about the evolution of our thinking about spatially explicit epidemiology uh, by the original ideas that motivated us to go to jump into COVID-19 studies through the same technological tool in as much as some um, tales, some, some uh, small factories that you had in the Milan area that used to make uh, um, high fashion dresses converted their lines of production into mass productions uh, during the COVID-19. It was a relatively jump, um, an easy jump for us. But I'll tell you how, in fact, this uh, thinking, uh, this way of thinking and this line of thinking that brought to the book um, I talked to you about uh, uh, allowed us to move on to jump from fish biodiversity straightforwardly to the study of river networks as ecological corridors for waterborne disease. Let me see why. Now, um, here's a river network, and let's assume that those dots are uh, human settlements. So essentially what we're saying is that um, what if, uh, we thought, nodes are human communities where they are, in fact, with their population and their size, et cetera, where disease can spread, and uh, um, you have a demography of a population, of a, of a demography of a disease based on the demographic evolution of susceptible individuals, infected individuals possibly recovered, and possibly via the, as you've seen in the case of Shisto, quite importantly, um, through the example that, um, uh, that uh, Marino has pointed out, or which I, I'm uh, briefly returning by mentioning his mentor, because it's important for one of the tenets of my work. That is, you may in fact couple this with control variables, which pertain, again, water controlled, but uh, that pertain the ecology of a disease. That is, if you have, for instance, intermediate obligatory, um, intermediate hosts for the uh, development of a disease. So um, why this is interesting, the, the example of a schisto, I will just briefly show the main results that Barino showed you, the helminths, and you see why this is important, right? And I'm, but the motivation I'm giving it, um, it's more, um, uh, it, it's somewhat uh, important. That's where I, we carried out the field work that uh, we carried out with my lab, in fact, in Burkina Faso, where we had like a 20 year, 20, 20 year uh, long uh, experience in um, a collaboration, in, in a cooperation to development. So um, it, what is incredible in this area is that in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have something like in a debilitating disease, which is not killing anyone, so it's a neglected tropical disease. You have like 15 million uh, disability adjusted life years uh, that you take into account. And what you have in the particular regions, you have different types of schisto, as Marino has shown. I'm just going through briefly because, and that's what um, we had uh, in the camp that we have uh, in Burkina Faso. We deployed, and one graduate student, in fact, carried out his entire PhD thesis on that. Why this is interesting? Again, it's a complex life cycle, and it is interesting for us the existence, the need to take into account hydrologic controls. This is the part which indeed. Um, pertains to how form and function of a river network operates. Because why? Because if you have like this marriage, this fertilization of the successive stages of the of the uh, uh, of the uh, disease, need to hatch the eggs. The best place in which they they are generated within the infected host, and they have the worms, uh, they, the flat worms that uh, generate uh, cercaria or miracidia, in fact. Uh, 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 in uh, live in the and they are extracted through feces. They get into a water environment in which they have to um, they have to be infecting snails uh, in a given time. Now, 
That depends, of course, on shear stresses, depends on the flow velocity, depends on the habitat size, it depends on whether the habitat suitability for the intermediate host is given. So something in which, uh, as you've seen with Marino, uh, will be back into the system. So that's what you have. And what you have seen, and that's a point I'm making. Um, the point I want to make here is that um, uh, pricing the planet, as uh, uh, an environmental economist pointed out. That is, um, if you don't account for a depreciation of natural capital, um, that means that um, essentially the ecosystem services that uh, are carried out that you cannot quantify precisely are worth zero. So pricing the planet means that you have to give a monetary value to the services you may lose as an alternative, like in this case, making way for a, a commercial center by destroying a mangrove swamp. Um, that means that in the in gross domestic product indicator, GDP-like indicators of well-being, you will see the advantage in the following year of the, of the commercial center, of the benefits of it, but you don't see the loss which is associated with the ecosystem services you lose from flood protection to, uh, to uh, carbon sequestration to uh, fish nursery areas and the like. So the idea, and that's part of Das Gupta's main point, is that indicators that do not account for the depreciation of natural capital uh, put development thinking uh, stacked against nature, in a sense, uh, against environmental thinking. And the very idea of a, a, a misinterpreted Kuznets curve, that is, that if your GDP goes up, uh, down goes the inequalities in their place, is essentially false as Thomas Piketty, in fact, has shown quite clearly in his wonderful book, uh, uh, The Capital of the 21st Century. What happens is that in reality, indicators that omit the depreciation of our natural capital are totally unsuitable for describing the wealth of nations. And here is my point. Meta studies um, that, uh, and I'm, I'm reasonably sure that Marino hasn't spoken about it, that introduced my discussion, in fact, showed that there is a clear relationship between the expansion of irrigation canals and some of the 15,000 small dams that we have seen. I took this picture near our field site in Burkina Faso, in fact. Uh, the uh, the uh, construction of irrigation channels that uh, were possible because of a 15,000 World Bank funded uh, small dams that uh, litter Burkina Faso, in fact, had the consequences. So the water resources development scheme of a largely improved GDP of Burkina Faso, but in, in a humongously large expansion of a habitat suitable for intermediate host to the disease, and thus the prevalence of a disease. So the idea is that, can we put a price tag on the, a, a learning impairing disability brought in by a disease of this kind? Complicated, complicated. And the, uh, our permanent liability, our, the, our inability to predict for instance, the number, the increased prevalence um, in, in, unless you have significant and reasonable models of the expansion of a disease, then um, you know, as a matter of fact, they won't be able to put a price tag on it. And this is the same place, uh, and this is the pictures that I took in the same place. How can you keep uh, little guys away uh, from uh, the water when you have ephemeral ponds generated by the system. Mind you that uh, in this case, as you very well know, because of the wonderful lectures that Shirley Marino has put forth on the subject, that um, the, uh, the, 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 those larvae penetrate the skin uh, in a matter of seconds. Our student that was here only once put his hands in the water, dropping the gloves, when he dropped scissors, just, he he just uh, and picked up in a second the scissors. That was enough to, grab, to, uh, to get the system in a sense. Why this is important and related to what you have seen um, in the uh, previous slides for the fish diversity, and it's a picture you've seen from Marina, because the set of equations, and I'm not insisting on that, is something in which you have coupled, um, coupled uh, uh, ODEs, like in this case is the mean worm burden that you have uh, back in the system here, the prevalence of infection in the intermediate host, in this case is Y, and these are the, the uh, essentially the densities of a Cercaria and Miracidia in node I of a, of a DTA, that is of a single node in which you can characterize the system. I'm not pretending that you follow the system, but you realize that in here you have a number of extensions which are quite important. 
they pertain, for instance, human mobility. That is, if you have a guy that migrates to go to a place to cultivate a field uh, uh, because of the expansion of the irrigation network, human mobility does affect, in fact, carrying away an exposure and the concentration of sarcaria that generates the burden of disease in an individual. That's how the system expands. So in a sense, you realize that you're moving the study of diseases onto a plane which is completely different. And the set of system is a classical system through which used to uh, engineering, environmental engineering tools. And I won't uh, build on that, in particular, not on what you have seen uh, with Marino about uh, how you characterize the stability of the system and uh, uh, possible uh, uh, ideas you have on how to curb it. Uh, again, this eigenvector analysis you see with Marino is telling you essentially how you can actually generate the patterns of disease. And what I really like is the idea is that you can actually make discussion. What happens, for instance, if at random, as an exercise we ran, um, uh, you remove 10% of a small dance, thereby reducing the distance, the mean distance to the nearest water body, which is arguably the uh, most important factor of completely geomorphological origins that uh, generates the exposure. So, and that's the experiments we had in the place and I'm not building any further uh, or uh, other diseases that can be treated in this manner. What I'll be concentrating here, I mean, getting back to the first slide in the last 20 minutes of my, of my lecture, and then I'd be delighted to answer your questions. Uh, um, you remember the little guy here on the banks of a Magna River, uh, where uh, we did field work on chronic, in fact, cholera, I'll be talking about epidemic cholera in a minute, was trying to convince me that uh, it's impossible the mighty waters of a, of a Magna were the cause of cholera, which originated in that region, in fact, evolutionarily, um, and then from there irradiated worldwide in several waves of pandemics. But most significantly, 200 meters downstream of the largest diarrheal disease hospital in the world. Uh, in Bangladesh. Now, um, the point I'm making, and I'll be carrying out to the end, is that um, the inherent predictability that you grant the system by using uh, directional dispersal embedded in the uh, known a priori and calculated and treated objectively offline, remotely acquired and objectively manipulated offline structure of a river network, grants an unprecedented predictability to disease of this kind. And in particular, this became uh, um, absolutely vital when um, uh, we uh, uh, started. We were just working on that. We had published the first spatially explicit model of um, epidemic cholera uh, in, uh, with reference to the outbreak that was in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa based on data that were uh, uh, collected much afterwards in hindsight. But what happened is that on October, uh, uh, in the week preceding October 10, 2010, all of a sudden, in a country where it was cholera free for more than 200 years, you've got um, an outbreak which started propagating downstream the Artibonite River in the heart of, uh, in the, heart of uh, the Haitian island, uh, the island of Haiti, the part of the left, not the Dominican Republic, which is cut in half. Good example that Jared Diamond, um, in fact, in his collapse, uh, wonderful book, was making an example of how, in fact, uh, the Anthropocene scene and the bad management of resources uh, explains uh, the uh, a, a, a not simply environmental factors uh, determine, in fact, the fate of societies. Now, what was interesting, you see the number of cases jumped all of a sudden from day zero to the from 50 to 100 to 200 in places which are small places indeed. And right downstream of a UN camp of peacekeeping curves. What is not only ironic, sad, and it's, it's really uh, uh, affecting me uh, very much, is the fact that why we were peacekeeping troops in Haiti? Because a few months earlier, Haiti, the poorest country in the world, had been struck by an earthquake that killed 300,000. It destroyed the little infrastructure that was there. Uh, uh, sewer systems were non-existent. Uh, roads were destroyed. People died. Um, a, a civil uh, infrastructure was demolished. It, was a, it sits on a, one of those plate tectonics on which uh, earthquakes can be particularly devastating. On top of that, we planted the disease because it was shown when it was mapped the genome that it was a Nepalese 
strain of cholera when it is endemic brought in by asymptomatic uh, peacekeeping forces. Anyways, that was a fantastic exercise in a sense because in a completely naive population, as that's a term that you use in these cases, um, uh, they, um, uh, but is, uh, or you can assume safely that because uh, no sign of cholera was there for almost 200 years, but the entire population was susceptible to the disease. And what happens is that then you had thousands of deaths. You had the mortality, initial mortality, which was totally remarkable because there were roadblocks to treat people transported by poor means, like uh, uh, on the shoulders of a, of a younger, in fact, to be treated to centers, there were roadblocks to make it. And uh, say, uh, like after a year, like 8% of the population of a million people was uh, uh, affected. And this is a picture I took into a hospital in Leogan. Uh, and you see what was essentially the treatment was even, I have to say, among the sanctity that I've seen in the Médecins Sans Frontières hospitals uh, organized in the haste in the place or the Cuban brigade that took up the north of the country to assist, but essentially put people on the stretcher, you cut a hole in the thing and you collect the stools like six times a day. And what is totally remarkable that uh, you survive cholera easily if you only have hydration bags to which you should be attached. Now, uh, let me show you the evolution of the daily cases in Haiti for about a year and a half, then the thing becomes blurred afterwards, but that's quite interesting. So you have um, uh, the evolution of the daily cases in the half of the Hispaniola island, this is a part of Haiti, and I didn't put the data which came uh, later on, in fact, for the two islands that still belong to the same place, etc. So this is how the disease, in terms of simply record reported number of cases with all the inherent errors you have in the system, and what you had in there. This is the city of Port-au-Prince. Here is a log scale of a number of cases. If I'm asking you, what do you see here? Well, you see the rivers. So you, even by seeing the most gross indicator, number of reported cases, what you see in the place is that the, the avenues uh, of the uh, riverways where the pathogen, in fact, survives in the environment, uh, in the open waters, in fact, is what generates the system, et cetera. So essentially, you can have something in which you essentially can calculate the rate of change of new cases of cholera um, in every single um, place that, um, uh, that you have, but you have to take into account a spatially explicit system. We put settlements where they are, connectors where they are, and the likes. Not only that, if you take the red curve is what happened in the first uh, wave, followed like in COVID, but for completely different reasons, a second wave, which is clearly related to factors like the tropical rainfall that you have in the place. Um, why? Well, the easiest is not simply an overflow of sewers, but simply the washout of open air defecation sites, which you have to take into account. And the fact that um, the freshly shed bacteria, the bacterium, in fact, um, like a single infected individual expels and, and through, the sp through feces, like a hundred times more bacteria that in, in concentration, which are orders of magnitude larger than any, any possible uh, um, uh, survival in the environment. So it is the human, human host, in fact, the main uh, reason of a propagation, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, whether it moves or not. If you have a, a susceptible person moving on to the wrong place, drinking the wrong water and getting back, he brings back the disease. It happened to me when I was in the market of Artibonite. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you when I show you a picture later on. So the tools of the trade now is knowing ahead of time where settlements are, where patterns of rainfall evolve, and how the disease can be uh, predicted uh, under these conditions, putting uh, cities and human settlements where they are connected by the waterways as we can see them directly. So the idea that um, in a system like that, you have two different networks, a network which you, which you have like uh, pathogens connecting nodes, if they are uh, downstream, of a, uh, uh, of a river system, or, and that's a key place, you can have connections among nodes, human communities in which with population, each population, each sub I, this is node I, in which the disease can diffuse and grow, connected by 
a multiplex network of a different type, of a different kind. In this case, human mobility, as you now very well know from Marino Gato's lecture on COVID-19, the spread, the mean mechanism, whatever its shape uh, it is. And, but we had seen even uh, in my set of lectures, what happens when we consider from a zebra mussel um, invasion of the Mississippi Missouri River system, you see that you saw that at times unconnected flare ups of, uh, uh, of uh, those uh, development of those clusters of zebra mussels were generated away from the main backbone of a hydrodynamically generated um, uh, uh, dispersion. Why? Because of the ballast water in which Veliger survived we were taken away and, and tucked um, to different places, maybe hundreds of kilometers away from the same place. The mechanism of generating the system of this kind. So uh, the tools of a trade uh, in this case are the tools of a trade of geosciences of digital information systems or geographic information systems if you want. That is, um, we can and we could do it remotely when we predicted the uh, evolution of a uh, of the epidemics of cholera in the place, which I'll be showing you in a minute, because the digital terrain map from which you extract the river network, as I hinted at in my introductory class, is something we can do. It's a standard exercise that, uh, uh, that master students do uh, where we are. You can have pixel-based estimate of population density. You can have modeling of human mobility, which is something which requires some thought and some care, in fact, uh, generated maybe simplified at times, but tell you what is the capability of attracting places like on the main point, like port of plants that you have uh, in this system. And the set, the tools of a trade, I mean, they different every time, but the, that's why I showed you before the ones that Marino has shown you for Shisto. Um, so essentially the state variables are susceptibles at node i at time t, infected at node i at time t, and the bacterial concentration in the reservoir of the ith community uh, evolved because of uh, the different factors, which is the mortality, the survival of the vibrio in the environment, which is a certain mortality, the rate of sink, really how long you could survive, or transport um, uh, in a certain proportion uh, coming from connections that are hydraulic uh, and hydrologic connections that depends on the various sizes of the of the water reservoir, the local water reservoir, which is important because essentially you can assume that one stool, a single infected person has a certain probability distribution but in terms of absolute number of, uh, uh, of bacteria shed, which is again, six orders of magnitude more than you have uh, for the concentration of bacteria in the free living waters. And that is the infection thing that generates the thing. You see P, the infection per unit infected person, which is here you have a, the force of infection depends on the local infections plus the of infections connected by a mobility matrix. This is a mobility factor which you have in the system. So of the I persons that live in a community, uh, I sub I infected person, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, stay there and pollute the water. Or you may have persons that because of mobility and its matrix of fluxes generates the infection shed into the place, to which you could possibly add, like you have it here, the rainfall runoff production of uh, vibrios uh, generated by the system. Again, I cannot pretend to explain the details, but you see how this is done. For instance, um, and you have seen in the introduction to the disease um, ecology that uh, Marino put together. In this case, we assume the time scale of our prediction is one in which recovered persons, I mean, are put back into the susceptible compartment over a time, which is one of the row of the order of two to three years. And this is the force of infection that depends on a number of factors. My scope here is not to, it's get you curious about uh, the structure, but you see that the structure is exactly the same of a schisto, is exactly the same of a Mississippi, Missouri biodiversity model, and it's exactly the same of the ones we have seen before. So uh, let me show you how the model works. If you assume a, a piano network, very important, because if you have like in every node, you have a population of the same capacity, all of them uh, uh, prone to have the diffusion of the cholera, uh, uh, that what you will have in the system, right? And why this is interesting? Because it calculates the speed of the traveling wave of cholera under a simplifying assumption, which depends on the local reproduction number. But if you assume as it is uh, meaningful and, and, and reasonable, the distribution of a in a topologically connected system of this kind, 
you have uh, that no distribution, the population distribution is taken, drawn from an, a, a distribution, which is normally, I mean, almost universal, a, a power law of exponent minus two, the zip distribution. What you have is that, um, now what you see in the system, that uh, you have flare ups in a mechanism which is exactly the same. And why? Because that's the effect of factors that can be uh, uh, remotely measured and objectively uh, manipulated. In this case, the population size. And certain effects of the delays that you have in the system, spatially explicit, have nothing to do with the disease and everything to do with the geomorphology and the ecology of the system. So I took to Haiti a few times, uh, and uh, what uh, these pictures I took, they are kind of blurred and I love pictures, but the reason being is that um, my, uh, my glasses were shut because people could kill you to steal your camera because there's no police left in the place. You have no sewers, no streets to speak of. And this also shows how large patterns of infection are accompanied. You consider this safe water, bottled water, with the guy that handles them uh, by the neck in this case, quite remarkable. Or there are places, he's taking in the, again, in the Bangladesh Conflict instead, in which uh, the water reservoir, which could be a highly abstract uh, phenomenal parameter of a system, in the case of urban setting, possibly proportional to the population, or in this case, you see it, or a very physical system like you have in Bangladesh, as I was telling you. And this is the market uh, of Carrefour in the outskirts of, um, of uh, uh, Port-au-Prince, where I've been sitting in the system. And, and what I told you, and was totally remarkable, is this lady that you're seeing here blurred against because of a, of a safe glass beyond it. Uh, in a matter of second, um, uh, Bought, bought a cabbage at this guy, and I couldn't, I was speechless when I saw it, by showing uh, a Nokia 1900 proof of concept. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Nokia 1900 telephone as a proof of payment. So in a place in which you have no sewer system, as you see it, water flows through the market in this case, you have no roads, you have no police, but you do have a telephone, which is a way less uh, uh, biased, uh, socially biased system as we have seen. And this is how like human to human transmission, this is public transportation in Haiti, in fact, takes a place. <laughs> and that's the last uh, thing that I want to show you that um, uh, models and data, in fact, uh, uh, we are not perfect uh, modeling things, et cetera, when I mean, you have Bayesian estimation on parameters, but the very fact that you're using spatially distributed uh, um, <coughs> quantities uh, make sure that in reality, the distance within model and data is so small that operational decisions can be taken based on that. And I'm skipping this part because it's too late. It's Marino Gatto and his idea that in, in spatially explicit uh, 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 models of disease development, in fact, you can have even um, a, an eigenvector can represent the pattern of disease before it happens. And quite interestingly, you show also that the local reproduction numbers, meaning uh, the test for the potential for the outbreak to occur is neither necessary nor sufficient a condition for epidemic disease outbreak if you compare it to real cases, whenever you have a spatially explicit system in which human mobility is a driver. Not, is an embedded driver, but it can be calculated. And I skip uh, this part, I skip also this because I, I realized they chatted too much about how uh, proliferative kidney in fish can be studied. And I jumped um, uh, from the last two uh, uh, fish diversity in that case and, and the deadly infections in fish are in fact a proper into the channel network. There's no other network to speak about. So my conclusions, the whole, the general conclusion is that um, eco-hydrological footprints of um, river networks as ecological corridors are demonstrated. They are pretty strong in fact. And from peaks of prevalent in waterborne disease infections to any kind of large scale patterns of species abundance and biodiversity, or even the susceptibility to biological invasions that we have seen, uh, it's all in the water. So in a way it's written in something which could be remotely acquired over, over virtually uh, six orders of magnitude and um, remarkably compelling. So in a sense, towards a fair distribution of water, which is my punchline, that is the, uh, attaching a price tag to certain things which weren't um, material, uh, materially or observables in economic terms, but they are absolutely vital because they don't have a way of predicting what will be the impact, for instance, of, the, of a, an expansion of water resources um, uh, 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 exploitation patterns in the 
uh, expansion of a disease, for instance, its cost. So they open um, the uh, a quantitative, they open to a quantitative evaluation on ecosystem services uh, to rethink, in a sense, um, social equality. And I thank you uh, with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we can open the floor for questions. I have a quick question. Yes, please. Um, in the in the model uh, towards the beginning, when you show the uh, alpha diversity increasing as you go downstream, um, is this is this increase and consequence of accumulation of species going down because they cannot migrate upwards, or is it a consequence of just more populations? interacting and getting uh, going together uh, they, as they, we reduce the number of canals downstream? It's a good question. Uh, the kernel for, for dispersal species are the same everywhere. What makes the difference is the fact that habitat size and thereby the carrying capacity of a population of every three species changes uh, with respect to the downstream direction because of a natural accumulation. So it's an external factor which is dictated by the aggregated structure of a network that gives an inherent predictability even though, I mean, how could you possibly uh, consider all fish species equally, uh, equally capable of dispersal, for instance, or insensitive to drift uh, at a per capita level? And yet, neutral pattern um, uh, doesn't require neutral process. That's what I'm saying. So the neutral patterns are uh, more general. That's what, uh, in fact, uh, famously Purvis and Pakala put forth. And if I, if I may just a quick follow up, was that pattern completely monotonic? I, I noticed it was not, it was not a, a straight line. It was, there was some... No, they, that's a, they, they, you have to see the two patterns uh, together. So one is the frequency of uh, species distribution uh, with respect to the distance to the outlet. Uh, so essentially you count the number of sites which you have at the same distance from the outlet. It's a fairly complicated structure. So essentially it opens up and closes up. And, uh, and, uh, and the other one is essentially the, uh, simply the, you simply measure the average, which is the local species diversity, you have a different distance from the, of course, if you are interested in the catfish distribution, the neutral model won't work, right? So you have to go into a serious model of the thing. But if you look at large scale patterns, for instance, for uh, conservation reasons, the, the, the neutral pattern gives you robustness, reliability, and the capability to make decisions actually especially for conversation, for, for conservation practice. Okay, if you have no further question, Antonio, I'd be delighted to go because I have another meeting fairly soon. Sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if, if, anybody, if, if anybody's interested in any feedback and he wants to digest this, they can write me anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind of ability and for the beautiful set of lectures. And uh, uh, we will uh, reconvene again uh, uh, in a short while for the following lectures. <laughs>
Chao, Samir. Chao. Aspettiamo ancora 5 minuti. Sì, sì. Eh, non sono commesso per essere sicuro che... Vuoi provare a condividere lo schermo un attimo? Sì. Allora, innanzitutto, adesso non ti sento le tutte. Aspetta, provo. Um... Headphone. Ok. Adesso tu mi senti bene? Sì. Ok. La provo a fare lo share screen. Ok. Ok. Se faccio così vedi anche il pointer. Sì, è tutto. Ok. E se faccio così giro le slide. Ok, dovrebbe essere giusto. Benissimo, a tra poco. Aspetta, grazie. <ride>
Okay, excellent. We are uh, live again. Uh, welcome back for uh, the next lecture by Samir Suwais from uh, uh, the University of Padova, uh, who will uh, uh, talk about uh, community patterns in consumer resource models. Please, Samir. Okay, so first of all, thank you for the organizer. It's uh, really for me an opportunity to be here and to try to convey and to share with you um, some works that we have done in the past two years. So let me share the, screen, the slides. Okay, you should be able now to see slide, right? So the, this, uh, what I'm going to present is mainly um, the work done uh, um, by Leonardo in his PhD. I just got the PhD, you, you met Leonardo because he made uh, some tutorial for you. And uh, so this, I want uh, to thank you because uh, really a lot of works uh, he, he did from experiments to theory. So he, he did really a great, great and incredible uh, job. And then uh, with uh, Andrea Giometto from Harvard, now uh, he moved uh, um, in other university and, uh, and Amos Maritan that you met in the first lectures. And of course, uh, to all the lab that uh, always in the discussion is are very important. So I want to start from the, from the let's say fundamental questions. Uh, that is one of the, uh, of the important questions in ecology. So why we can observe so amazing biodiversity and uh, I think you already uh, been exposed by these uh, questions uh, on the fact that uh, it's actually it's not so trivial to understand the, the incredible uh, diversity that, uh, that we observe in the natural ecosystem. This is uh, uh, the, one of the most famous uh, uh, cases, the plankton. So in plankton, we have very few resources in the ocean, and yet we found thousands uh, of different species and this is, goes under the name of paradox of plankton, but this is in, in general the, this uh, more broad uh, questions about how it's possible to observe uh, the, uh, so large number of species, coexisting species, even in the absence of uh, of, um, of many resources. And actually, in the in the in the last years, and again, you will have the opportunity to to to, to hear uh, from Alvaro Sanchez. Uh, his great work on that. You can actually um, sample directly now from environment uh, um, DNA and uh, uh, analyze, uh, the, for example, the microbial diversity that you find in a very different uh, types of environment. And uh, again, you can cultivate uh, this, uh, this DNA in, uh, on, in the lab, so in a controlled experiment. And uh, again, uh, just using very few resources, even more resources, you observe uh, uh, many species, uh, 20, 30, that can actually coexist for a long time. And this is surprising because in, in an in a ecological uh, a fundamental setting, uh, in, uh, we understand that uh, the species uh, uh, that coexist should uh, somehow uh, uh, occupy a niche and that's uh, how species can coexist. So if you have a like, you can do this experiment actually. Uh, uh, you uh, take two species, uh, one, two microbial species, uh, one of the two is better, let's say, in uh, uptaking resources, so it's a, has a, fit, it's a higher fit in that environment. Uh, so what happens is that at the end, uh, if, you, if you wait long enough, then the, the fittest species, uh, the, the one with the highest growth rate, will invade the system and uh, will exclude the other species. That's why somehow we need an understanding of how it's possible that uh, so many species can coexist. Okay. Um, uh, let's say a way to study such problem is uh, in a theoretical uh, way. It's um, through the use of consumer resource models. In, in particular, uh, one of the fundamental uh, achievement in theoretical ecology, of course, for sure, is, uh, is the model proposed by MacArthur in the '70s. Uh, so this model, as you can see, is a model of uh, it's a system of a, of a couple differential equation. One for the species population, denoted by here by n, and, and of course uh, species grows, okay, and grows by consuming a resource, okay. So the resource uh, concentration here is given by the C, and uh, um, 
R is uh, simply uh, the resource uptake rate uh, and typically is considered as a mono function. So this is a classic mono function. Uh, so this, this term here, this alpha sigma i represent uh, the metabolic strategies that is the metabolites that the species uh, uh, needs to uh, actually uptake uh, the resource from the environment. And uh, VI is the so-called resource values, that is the, the amount of energy that the, the bacteria can extract from, some, from, from such resources. So this overall part here uh, is what uh, uh, define the growth rate of the species. While we have a death rate delta that here we consider uh, uh, dependent on the species. Uh, on the other hand, we have the resource concentration that grows uh, here uh, we are thinking of uh, abiotic resources and the uh, SI represent a, a constant res uh, resource supply rate. Uh, of course, we have a minus uh, due to the fact that uh, this resource is used by the different species. And uh, we can have uh, also a degradation rate here denoted by mu. Okay, typically we will consider this mu equal to zero, but this is not, uh, I mean, we can do that without losing a general, uh, um, uh, generalization of our result. Uh, uh, so in general, uh, you can see that alpha uh, somehow represents so a, a bipartite kind of networks that tell you which kind of uh, uh, metabolites uh, the species use to consume uh, uh, the resource I. Okay, so if alpha sigma I is zero, it means that the species sigma cannot uh, use, cannot uh, uptake resource of the type I. Okay. Okay, so through this model is uh, uh, easy to, um, to see. So these are the two equations that we retrieve the so-called competition exclusion principle that I think you have already heard. That is to say, so consider the stationary states of these two uh, dynamics. So you can see that uh, putting zero, the first, the above equation here, we obtain such a condition, okay? And uh, uh, this condition, you can see, is these are m equation because we have m species. So sigma here goes from one to m. So we have m equation, and we have a p variable, okay? Because this is a sum over uh, p alpha. So alpha uh, now are the variables. So we have m equation in p variable, but therefore, if m, so if the number of species is greater than the number of resources, we have more equation than variable, and so there is no solution for the system. Uh, except in the general case. Uh, um, uh, otherwise, uh, the system is solvable only if uh, m is smaller or greater than p. So if the number of species uh, can be only smaller or equal to the number of the resources. And this goes under the name of competition exclusion principle uh, that, uh, I mean, is, is a celebrated result that uh, still we have to fully understand. Okay, as an exercise, I uh, propose to you to show that uh, this uh, couple uh, set of equation, if uh, you use um, um, biotic resources instead of abiotic resources, that is to say instead of a, a constant supply rate, you have a supply rate that follow a logistic equation, okay? Uh, and you consider a linear resource concentration, so RC just depend on C. Then in this case, in the quasi-stational approximation, so if you put uh, the concentration dynamics to zero, and you look at the stationary state for the concentration. And once you do that, then you put back this uh, result into the population uh, in the equation for the population. You can see that you will retrieve, uh, you will recover the generalized Lotka Volterra model. Okay, so the generalized Lotka Volterra model can be obtained as a special case in a quasi stationary approximation of the MacArthur model. Okay, so. Um, it's not possible to violate the competition exclusion principle, but uh, as pointed out recently, there is a, a very important uh, uh, physical constraint that we are missing. That is the amount of energy devoted to resource uptake cannot be unlimited, okay? And uh, in other words, uh, there is a trade-off between the metabolic strategies. And uh, this was pointed out by Postman and Green, Green, Green in, a, in a recent PRL. So um, species uh, has a total uh, budget of energy that can spend in a metabolic, uh, in producing metabolites basically. And uh, so there is a trade-off between the different strategies that can be turned on. And in the assumption of, uh, of this work, uh, E, 
uh, was uh, equal for all the species and uh, there is a, a hard bound. So this is actually the sum over all the metabolic strategies should be equal to this energy E. And they showed that uh, in this case, coexistence of more species down resources is possible in some, and I will show fine-tuned conditions, okay? What are these conditions? Well, um, again, these are our consumer resource equation. And again, you can uh, um, compute the stationary states. So a first assumption of that work was that the, the, the death rate was species independent. Typically, they are very small. So from this condition, you can see that a solution for uh, R star is, uh, uh, is the following, okay? So you can, you can find a solution that is a function of the total energy budget. Then if you put back now R star in the second equation here, so again, you look at the stationarity. So you have the supply rate is equal to the sum and you put the solution of R star. Then you can see that the species, all species can coexist independently on the number of resources if such a condition is met, okay? So this is a condition that once we introduce the uh, energy budget, uh, if this is satisfied, then we have coexistence of more, uh, we can have coexistence of more species than resources. Then if you rescale all the quantities, so we call X the rescale population, S hat the rescale supply vector, Okay, I pointed out here that uh, with this tilde here, I denote the fact that I have uh, absorbed the, the, this uh, Vy, this efficiency. But okay, S hat is the scale supply rate and we rescale the metabolic strategy so that all these quantities uh, sum, to, uh, uh, sum up to one. Then uh, you can see that this uh, uh, define uh, uh, basically a multidimensional simplex and in particular, all the, uh, the strategies and the supply rates light in this P minus one, okay, dimensional simplex, okay? So uh, you can represent geometrically the solution of uh, the consumer resource model with the total uh, energy budget. And in this, uh, I represent here the, the resources. So these are the axis for the resources and all the metabolic strategies of the species and the supply rate lie on this uh, uh, P minus one dimensional simplex. So in general, we will consider P equal three, so three resources, so that the space in which the metabolic strategy and the supply rate lives uh, is a two-dimensional simplex, and so we can visualize it very clearly. So uh, let's now see uh, what, what, what does it mean that this condition for coexistence is satisfied, okay? So in fact, we can have a, a geometrical interpretation that uh, uh, allow us to understand when the, the sum uh, the sum here is, uh, is actually satisfied. So after the scaling, I said, this can be represented in, in, in this uh, simplex. And uh, so now I consider the points, the colored points represent the strategies so red species, it's only nutrient two because you can see this is only in, in the vertex of, uh, of, of, the, of the resource number two, okay? Blue fits equally upon, the blue species fits equally upon species one and species two, uh, while the uh, species, the, the violet and the orange species um, can uh, feed on all resources, okay? The star is a supply rate, so there is a supply rate that is actually um, uh, have a component that is different from zero in all uh, the different, all the three resources, okay? So the, these conditions imply that the supply rate must lie inside the convex hull uh, composed by the metabolic strategies. That is to say, if you, okay, now I'm not, was not so good to, to build the convex hull, but this, uh, this region is the convex hull, that is to say the region where you have as you limited, limited by all the metabolic strategies. The star, the supply rate, in order to satisfy to this condition, must lie inside this convex hull. So in this case, the star, the supply rate, is outside the convex hull. And therefore, you will have extinction and the competition exclusion uh, will be satisfied again. So in this case, only at 
best three species, typically less, will coexist. So there will be at least one extinction in this case, and the com competition exclusion principle is recovered. If instead the supply rate lie inside the convex hull, then this condition is satisfied, and in fact, we have the coexistence of all the four species, okay? So the total energy budget is a fundamental and important and physical ingredient to understand and to allow species to exist. At the same time, we must say that in this condition, uh, in this case, uh, if uh, we put a soft bound or if uh, we uh, uh, just perturb a little bit, for example, the budget based on uh, the energy budget depending on the species, uh, we will retrieve again, we will uh, retrieve again the competition exclusion principle. So in somehow this is a condition, it is a fine tuning condition. So of course, in general, we understand are very important uh, factors that is this total energy budget, but still uh, we want to better understand how can species coexist or at least how can species uh, organize uh, to coexist so that uh, they, so they can uh, actually survive even in the presence of your resources. Okay, so now another uh, uh, apparently unrelated aspect is uh, the observation, this is an experimental observation uh, actually, that, date backs, uh, that dates back from uh, Monod in 1949 in his PhD thesis, that uh, uh, the growth of, uh, of uh, microbial species in presence of uh, more than one resources uh, actually display the so-called the oxy shift. What is the oxy shift? The oxy shift is uh, the fact that you have, you see there are different slope in the growth of the species and that's because uh, basically uh, the species uh, um, in the presence of, for example, two resources, first use his best, his favorable resources. And then once he has uh, consumed all that resources, then there is a shift in his metabolic strategy. So basically he turn off some, uh, some uh, uh, metabolites and turn on the other one. So to start to uh, feed on the second resources. And this leads to this uh, uh, bump and this different uh, regime in the, in, the, in the growth rate. So this is a very strong, and in fact, then uh, there are, uh, of course, a lot of evidence uh, since Mono in 1949 that uh, uh, the strategies of, of the, uh, the metabolic strategies in bacteria are not fixed in time, but they change in time. Okay, so this is a very fundamental ingredient that we are losing uh, we are not considering in consumer resource models typically. So they are far not constant, but are function of time, okay? So that's what uh, we have uh, done basically. So we wanted to uh, in consider in the MacArthur's consumer resource model, uh, metabolic strategies that evolve in time. So this means to write an equation for uh, uh, for uh, uh, the, the metabolic strategies, okay? So how how to, to, to write such, uh, such equation? Well, we, we used a simple idea, maybe the, the most simple idea, that is to use an adaptive framework so that each species changes its metabolic strategies in order to increase its own growth rate, okay? So this is, uh, um, uh, in a way, uh, 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 the possibility that the species can adapt to the, to the environment uh, and select which kind of, uh, of metabolic strategies you want to use. So again, if this is the growth rate, the adaptation, so the, the, the equation for, uh, for the metabolic strategies is uh, simply, in a, in a simple way, the, the gradient of, of the growth rate. So this, in this way, we optimize uh, the, the, the growth rate. And uh, one over uh, tau or lambda denotes the velocity of this adaptation. Okay, then we will see how this is related with the parameter d. But so now we are increased. So we have a species dependent um, adaptation velocity. Okay, so this is now the, our new equation. So we want uh, uh, to optimize, uh, of course, the metabolic strategies. But it's clear now we need to put a bound. Okay, because again, there is no possibility of. Uh, devote an unbounded amount of energy. And if you just increase uh, this uh, alpha dot, you will have an indefinite increase. Well, we put uh, a soft bound on, uh, on a species dependent soft bound on the, on, the, on the energy that can be used to produce uh, metabolic, stra uh, metabolic strategies. And so now we have to perform such optimization constraints. 
So it's possible this is a, a, a general result if you have to do optimization uh, with some constraint, you can implement so the constraint in, in the equation. So the idea here, okay, here you can see there are, uh, so this is a, 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 the phase space of just the two, uh, two resources. So we have a fifth uh, alpha sigma one and alpha sigma two. And uh, this line, uh, the E star sigma divides the plane in two region. One that is the, re the allowed uh, region, we can move inside this, uh, this uh, half plane uh, because here uh, the uh, energy is less than the E sigma star. While we are not uh, allowed to, to cross such, uh, such a line, we cannot move in the, in the other plane. And to do that, what we do is that during the, the optimization, so while performing the gradient, we remove basically the perpendicular um, uh, components of the gradient that is parallel to the gradient of the, uh, of the energy. Okay, so in this sense, we have to, to perform this uh, evolution by removing all the time uh, this component so that it, uh, it this, uh, will allow to not uh, always to move at, at, at best in, uh, along the tangent of this curve. Okay, so if you do that, this is, a, a, I mean, this is just to perform this calculation, it's not so easy. And also not allowing the energy to be too negative, the metabolic strategy not to be negative you end up with the, these two uh, condition become this equation here, okay? So now we have an equation for the metabolic strategies and in this equation is also contained the constraint on the, uh, on the, meta on the metabolic budget, on the metabolic trade-off. So these are the new equation of the consumer resource model with adaptation. So you can see we have the equation for the population, the equation for the concentration, and our equation for the, the uh, metabolic strategies. Okay, so now let's see what uh, we obtain, uh, what this uh, model with adaptation can, can display, with kind of behavior. First of all, okay, so in the red line, it's a simple simulation of the model and uh, in, a, in a kind of general setting with general param parameterization. Uh, and you can see that indeed, okay, so this is the, 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 the model, this is our, the, the, the data that I showed before, and actually using meta adaptive metabolic strategies allow to, to reproduce the oxy shift in the growth curve, okay? So here, if we think that there is a, a strong preference on one resources, or we can think that we can turn it off and on to metabolic strategies, we indeed observe uh, this kind of uh, behavior, this uh, the oxy shift. Uh, and I stress here that we are completely neglecting the particular molecular mechanism of the, of the species metabolism. Uh, but simply we are, uh, for example, uh, putting a strong preference on one of the two resources, okay? With the parameter VI. Uh, but this is not only qualitative, okay? So uh, actually Leonardo together with, uh, with Andrea, they performed an experiment. So an experiment where uh, they have a cerevisi that uh, eats gluc gluc galactose and then as a, as a waste, uh, it produces ethanol and, uh, and uh, in once a gal galactose is depleted, the cerevisi eats uh, the, so feed on uh, the, the, the wasted ethanol, okay? So this is, uh, uh, first it grows on galactose, then it grows on ethanol. And you can see this, these are eight replicas of the, of the experiments in the growth. So you can actually see very well this, uh, this deoxy shift. Okay. Now, if we try to, to describe to, 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 uh, this uh, behavior with, uh, with the, the model, with the consumer resource model, so uh, this is uh, the best fit, uh, okay, using Monte Carlo uh, chain methods of the model with adaptive on the, left, on the left and with the fixed metabolic strategies. Of course, here we have to constrain, so we can measure some um, uh, parameter of the model independently from the, uh, and we know from the biology that we have constraint on, on the parameters, let's say, and given such constraints, we, we perform this, uh, this best fit of the model. And you can see that as expected, the, the consumer resource model without metabolic uh, adaptation uh, follow a, a, a simple and uh, uh, let's say with the one slope uh, growth curve. While with the adaptive strategies, you really can see that we can quantitatively describe the, the experimental data. Okay, now let me 
uh, make a link, uh, a, a, a interesting link, this is a suggestion rather than a proof, uh, with the metabolic theory of ecology. Okay, so the metabolic theory of ecology is a fascinating topic. I think that uh, Amos told you uh, something about uh, that. And uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, I mean, one of the most celebrated equations describing this metabolic theory of ecology is the so-called the Kleiber law that describe the relation between the mass of species and their uh, metabolic rate B, okay? And indeed, over several order of magnitudes, you have that uh, such relation is a power law with exponent three, three, uh, uh, three over four. Now, is discussed about this exponent. Uh, of course, this is just average uh, relationship. So these are average mass and average uh, metabolic rate, but this is quite a strong evidence in many, in many different fields uh, of the existence of such uh, uh, metabolic rate. That is the fundamental rate that govern many patterns in biology. So if we assume that uh, Kleiber laws holds, uh, then uh, in our equation, in our, in our uh, in our physics of, of by physics of the model, we have a different rate, one given for the death rate, another one given by the adaptation velocity, another given by the rate of uh, metabolic production. Well, all these rates will depend on the Kleiber law, and so finally will depend on the on the biomass, on the mass of the of the of the species. Indeed, it's easy. I mean, it, it can be shown that if we assume that the the metabolic theory of ecology holds then um, we have that both the total energy budget and the death rate scale as the biomass to the minus one over fourth, okay? Now, uh, in this condition, uh, what uh, we have as a consequence is that uh, the ratio between the energy budget and the death rate is species independent, okay? And uh, also, uh, we have that uh, the death rate, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 um, the adaptation velocity can be written as a function of the death rate, okay? So th this uh, leads everything to one, only one characteristic temporal scale, okay? So this is not uh, mandatory, okay? Uh, we can uh, relax this hypothesis and uh, if you want, uh, I can, uh, in, in the question, you can ask me what happened if we relax this hypothesis. But uh, now we are assuming this hypothesis, so we are considering in the following that uh, the ratio between the total energy budget and the rate rate is a species independent. Okay, so again, now uh, we can write for our model a condition for coexistence. And uh, in fact, uh, we have that in this case, uh, all species survive uh, again. So these are just different uh, little mathematical details. But the, the final point is that, again, the supply rate, the scale supply rate, must be inside the convex hull uh, of the metabolic strategies, okay? So uh, different uh, uh, derivation, but the same result. Uh, <clears throat> so now, the point is that now the alpha depends on time, okay? So here I forgot to, to explicitly make a, de a, a, a time dependence here of, of the of the, of the, so let me, let me do it uh, just to stress this point. So basically here, this alpha, okay, here the alpha uh, are, ooh, courageous. Okay, let me see if I can do it. Depends on time now, okay? And, uh, okay, so now if, uh, uh, so now this is the initial condition, for example, okay? So after rescaling, we set the initial condition, alpha t equal to zero, and the supply rate is outside the convex hull, okay? So we have four species, three resources, same condition as before, and the supply rate is outside the convex hull. So the question is, what about species coexistence, okay? So I remember to you that in the case of fixed, static metabolic strategies, then in this case, if the convex hull, if the supply rate is outside the convex hull, then you can, as you can see, we have extinction of many species and only two in this case survive and CHAP is recovered. The competition exclusion principle is recovered. Let's see what happens now if we allow 
this maximization of growth rate constrained by total energy budget in our equation. Okay, so this is what happened. It happened that there is a dynamics of the metabolic strategies along this simplex, and finally, you have that all metabolic strategies uh, self-organized in a way that the supply rate now is in a stationary condition is inside the convex hull. And in fact, as you can see, all the species survive. As you can see, the, the wild species is the closest one, is the most abundant one, but it's not trivial because, for example, you can see that uh, this is not, uh, I mean, the, the orange one is not the, the, the is not the closest. So, I mean, it's not uh, uh, trivial to, to find uh, um, in, based on the position of the metabolic strategies, the, the, the abundance of the species. These are open a problem as far as, as, as I know. But uh, um, we can see that the strategy is self-organized and coexistent is allowed. Okay. So we can now look at the other, other, other uh, um, experiment. For example, you can think about uh, perturbing the environment so that the supply rate now is uh, the star uh, for, a, for a given time. And then you turn it off and you turn it on a new supply rate, like having different kind of uh, source of resources from the environment and you change it, okay? And in the case of fixed metabolic strategies, of course, this uh, leads to a stress of the population dynamics uh, that you see they start to oscillate larger and larger until uh, most of them will reach extinction. And only a few of them, actually, if you, you wait long enough, uh, Maybe none of them will survive. Okay, so let's see what happened in the same condition for adaptive strategies. Okay, so what you see is that uh, uh, adaptive strategies increase the community resilience and so stabilize the population dynamics of our microbial community that is able somehow to follow, to adapt to this external environment. Okay. So we have done a lot of different tests. So for example, what happened in the presence of uh, uh, resources that are heavily degraded or uh, what happened in the presence of very inefficient resources. And all the time you see that just implementing this optimization principle with constraints, the community is self-organized so to have the best response to the kind of perturbation you implement to the community. So this was very cool. Okay, so uh, finally, one can say, okay, but uh, so here we have a new paradox. Everybody always survive, okay? Well, the answer is this is not true in the sense that it depends on the velocity of the adaptation and on the velocity of the perturbation. That is to say that, so here I, we, are, we plotted the, long, the rank abundance curve. So this is the, the log of the stationary abundance of a community of 20 species and three resources for different uh, adaptation velocity and also for uh, no adaptation at all. So in a, for no adaptation at all, of course, you recover check. Okay, so you only have three species survive. But you see, you turn not on a little, the, a little adaptation, then uh, more species survive, but not all the species survive, only six. If you now increase the adaptation, uh, around 13 species survive. And then if you increase again the adaptation velocity, then all the species survive. So the adaptation velocity is a, a fundamental control parameter in controlling the, the observed biodiversity of the system. Okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, first make our first uh, part of uh, my conclusion of, my, of uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, we have introduced adaptive, adaptive metabolic strategies that maximize the species growth rate. And we have, we have observed that this allows to, to describe the oxygen shift growth pattern. And uh, moreover, that this uh, adaptation drive self-organization of species toward the coexistent pattern. Uh, and also that metabolic adaptation increase stability of the ecological community against environmental perturbation. Okay. Finally, we have seen that adaptation velocity is the parameter controlling the actual number of species that will coexist at stationarity. Okay, so this is the first, uh, the first uh, uh, conclusion that I hope uh, uh, you have. Uh, uh, if there are questions about this first part, maybe we can uh, take it now. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Can you read it? Yes, how would one design experiments to test the uh, adaptive uh, strategies prediction. Uh, okay, so for, okay, 
uh, our first test was uh, that we do, we have done was uh, to 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 perform the experiment about uh, uh, try to describe the oxy shift. Okay, so in this case, uh, I mean this is maybe I mean it's not a prediction in the sense that we know that we observed. Uh, uh, the oxy shift, but uh, uh, if you wish, you can uh, actually see. One experiment to test the strategy uh, about uh, adaptive strategy prediction would be to be able to cultivate a microbial uh, community with species, uh, maybe engineered species, characterized by different uh, adaptation velocity, or you, you, you actually force some, uh, some uh, inefficiency in some species. And actually, what you, what you would expect is that uh, uh, being uh, less efficient in adaptation uh, and uh, somehow measuring this uh, velocity adaptation, you can actually test uh, um, that uh, uh, which species survive and which not. We have done a kind of similar experiment and I will present in the second part. But of course, I mean, you, you may think of many experiments. That's what we are doing right now. So I'm not an experimentalist. I don't want to speak uh, uh, out of, uh, of uh, rigor, but uh, yes, we, you can actually do, uh, I think, many experiments to test this, uh, this prediction. So second question was, uh, would you say that this model solve uh, the plankton paradox? Well, okay, S uh, saying definitive words about the science is always, uh, I mean, uh, uh, too, too demanding. So I would not say that solve the paradox of the plankton. I would say that suggest, uh, strongly suggest, if you wish, uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, quantitatively suggest that adaptation is a very important mechanism for species, at least the microbial species, to coexist. Yes, in this regard, I would say yes. Uh, we, we, what, what I think we have understood that uh, dynamic, I mean, having adaptation is a fundamental ingredient for having a high biodiversity, even in the presence of your resources. Okay, if it's not the only explanation, is not probably the only contribution to, 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 to the solution of the paradox, but for sure is one, one, one part, one important part of that. Okay, so if not, I go to the second part. I hope to, to be able to, to be on time. There's a... Ah, I don't see it, sorry. No question. I didn't see. Uh, can you read it? I don't see you. The chat it disappeared. I don't know Have you checked it. whether these results are robust to noise? Uh, to noise in 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 where? So yes, we, we have checked that this result are robust to noise. Depends where you where you put in the noise. So I will uh, at the end uh, maybe remind me this question. I will show you that. Uh, if you perturb the, the condition, so if you put the noise in the ratio between the energy budget and the debt rate, so if you allow the ratio of the energy budget and the debt rate uh, to uh, not to be species dependent, so in this case it's not fixed to a constant, but may vary, like uh, also, I mean, you, like you, you, you consider a variance, then in this case, this lead in the long time to competition exclusion. So as soon as uh, that condition is, uh, is not observed, if you look, if you wait long enough, uh, you will uh, obtain uh, competition exclusion. But uh, this will uh, occur in a uh, uh, sc uh, time scale of the order of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, depends on the variance. Okay, so this is an uh, important point. The effect of the noise is like when you when you go from deterministic to, to, to you add the noise to, I mean, you have absorbing the state, of course. In the deterministic case, maybe you are stable. Uh, in the in the stochastic case, if you have that you you pass the barrier, but maybe in exponential time. Okay, so in this sense, it's robust to noise. Of course, we have you have a uh, quantitatively different result. Are there any other questions? Uh, what happens if some resources are not? Substitutable. Uh, what does it mean? I would love to answer, but I have to ask. Uh, okay. Sylvia to you can unmute and uh, ask. Yeah, Sylvia, so, can unmute. My question. I was thinking, like, okay, we heard uh, the other day um, from James O'Dwyer of non-resource, non-substitutable resources. It means that, like, one. Uh, 
species, for example, plankton, it needs nitrogen. So the adaptation of its strategy, I mean, it can adapt strategies, but uh, still these resources is, is needed. It, it, mm -hmm. it cannot uh, stop using nitrogen. So could you, uh, like, did you think well, what will happen to the model if uh, this happens? Well, I think that this is in the model would, uh, would mean that, I mean, this is not incorporated in the model. So I, 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 I don't know. In the sense that from one side, you can uh, think that uh, there is some metabolic strategies, some alpha, sigma, I. So if I is nitrogen, this must always be greater than zero. So you put constraint on the entries of this metabolic uh, matrix. But how to put uh, this non substitutable resources in the growth rate? This is not, uh, I mean, this is not, I didn't think about, okay? So this is not trivial. So you can constrain the model to use, if you wish, some resources, but I don't, I, in this model, in this moment, there is no, I mean, preferential use of one of resources. So there is a, no this possibility to constrain the use of one resources. I see, thank you. Uh, can I ask you a question here? Yes. Or, oh, sure, thank you. Uh, so my, my question is about the, the, the assumption of the growth rate maximization. I, I mean, uh, think about a community with, um, you know, consists of the two species that has uh, obligate uh, interdependence, like, um, you know, uh, amino acid austral. Um So how, how, how does in that case that your model needs to be, you know, changed or, you know, added a term to, to account for um, the cases, you know, the, the mutualism and, and the not, not the species want to optimize its own, but the, the whole community. Okay, yes, this is not, a, this is a good, good point. I mean, uh, this is a really uh, something that we are doing now. Um, we are not considering any kind of cooperation. And so uh, any kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, cross feeding type of, uh, of effect. For sure, this uh, will have uh, an important uh, effect also on, on, uh, on the possibility to coexist. So that's why I said before that this is not the only mechanism, okay? This is not that, uh, I mean, with that we can explain everything. Uh, it's, uh, this is, right now, it's, uh, it's just adaptation in a, comp in a poor competitive uh, uh, communities, but for sure in the same framework, actually, you, you could, and we are doing, we want uh, adding also cross-feeding and other cooperative uh, mechanisms. Okay, so I'm, I'm just reading the, there is a, a consider you now two questions about uh, physiological uh, adaptation is physiological genetic changes or, uh, so let me just go to the second part because I think that this is uh, enlightening on this second part of the question. In fact, my second uh, aspect is bridging, try to bridge, uh, we try to bridge uh, the cellular and the ecological scale. Because, in fact, there are evidence that uh, the abundance of microbial species is strongly correlated with the metabolic function, so that you can actually predict uh, community composition by assembling uh, microbial species in metabolic blocks uh, that are specialized in particular metabolic function. And uh, we have already seen that the metabolic adaptation is very important in, 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 in determining the, 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 the evolution of the population. So, what we want to understand is the function is, of course, the function performed by a species depends on the protein it is producing. And so the balance between the function, that is the metabolic trade-off, depends on how the proteome of species is allocated. So now we would try to try to understand what's the origin of the metabolic budget and of the adaptation of the fact that these strategies evolve in time. Okay. So how does allocation of the proteome affect the dynamics of microbial community? So we take a step in a, in a, in a smaller scale and we look at, so uh, we consider a species and we consider the, the complexity of its proteome, that is the, the, all the proteins that can be produced by that species. And uh, <clears throat> it's known that uh, the total proteome can be divided into three, uh, let's say, uh, la, uh, three um, important uh, uh, functions or regions uh, so they, that are denoted by Q, P, and R. So uh, all the proteome dedicated to housekeeping function, such as the transcription factors, are the phi, are, are the phi Q. So phi Q is the fraction of uh, the proteome allocated for housekeeping function. And typically this is uh, hard-cored, so this cannot be 
So it's fixed. This cannot change in time because these are the minimal condition for, uh, for, for the for bacteria to work, okay? Then we have two other regions, two other uh, uh, families. One is the uh, proteome allocated for nutrient uptake and the metabolism. That is the one related to our case. And we call this with, by phi P. And then there is uh, the uh, allocation of proteome for biomass synthesis, that are ribosomes mainly, okay? Now, phi P and phi R, uh, as I will show, can vary, but are in, tra in a trade-off, okay? And uh, this uh, important relation between this different uh, protein allocation and the growth rate, so this interdependence of cell growth and gene expression is a, a very seminal work uh, of a uh, seminal work, important work of uh, the group of Terry Wa that was published in Science in 2010. So in this work, uh, they found phenomenological law, okay, that described the relation between the Protein allocation, for example, here of the R sector and the growth rate of the species G. Okay, so uh, in this case, you can see that, so these are data from the experiment. In the y axis, this is basically a proxy for this protein allocation for, uh, for, the, uh, for the R sector R. Phi zero, you see, is the basically hardcore. So this is the mean, uh, you cannot devote less than phi zero because these are needed to live. Okay, so it's a compressible part of the phi R. And then you can see that uh, increasing the, the amount of, uh, of, uh, of uh, protein dedicated to this sector, you increase the growth rate. Okay, so it's an in, in a linear relation. Okay, uh, KT is uh, basically a measure of uh, translational capacity. So how fast the microbial species uh, express its genome, while rho is just a conversion factor. Okay, so this is not, uh, these are details. On the other way, also for the protein allocated in the P fraction, so the one of the metabolite, of the, for the metabolites, also this is in a linear relation with the, with the growth rate, okay? So these are the two phenomenological law that they observed. It can be synthesized in this way. So we have that the fraction of protein dedicated to the uh, nutrient uptake is proportional to the growth rate. The similar is for the uh, R sectors. Uh, that is proportional to the growth rate, while the, uh, the, the housekeeping function is, uh, is uncompressible, it's constant. And we have this condition, of course, the fraction, the total fraction should be one, okay? So what we have done uh, is to generalize first the, these phenomenological laws for N res NR resources and NP species, okay? So now we have NR resources, NP species. And what we consider is that the P sector is subdivided, okay, uh, uh, for the different resources, okay? So phi sigma P1 is the metabolites, is the proteome allocated to uptake resource of type one. Phi sigma 2P is the proteome allocated to uptake resource two and so on, okay? Okay, so in this case, we just generalize uh, the, the, the basically the same definition, but considering the growth rate contribution due to the resource I, this is this G sigma I, okay? So because we are focused on the, on the, on the protein dedicated to the P sector, we will, uh, for simplicity, just uh, uh, denote this by phi. So when I, there is no uh, subscript, superscript, this is of the P sector, okay? So, an important assumption that we are doing is that the sum of the different contribution of, of the growth rate of the different resources uh, uh, is uh, basically, this is the, the sum gives the total growth rate, okay? So the total growth rate is simply the sum of the growth rate contribution for each single resources. And if you do this and you put this condition in this uh, constraint, uh, the normalization constraint, you go, you obtain uh, this condition for the, uh, for the proteome uh, allocation for uh, species sigma to all the resources I, okay, here. And you can see that this sum, this is constrained by this capital phi, okay? So this capital phi is the total proteome that can be allocated for the P sector, basically, for growth, for, for, for resource uptake, okay? So this is just come from this uh, one phenomenological law. So now the model is quite easy to generalize in this sense because we have that, uh, okay, for each resources, we can have a proteome allocation phi sigma one, 
that will be proportional to the uptake rate of the species. And again, and in, in turn, this uptake rate uh, will contribute to the growth rate of species one following the, uh, the, the laws that I just showed, okay? And the total growth rate will be just the sum of uh, the different uptake rate for all the different resources. And then we have a maintenance cost that is called by Q that is similar to the death rate, okay? So the new equation are simply this coupled equation here so it's the same as before, but now G sigma directly depends on the proton allocation of the species. So this is explicitly all the, all the equation. So, so now we go a little bit quick because uh, I have uh, uh, not much time, but I want to stress that this is really similar structure of the equation that I before presented. The, the change, this, now we have a, actually a, a more microscopic understanding of the different parameters, okay? Uh, because we are working at the, at the cellular scale. And also the new, the, there is the new constraint the totally budget allocation uh, now takes just the form of this protein allocation constraint, okay? And very interestingly, you see that this protein allocation for the P sector is fixed, but this is equal to this left part, this is the third equation. And actually you can see that because R changing time, also phi must be variable. So you see that the, Protein allocation for growth, so for, for these metabolic uh, strategies, must be dependent on time. So we don't have to suppose, suppose it, we just uh, came out from this uh, cellular description of the protein allocation. So at this point, uh, this is just, uh, should be, so if uh, the, 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 this phi must be variable, then we need to write some dynamic, strat dynamic uh, uh, equation for the phi that co will correspond to the metabolic dynamic metabolic strategies. And again, we have an optimization of the growth rate, but with these new constraints, okay? So the mathematics is the same as before, so I'm not going uh, to too to much detail, but you just need to optimize it through the gradient by imposing the constraint that is given by this equation. And then you end up with this final equation here that is the same as before for the alpha. Okay, but now the phi are the protein uh, allocated for the P sector. So again, you can study the result of condition. You can look at the stationary solution of the system. Okay, these are the stationary solution of the system. From this, you find that uh, one solution is given by this R star. And again, you can call the ratio, that ratio there uh, with the capital um, theta. And then you have that the R, you can write R star in this way. And then you can actually, the, 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 the constraint, the constraint, the biological constraint now, I mean, this is a constraint that has a biological meaning is that you can see the maintenance cost is proportional to the proteome allocation, total proteome allocation of the P sector. And in this sense, if phi, if phi sigma increases, we have to spend more energy to synthesize catalytic, catalytic and ribosomal protein, and therefore the maintenance cost increases. Okay, so this makes sense. And uh, this is just a condition. So this condition must be fulfilled for the equation, for the stationary solution to make sense. So if this is not fulfilled, you don't have the stationary solution out there. This is not enough for having coexistence. For having coexistence, again, you do the similar as before. You are scaling M, S, and phi, and you obtain again that species coexist if the supply vector is within the convex hull, okay? Uh, and now phi is the proteum at the stationality. Phi star is the proteum allocation stationality of the species I to resource, to the species sigma to resource I. So again, now you can see, now you have the through the hope, uh, we start with a given initial protein allocation. In the fixed case, uh, you, if the supply vector is outside the convex hull, you would have uh, extinction, but now protein allocation change so that the new metabolic strategies are, uh, uh, are uh, uh, the supply vector is within the convex hull and you find, uh, and you find uh, coexistence. So this is what I was mentioning. Leonardo used two engineering strains of E. coli and competed them with one common resources. And one of the strain, was engineered so to, we can change the protein allocation experimentally and uh, we can evaluate the outcome of the competition as we do so. And in fact, we predict the outcome of the competition in this case, okay? So you can really do experiment 
engineering the protein allocation of species and, 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 and trying to predict the outcome of the competition. And again, you can see that uh, uh, the, 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 the velocity of the adaptation is again a fundamental parameter. If uh, the, as you can see here, this is uh, the condition where the velocity, where the adaptation velocity is high, so the species can uh, adapt and coexist, all the species can coexist. In this case, adaptation velocity is, uh, is low. And in fact, you can have, uh, in this case, you, 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 you don't observe coexistence. Okay, so in this case, you can see if epsilon uh, is, uh, is large enough, uh, you start to have extinction. That is to say, if uh, adaptation is low enough, uh, you start to observe adaptation. So depending on, on, on the adaptation velocity, again, we have, we have a coexistence or not. I wanted to highlight, uh, I'm, 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 I'm going very few slides and, and I concluded. Um, because this, I, uh, I, there was a previous talk that was mentioning this. So depending on, on the amount of, of, uh, of supply rate, even if adaptation is low, but if supply rate is very strong, then we can have a species to coexist. So if we have a strong influx of, of resources, then you have that in this case, more species than resources can coexist. For example, here you can see that if the supply rate is small, the adaptation velocity is not enough. And so only two species coexist. We have, we have always three resources, only the yellow and the, and the blue species coexist. But now if we increase two times uh, the, the, the supply rate, yet uh, only two species coexist at stationality, but the extinction take more, much more time. And then if we instead increase five times the supply rate, then you see that uh, uh, all the species now start to coexist, okay? So also this, the amount, the, the magnitude of the supply rate is an important control parameter for coexistence in this case. So the conclusion of uh, this part uh, and the overall talk is that including problem, including problem allocation models of competitive communities uh, give us new insight on the, on the dynamics of, of bacterial communities and the relationship between protein allocation and population dynamics seems relevant to understand the origin of the high level of biodiversity. So here we have like a microscopic, uh, let's say, uh, explanation or not explanation, microscopic ingredient, microscopic process that have an impact on the, on the, on the macroscopic coexisting pattern of the community. So it's just a starting point. But it's a starting point that bridge physiology of microbes to a community ecology. So we are very excited about this, uh, and because we think that this is really an opportunity, because basically all the questions that probably you will uh, will ask now are open questions, because this was just uh, uh, really uh, done in in the few in the last few months. And uh, but this consumer protein resource model suggests that coexistence. Could be reached by self-organization adjustment of cellular proteins of the of the species itself. Okay, and with that, with that, I take uh, for the remaining time questions. And I want to thank, of course, all the collaboration. Again, especially, uh, I really want to thank Leonardo for his great uh, work. And these are the two references of the, the, what I have presented. One is already published in PLOS Computational Biology, and one was just accepted uh, like a week ago in the ISME journal, so it will be available soon in the ISME, but you can find the work in the bioarchive. So thank you very much. Thank you, Samir. So we can uh, start accepting questions. Uh, there's one in the chat if you want to. Yes, so now I can uh, uh, look at the chat. Okay. Can adaptation velocity uh, be interpreted as the lag phase to change the metabolic machinery? This is a very, very interesting question. And actually, this is one of the key missing uh, uh, aspect. So because we know, I mean, uh, not an expert of this, but we have a whole uh, machinery to, to model uh, metabolic fluxes. Uh, uh, so the metabolic networks, uh, to metabolic networks, so it would be very interesting. But yes, uh, I mean, I don't have a quantitative answer to this, but uh, for sure, uh, qualitatively, adaptation velocity must depend on on uh, on, uh, on the lag phase to change the metabolic machinery. And sorry, 
Uh, can I add something? So I made this question. I'm Martina. Hi. Yes. Uh, so do you think that uh, this could originate trade-offs? Like, uh, so let's say that one species is faster and another species is lower, and this could, uh, let's say, uh, change the outcome of the final composition because of these differences in the velocity of, of adaptation? Absolutely, yes. This is the understand. This is the overall understanding. So all the time that we observe the coexistence, basically we see that there are trade-offs in place. And this is the main, uh, let's say, attempt that we are doing. In order to understand this trade-off, we think that we need to go at the cellular scale, for example, at the protein allocation, but also, for example, this is a very uh, good uh, path to look at different uh, 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 lag phases in the metabolic machinery and understanding in this way the emergent trade-off between species and, uh, and so to understand uh, basically th uh, that this uh, trade-off emerging from the, from the cellular and, and the metabolic scale will have a, far, a strong impact on the species coexistence. This is exactly the, the point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have, um, <coughs> I have a related question. Um, so, uh, I mean, related to, to, to the adaptation velocity, does, does, um, I mean, is there a way that we can quantify the you know, adaptation velocity by comparing that with the data? So I think that's important because, um, you know, by quantifying the velocity, we know, you know, if it's under out of the magnitude of the days or weeks or, you know, hours, then we can know if that adaptation in the mathematical model uh, actually reflect the physiological change without the mutations or on the, you know, more longer evolutionary, you know, uh, time scale with a lot of mutations. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I can offer a thought. Uh, again, I'm really, I'm really not the guy going to the lab, so I might uh, say, so I don't know if Leonardo is connected and want to, to correct me or suggest something, but my, my, I think that uh, my understanding is, is a way to, 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 to test adaptation velocity can, can actually be done through uh, the oxy shift uh, curves. Okay, so if, for example, you take a different species, you, cultiv you cultivate independently into, into different medium, but uh, with two different resources, and you can actually have uh, a, an idea of the velocity of, uh, of adaptation for, for each of the species. So I think that uh, basically this was, I mean, this is the main. Uh, uh, suggestion here, so to, to have a, a model which parameter can actually be measured in the lab. So in this, in this way, you can actually perform first experiment with only single species, and then try to see when you put together, if you, when you put together, you have an expectation of what is going to happen. And so test uh, maybe basically the, the mechanism that you are think are important, okay? So that's what we have done in the experiment. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Leonardo, where basically we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, cultivate, uh, uh, yes, so we have basically cultivate uh, two strains, and one of the strains was producing basically useless proteins, so was allocating proteins in, 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 in not useful for, for the resources, for the medium in which uh, the species grows. And in fact, we saw that uh, this uh, leads to a competitive advantage in a quantitative way, as expected by the model. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you. Okay. I don't think I see any other no. question. Uh, so if that's the case, thank you again, Samir. Uh, okay, thank you. Very interesting research talk. Thank and, you very much. Uh, Hello. And have a good continuation. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Bye bye. We will uh, have the next lecture in about uh, 10 minutes. So everybody can take a break. Bye. Bye.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we can uh, start again with our Friday session. Uh, the next uh, lecturer is Daniel Segre from uh, University of Boston with uh, his uh, second lecture about uh, metabolism uh, from its genomic scales to existence. Please, Daniel. Thank you. Slides work? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone, again. Uh, so when we're going to continue talking about metabolism in microbial communities. So this is a perfect segue from the previous talk. And I just want to remind you, um, in the previous time, we were talking about the logic of the cell, the met metabolism as a resource allocation problem. Um, and just to remind you brief, briefly, um, the idea was to look at the complete metabolic network in an organism with knowledge of the nutrients that are coming in, the biomass components that are needed to produce a new cell and new biomass. And we uh, introduced flux balance analysis where there are constraints on the concentration of each metabolite not changing in time, so steady state constraint. There were assumptions of capacity limits for the nutrients that are coming in and for some reactions that might be known to be irreversible. And we showed that one can use optimization, for example, finding the, op the, the state that is optimal for the cell to efficiently produce its biomass um, through max maximization of the growth rate. And in general, one can actually write this uh, problem in the following way, uh, where there is a uh, steady state is expressed as this uh, relationship between the vector of the fluxes multiplied by the stoichiometric matrix we saw last time. And there are general capacity constraints in general, what can put upper and lower bound to each flux uh, and optimize any linear combination of the fluxes uh, using linear programming. And we also showed the um, geometrical interpretation of this where there's a feasible space and we're really looking for uh, an edge and vertex in this polyhedral cone, this um, convex structure that will represent the point that maximizes our objective function. Now, we want to dive straight into how we can apply this to the study of microbial consortia. And I will first show um, why metabolism really matters for microbial consortia. You saw some examples uh, already, but I want to walk you through the way we and others started thinking about this from the perspective of the complete knowledge of the metabolic capability of organisms. And one slide I always like to show about this is the following. So this is one of few instances, I think, where a lot of the interaction between different microbes are uh, well characterized. So this is a picture from a review by Colin Brander and colleagues showing different shapes. These are different microbes that colonize, in this case, um, the human teeth. So this is part of the human oral microbiome. Um, and what is stunning about this image is that really a lot of these links are known metabolic interactions between microbes. Some of these are the early colonizers, and then there is this uh, growing community um, that is uh, we try to get rid of uh, by brushing our teeth. And what is known about this interaction, some of these are uh, known as contact interaction between different species. Um, and what is known also is that some of these interactions are related to metabolic exchange. And as you heard before, um, this is probably a very common way in which microbes can cooperate with each other or exchange with each other material in many different ways. In this case, for example, a known pathogen, Porphyromonas gingivalis, can exchange different metabolites with another microbe in this biofilm. So this was, um, you know, this is interesting. The question is how common are these interactions between microbes based on metabolic exchange? Can we model them using flux balance modeling and so on? And I'll show you first how we um, early on tested this idea that metabolism really plays a role in the formation of biofilms and microbial communities using exactly this uh, known structure of the biofilm. Um, this was an idea from a former student in my lab, Varun Mazumdar, um, who took this map and asked the following question. So you can imagine having, looking, uh, we, we knew the genomes of uh, all of these microbes. These were 
well-characterized microbial strains. So we could look at each of these strains and their in intracellular internal uh, capabilities in terms of what metabolic functions they had. And at this stage, we weren't ready to do yet uh, genome scale modeling, this flux balance analysis for each of these organisms, but we took a much simpler approach, which as I'll show you soon, uh, will, was uh, nevertheless quite, quite insightful. Um, and the idea was the following, for each pair of microbes, we could ask, we could compute a metabolic distance. So this is a pairwise, pairwise metabolic distance, just based on the profiles of which reactions each organism contained. So for example, if you have two organisms here, A and B, um, uh, you know, simple uh, version of this reaction vector, reaction content vector. Uh, so for example, organism A contains reaction one and reaction four, organism B contains reaction three and four. And based on these strings that are just binary strings, which you can uh, obtain from the annotated genomes of these organisms, you can compute a distance. We computed a jacquard distance um, to, to quantify how different metabolically these two organisms are. And of course, you can do this for any pair of organisms and you'll have this matrix of um, similarity or dissimilarity based on the metabolic capabilities of these organisms. Um, so what was done then was to compute the average metabolic distance for different kinds of paths through this community. So you can imagine taking paths that are, we called order preserving. So paths that only go upwards in the biofilm in what is known to be uh, the layer structure of the biofilm from the early colonizers to the late colonizers. So this would be an order preserving path because it only goes upwards. And of course, there are many other random paths that do not preserve the order of colonization that can jump up and down um, between different species in the biofilm. So in doing so, we could then compute the average distance uh, between all pairs of organisms in both the random paths and the order preserving paths. And what we observed was that there was a clear difference between the distribution of metabolic, of average metabolic distances between the order preserving paths and the random paths. And in particular, the order preserving paths had a pairwise, average pairwise distance between subsequent organisms that was significantly smaller than the average pairwise metabolic distance for any possible random uh, non-order preserving path. Um, so this was an interesting indication that somehow if you look at the correct order of colonization, there is something unique about the species-species similarity in terms of metabolic functions. And um, as you may imagine, one possible interpretation of this is that organisms that are um, metabolically more similar to each other will have metabolites to share and will be able to gradually connect to each other metabolically building this uh, biofilm. Now, um, this somehow is a, or was an early indication that metabolism matters in microbial communities, and in particular, in this case, in the order of colonization of the biofilm. Um, we observed, by the way, that if you look at the same um, uh, property of in pairwise average distance for non-metabolic genes, you don't see this clear distinction between the two distributions. Um, and of course, there are different possible interpretation of what, what was found, right? This could reflect really the fact that organisms build on top of each other, but could also reflect, at least partially, an environmental gradient. For example, maybe there is a more anaerobic environment at the bottom of the biofilm and increasingly aerobic as, you, uh, as the biofilm grows. And in that case, perhaps the similarity and dissimilarity reflects uh, adaptation to this gradient. Uh, but there was something else that came out of this, which uh, we felt was quite interesting. This kind of paradox, if you take this idea that metabolically similar organisms will tend to uh, stay close to each other and build the biofilm, um, what would prevent this to collapse into a you know, absolutely minimal distance boredom where all the organisms are really uh, clustering in, in a structure by, uh, by their similarity? And of course, uh, in that situation, competition might dominate the capacity to exchange metabolites through synergy. Um, but it raises this interesting question of whether there is an optimal metabolic distance for metabolic synergy between a uh, complete difference between two metabolic networks and complete similarity. And I don't, I don't think this is a resolved problem. 
Uh, I think there are interesting papers coming out recently on this question. I want to show you how we start addressing this early on by using a concept that is uh, called elementary flux modes. And I don't have time and want to go into all the details of that, but I'll just mention what is essential here, which is this elementary flux modes are a way of um, enumerating all the possible pathways in a metabolic network, all the possible minimal unique pathways in a metabolic network. Um, and you can take an organism um, and um, duplicate it and ask the following question. If I put two organisms together and just count the number of pathways that are possible when I have these two organisms together uh, relative to the elementary modes that are present in organism one plus the number of elementary modes, the number of these pathways that are present in organism two. And if the two organisms are completely non-overlapping and you can build artificial metabolic network to um, engineer to have an arbitrary degree of overlap between these two networks. So if these two networks have zero overlap, then if you com uh, compute this quantity, the uh, number of pathways of the system altogether divided by the sum of each of the two individually, um, then of course the sum of the pathway is exactly the, um, the sum of the pathways present in each organism, and this quantity is one. And at the opposite extreme, if you take two organisms that are exactly the same, have exactly the same metabolic capabilities, uh, when you compute this quantity, each organism, the two organisms are the same. So the uh, elementary modes of the uh, junction between these two organisms is really the same of each organism alone. And this quantity will have a value of a half. And what is interesting, and you cannot really uh, quantify this unless you actually do the calculations, and we did these calculations, you can find that there is, and uh, this is uh, almost like an uh, um, um, analysis theorem, right? There, there is a maximum here, uh, as one might expect, but it's interesting that you can find this sweet spot of how much metabolic overlap will lead to the maximal number of new metabolic pathways that are embedded in this combined systems, uh, system of organs one, organism two. So this is just based on the topology. It's a very simplistic calculation, but it points to the possibility that there may be out there some um, a sweet spot or a, um, some kind of uh, ideal level of metabolic similarity that will lead to maximal enhancement of metabolic capabilities. And of course, this doesn't take into account uh, competition. It's just about how much a new metabolism can be done by bringing two organisms together. And as I mentioned last time, I'm, I'm going to pause occasionally, but feel free to interrupt. And if I'm not monitoring the chat, but there is a question, just someone please stop me and I'm happy to uh, pause and, and address any question. So from this early, very um, simple um, presence absence analysis, we really want to move to a stage where we can model computationally the dynamics of communities. And as we saw in, in multiple talks, including the previous one, one can look at uh, a community as, as a set of entities, right? Can, that can represent it between, you know, in different, uh, different, different levels of description, this would represent maybe more like a lot of Volterra model where you have uh, individual variables representing individual organisms and you can try and model the community as um, an ecological system in this way, um, there is the possibility, which is really what flux balance can do and what we'll focus on, where you can think of uh, the circuits within each organism and try to predict the interactions between different species based on what you know about the intracellular circuits of each organism. And as we'll discuss probably uh, next time, there is also the possibility of thinking, but I want to hint to this, this now, there is the possibility of thinking of a community as a soup of enzymes, where perhaps uh, for a complex community, what really matters is what functions are present overall in the community. And we can ask the question of whether or not compartmentalization matters. So is it important to know which functions are performed by which organism, or is it possible and useful to think of a community as this overall conglomerate of metabolic functions? So for now, we will focus on this uh, type of modeling, where we really uh, know the intracellular wiring, we know the environment, and we try to predict ecological interactions in the dynamics and the structure of the community. And we'll also talk a little bit about design of the community. And I see there is something in the chat. I don't know if it's a question. 
Yeah, do you want to ask this question? Uh, yeah, yeah, Daniel. So I, I, I type in the box. So, so my question is that for the first example of the order of the colonization in the bowel film, so I, I saw the result is that the, the bacteria in the order test has smaller metabolic di distance. So my question is that does that mean that, uh, you know, if, if there are two types of uh, the effects, which is one is the environmental gradient, another one is the ecological interaction, could, could change the dynamics. So would that result mean that the uh, environmental gradient dominate over the ecological interactions? Uh, because in, in my mind, you know, maybe I'm wrong, I just think that uh, if the ecological interactions are more importantly to, you know, preserve the order, um, then there might be a lot of cross fittings between the metabolically more di different bacteria uh, that might be prevalent, which is not the case in your data. So I just want to have some, some comments on, on that question. Thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. Our next yeah. that's a very interesting question. And I guess I, I think from this early analysis, we don't, don't really have enough information to, to determine this. What I thought was interesting here is that if you practically look at what organisms, what, like the evidence we found there was that if you look at the organisms that are close to each other in the biofield, there seems to be a tendency toward a smaller metabolic distance. And I agree that we don't really have enough information to, you know, to know whether to interpret this as, okay, there is a just driving force that is the gradient of uh, environmental oxygen or nutrients and so on. But there could be also a situation where each organism right, modifies the environment for the next organism to occur. And, and then the question is, and the possibility and what I, what I think might be happening is that uh, organisms that are too different from each other, they may not have enough um, cross-feeding opportunities. And, and of course, if organisms are too close, they will compete, but there may be some sweet, sweet spot in between. And we can get back to this. I think uh, the answer to this will really come from looking at the more advanced dynamical models we'll, we'll which uh, analyze soon. But I'm happy to go back to this question, which I think is very interesting. So, um, so we, we want to move to, to these dynamical models. And I, I want to show you how um, there was a different direction early on. And now there is an explosion of different experiments of this kind. But this is uh, really these early days of trying to think of synthetic cooperation. And now the idea of building synthetic microbial communities as a way of testing hypothesis and checking what is really happening when you put the organisms together, can microbes cross feed and so on and so forth. And there was these early attempts that were, were um, really interesting and a motivation for a lot of the things we uh, did later on. So this was a paper from um, Winin Shu and collaborators uh, in 2007. And this was an engineered cooperation between two yeast strains, one of which uh, could not produce uh, adenine and the other could not produce lysine. And the idea was that only when grown together, they could really uh, would be able to survive. And in fact, this was indeed the case. So this was an engineered cross-feeding interaction that made each of these two strains uh, completely dependent on the other. It turns out, and uh, Wenin has continued working on this, doing beautiful work, showing, for example, that it's not clear um, that the metabolites that you would expect being exchanged, that is the terminal portions of, um, of these pathways are the one being exchanged. And there is a lot of interesting aspects of these dynamics and uh, I'll mention more in, uh, later on. The other example, um, more focused on uh, just trying to find different types of interactions as opposed to engineering them. This was done with E. coli strains, a library of mutants, and the idea was to put these um, mutants together. First, I mean, if you grow them individually, they grow fine in rich medium. Uh, individually, they would grow very poorly in minimal media because they're mutants that lack the capacity to synthesize. Uh, I think these are only um, amino acids. Uh, but occasionally, when you put them together, you could see synergistic growth. So this was a way of uh, trying to detect new interactions. And there were a number of new interactions that were detected. This was work by Ed Wintermute and Pam Silver. So, when we started thinking about this, we thought it would be interesting to um, try and mimic some of these ideas using uh, stoichiometric models. This is work that a former student in my lab, Niels Klipkord, pioneered. And we tried to do things in a slightly different way. So rather than tweaking the internal circuits of the cell, as done in these previous examples, right, you can do mutations and try to induce interactions 
based on uh, changes in the circuits, in, in particular oxotrophies or um, removal of genes that are essential for producing essential compounds, we thought that perhaps it would be interesting to tweak the environment. And so take two organisms that are natural occurring microbial strains and ask whether we can induce an interactions not by changing the, the circuits inside, but changing the environment. And the idea was that, well, first of all, this is in, you know, simpler to test potentially, because if you wanna test uh, in particular a high throughput um, interactions of this kind, it's much simpler to just provide different nutrients experimentally than having to uh, do mutations uh, to the strains. And the other aspects of this, which turned out to be really um, the, the beginning of a new line of research is that, uh, and a lot of people are obviously interested in this, the environment clearly have a, has a strong effect on modulating interactions. So this is a way of starting to look at how the environment can uh, really, you know, can the environment, environmental changes induce interactions and what is the role and how much variability there is in these interactions as a function of uh, environmental composition. You can change in principle the carbon, the nitrogen, the sulfur, phosphorus source and so on. So there is an endless combinations of different nutrients that can be used to try and um, induce these interactions. Of course, one could use a rational approach and we'll see more of this. But for now, what we did was just simply use flux balance modeling to try and find in a large space of possible compounds, some that would induce interactions. And I need to tell you a little bit more about how this is done in practice because it's non-trivial, right? When you look at this, we saw how to model an individual organism, but how do you know, how do you go from a stoichiometric model of an individual organism to a stoichiometric model of a community where you have two organisms together? And the answer in the end is really something that existed already in the flux balance world, uh, but was, was used for different purposes. And the idea is to use compartments. So you can build a compartmentalized model. And I'll illustrate this with this very simple example where you have two organisms, um, one and two, and they have a very minimal network. Organism one can produce B from A, organism two can produce C from A, but each of them has a biomass that depends on A, B, and C. So each of them needs all, all of these three compounds to survive. And if A is the only compound provided in the environment, the only possibility for these two organisms to survive is to exchange B and C. So this is a you know, minimal example of cross-feeding if you wish, but it's all, it also illustrates how you can build a model of a community using stoichiometry and flux balance modeling. And the idea is that you can define, you'll have multiple versions of each metabolite. So you'll have an environmental metabolite A and you'll have an environmental, uh, sorry, a metabolite A that is in organism one, you can label it as A1. And you'll have a metabolite A that is in organism two, you can label it as A2 and so on and so forth. And you can write the system of re reactions just labeling the organism, the metabolites based on which organism they occur in. And, and you'll have essentially, essentially a block diagonal matrix representing this uh, system of two, two species interacting. Okay? So this is um, you know, in a very superficial way, the, the, you know, the, the way this stoichiometric model for communities can be built based on this multi-compartment model. This was first proposed by uh, Stolner and um, David Stahl in a, in a very nice molecular systems biology paper in 2007. So we took this approach and used it to scan systematically, systematically the space of possible environmental metabolites. Um, and just to illustrate briefly the way this algorithm was designed, you can first take two organisms and ask under what conditions can these two organisms grow both at a growth rate that is above a minimal threshold. And you can search all the possible carbon sources you have, all the possible nitrogen sources, and you can do the same for other elemental sources, but you'll have, if you find the, those that provide growth to the pair of organisms together, you'll have a set of putative media that support growth of the whole ecosystem. Um, and now what is interesting, once you take this media, you can ask for each of them um, whether it also supports growth of each organism on its own. And all of this, again, to remind you, you, do, uh, you can do easily using flux balance analysis. So you have, by definition, right, we've had an, many, many different environments, all these different combination of 
carbon and nitrogens that all support growth of species one and two together in this joint stoichiometric model. But then you can take a given environment and ask, will it, that environment also support growth of organism one alone and organism two alone? And if that, the, the answer is yes, then you found an environment right, that supports the pair together, but supports also each individual organism. And this is a case where the organisms are not really interacting. They can grow on their own, they can grow together, nothing interesting about it. But you can start finding then environments where, for example, the two can grow together. That's again how these were originally found. Organism one can grow, but organism two cannot grow. And then what this means is that the two organisms grow together, uh, but two cannot grow by itself. This means that one must be providing an essential compound to organism two. Uh, same situation here. So if you find environments that satisfy these conditions, these would be environments that would support a commensal uh, interaction where one organism depends on the other. And if none of the two organisms can grow on its own, then um, again, because the pair by definition was growing, then what you find is a set of conditions that imposes, induces a mutualistic uh, two-way cross-feeding interaction between the two species. So what is nice is that you can easily make this list of many, many environments, and for each of them, you can test whether uh, which of these is the case and ask how many times will you find environments that induce, for example, these mutualistic interactions. And I should say, when we started doing this, we really didn't know what to expect. How often would this happen? And the idea was to start getting an idea of how frequent, how prevalent, how large is the space of this possible cross-feeding interactions in metabolism. And what Niels found was actually, yes. oh, yes. Daniel, sorry, just a quick question. Maybe I missed this, but in the joint FBA, what's the objective function? Is it the oh. sum of both? Uh, of Great both question. Thank you. Yes, th thanks for asking. Yeah. So there are different flavor, flavors of this joint FBA um, in this early. So I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get back to this because that's actually this very question motivated a lot of other things I'm gonna talk about. But um, in compartment models, you have to choose an objective function. And the very first case was based on maximizing a linear combination of the two biomasses. So you can create a new reaction that uh, builds a linear combination of these two biomasses with a fixed proportion, but then you determine in advance, right? What is the proportion of the two species? Uh, you can do this by scanning many different proportions and seeing which one seems to be most uh, um, growing faster. Um, but it's, it's a little bit tricky. So you can see already that this question of what is the objective function of a community turns out to be a really interesting question, but also a tricky one. And if you choose an objective function for these uh, communities, um, you know, you, it, this is a little bit like testing a hypothesis. What we did in this case, because all, uh, well, all we wanted to know is whether we could find an environment that supports growth of each organism. So what all we did was, um, in this case, as, ask that the growth rate of each organism has to be above a certain threshold. So we asked that each of them grows at least to a certain amount. Um, doesn't matter, um, you know, they don't have to grow optimally, they have to grow above a certain threshold. And then what we did, we used mixed integer linear programming to minimize the number of exchange reactions. So we asked what is, um, the minimal way for these two organisms to potentially exchange something so that they can go grow both above a certain threshold, which is why if the minimum number is zero, that's totally fine. Maybe the two organisms grow together uh, without you know, having to exchange anything. And in this case, there will be a non-zero number of exchange reaction. But thanks for asking these questions because I forgot to mention this. So that's, uh, okay. does this clarify? Yeah. Yes, 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 thanks. Okay, great. So. Um, so let's go back to the results here, which again were um, quite interesting. And this exemplifies some of what we found. So these are seven species for which we run all these pairwise interactions. And um, there is organism one and organism two here, uh, but you know, these are the same organisms. You can look, for example, at the interaction between E. coli and Salmonella. And what you see in this pie chart, the the overall size of the chart pie chart represents the number of media of different combination of nutrients that we found uh, that could support the two organisms together. So for example, if you look at E. coli and Salmonella, there are 
uh, millions of different nutrient combinations that can support growth of the pear. Uh, whereas, for example, E. coli and H. pylori um, have a very small number of sets of nutrients that can support both of them together. And then out of all these possible nutrients, you can look how many of these are of this neutral kind, that is uh, environments that support also growth of each organism on its own. And Salmonella and E. coli is very, are very similar in their metabolic capability. So as expected, you find a large proportion, uh, this green portion of the pie chart of nutrients, nutrient combination media that are um, essentially good minimal media, both for E. coli and Salmonella. And of course they support growth of them together, but there is nothing interesting about this. But there was also a lot of um, interactions that are um, commensal of one organism providing something for the other organism. And what was most stunning, and we really didn't expect that there are a lot of opportunities for this cross-feeding. All the yellow portions in this pie chart are cases where really this would be environment such that uh, if you feed those nutrients to those two species, they really need each other in order to survive. And I should say that this is only based on stoichiometry, right? If we were to do exactly these experiments in the lab, I wouldn't expect all of these interactions to occur because the fact that the stoichiometry have this property doesn't mean necessarily that the organism will have the right regulatory program to express the right genes to induce that interaction and so on. So this is a purely theoretical flux balance stoichiometry based um, diagram. But what it illustrates, right, is that there is out there in the microbial world, there are millions of opportunities for cross-feeding and that they're strongly dependent on the environments in which the organisms grow. And also illustrates that in principle, if you learn how to manage these uh, possibilities, there could be a lot of opportunities for engineering communities where you, by designing the environment, you could decide whether or not two organisms will depend on each other. So this was promising, but as I was hinting to, and uh, you know, the question uh, as was hinting to, uh, there are some um, underlying assumptions in this type of model that are uh, that are somehow tricky and will. Uh, so, in particular, right, the require assumption on um, this ecosystem level objective of what you know, how do you manage these two biomasses? How do you know? There, there, there is some interesting hypothesis on the possibility that maybe you could use thermodynamic based objective functions. So, I think this is a fascinating question, um, but. There are other limitations of this approach. For example, in the same way as flux balance will not allow you to predict intracellular metabolite concentrations because those are factor out when you assume the steady state, for similar reasons with uh, this type of um, compartmentalized based approaches, you cannot predict the amount of each um, species in the community, which is often one of the main, main things you would like to be able to know. Uh, so you cannot predict how much there is of each species at steady state. And this is a major limitation of this approach. Another limitation is that it's very difficult to do spatial temporal dynamics. You cannot really do um, dynamical models based on this because it's all uh, steady state approximations and you can just compute one steady state. And as we'll see later, the solution to this is gonna be what is called dynamic FBA or DFBA, which in a, an extension of flux balance analysis which will simultaneously solve a lot of these issues and I think open up a lot of uh, new opportunities. Now, before we go there, I wanna um, uh, pause for a second and think about this question of why would microbes exchange metabolites, right? And there are many different angles for this and we'll see this from different perspectives and this came up and will come up again, I'm sure in other talks, but um, you know, metabolites are part of this uh, strategy that microbes develop to, you know, grow and produce their own biomass. Why should they give out metabolites to someone else? Um, and as we saw last time, right, there are some pathways such as ferment fermentative pathways that inherently give rise to secretions. And these secretions might be helpful to other organisms, but it's not clear how prevalent these secretions are and whether indeed um, these secretions are typically um, a, you know, something that would be very costly for microbes to produce and then give rise to questions about uh, stability, cheaters, and, and so on. And, and we'll kind of get more into this. So, so um, one way we started thinking about this um, was first by quantifying really the cost of metabolic secretions. And this is work um, by a graduate student in the lab, Alan Pacheco. 
Um, and the first observation we made that motivated this, this was initiated by Niels Klipko before, it was um, asking the following question. If you take a flux balance model, say for E. coli, and you can grow it on different combination of nutrients and ask the following question. If you impose a secretion flux, will you induce a reduction in growth rate? So how much, uh, how much will have to pay in terms of the growth rate if you impose that that organism secretes a certain metabolite. And as you might expect, right, there are secretions, in this case, succinate, such that if you ask the cell, you know, before maximizing growth, you say, okay, there has to be this amount of flux of succinate going out of the cell, and then you maximize growth. And the growth rate you obtain, in this case, for example, on glucose, glucose and, and glycerol as carbon sources, the growth rate you'll obtain is significantly smaller than the maximal growth rate when you don't impose a secretion flux. So this would be a case of a metabolite that is costly. And um, kind of corroborating what we we're saying earlier, whether or not metabolite secretion is costly depends strongly on what are the nutrients. On a different set of nutrients, succinate production is not, not very costly until you produce a lot of it. But then what is interesting, and let's look at this first actually, because that's an example we already illustrated before, there are metabolites um, such as acetate, if you're growing under uh, carbon, uh, sorry, oxygen limited conditions, this is something that will spontaneously happen. And in fact, um, if you impose a secretion flux of uh, acetate that is small or zero, uh, right, the cell will not be able to grow optimally. And in fact, it will grow better when you impose that there is a high secretion of acetate possible. Okay? So in this case, the secretion is actually beneficial. And there are some, some cases in between, um, such as formate, where apparently for the two environments explored here, secretion doesn't change, uh, the objective function doesn't change the growth rate. So these are kind of neutral uh, secretions. Um, so we, we will call both, you know, these two kinds of secretions uh, for the purpose of this talk, we'll call them costless. That is metabolic secretions that do not impose a cost or at least a reduction in the growth rate under this assumption. And I wanna remind you, this is particularly relevant since we just heard about uh, the cost of protein production and the capacity of embedding into flux balance model the, um, the, or consumer resource model, but it's also possible in flux balance models, the cost of protein production. So this doesn't include any of that. Uh, uh, this was done with regular flux balance models, but one could extend this kind of approach to models that also include protein production and the cost of protein production. So let me show you what we found. So what Alan did, he wanted to uh, I find how frequent are these costly, costless secretions in the microbial world. And again, the idea was to scan many different flux balance models looking for uh, how often would we, found, would we find costless secretions. Um, so Alan designed the following experiment. The idea was to have an, enough variability of environments to explore systematically a large space. Uh, so again, this was done only in silico. Um, and I'll mention later, there is a follow-up work that is being done, uh, done experimentally now on this. But the idea here was to give two different carbon sources chosen out of a pool of different carbons and also choose whether or not to provide oxygen. So we could do this in silico experiments aerobically or anaerobically. And as hinted to before, of course, this can have a big consequence on whether or not there are secretions or what secretions are being produced. And then we computed the possible, the maximal growth rate of two organisms, of a pair of chosen organisms under these conditions. And what we did was uh, estimate if the, any of the organisms could grow, what metabolite could be secreted in a costless way. So we asked, is there any metabolite that upon maximizing growth, each of these organisms could produce. And now we did iterations where this costless metabolites was added to the medium, or added to the medium, and we repeated the experiment growing the same organism, but now on the original medium plus the costlessly produced metabolites. So this, the idea of this analysis was that we could get insight both into what costless metabolites could be produced, but also whether these costless metabolites were really useful for facilitating growth of a second organism. Um, so we did this for um, these two different conditions of oxygen availability, 108 carbon sources, 14 different species for a total of over a million unique simulations. 
And I'm not gonna show all the details. Uh, there is a lot of data that came out of this that is available in this Nature Communications paper. Uh, but I just, just gonna illustrate uh, what, you know, uh, summarize what we found, which is that there are many different type of secretions, uh, you know, much more than what uh, we originally thought. And not just the organic acid, the organic acids are this light brown portion. So there is a large portion of organic acids, but there are a lot of other molecules, carbohydrates, some inorganic compounds. And the metals are not necessarily so interesting because they're just coming in and out of the models, uh, but there are some peptides, some phosphate that are being exchanged. And for an overall total of about 60 metabolites and a little bit more when you have no oxygen. And as expected, somehow there is a little bit uh, larger number of secretions uh, when oxygen is unavailable, which is interesting in itself. And, and again, it's interesting to think of this in terms of ecological niches and whether really, uh, you know, that's something that would be testable, whether indeed there is a, a prevalence or a, additional metabolic interactions in anaerobic conditions. And the other thing that was interesting is that these secretions could really induce interactions across different species. So uh, for example, out of all the different species, if you focus first, or for example, the oxygen dependent one, you can count how many in how many simulations both organisms could initially grow, and there is a certain number. Um, and there is this is what is interesting. This is the number of uh, combinations of microbes and environments where growth could occur after cross-feeding. So after at least one round of costlessly produced metabolites being fed back into the medium. So there is a large increase in the possible growth capabilities induced by these um, uh, costless productions. And these are the proportions of which either zero or one of the two organisms grow. So the interesting part is that you can almost double the, the number of combination of nutrients in an organism in which there is growth of a pairs of organisms because of this cross-feeding interaction. So again, this was based only on flux balance modeling, based only on stoichiometry, but it's a, it's a different illustration and points out the fact that uh, in this case, right, the cross-feeding can be induced by metabolites that are really not inducing, not causing a decrease in the growth rate of each individual organism. And the idea that, right, you know, we're, we're there's a lot of interesting work and, and I'm sure there is many cases in which interactions are due to metabolites that are costly. And this could be evolved traits and we're gonna talk about this soon, but it could be evolved traits where an organism produces a, a metabolite that is costly because it leads to an advantageous interaction. But there is um, the idea that is emerging from this analysis that there are a lot of opportunities out there for costless interactions, things that are induced just by organisms doing what is best for themselves. And at the same time in doing so, uh, throwing out there something that someone else can, can use. Uh, I view this as a little bit like as recycling, right? In social community, social, um, you know, human societies, you know, there are things, you know, when you are finished with, with your milk, you know, you throw away the bottle and if you can actually uh, recycle it instead, it doesn't cost anything to you. Uh, but it actually can be valuable for someone else. And the, the idea is that this kind of interaction may be very abundant in the microbial world. And I, um, this is a map of the specific metabolites that can be exchanged. I'm not gonna uh, go into the details uh, into this, but if anybody's interested, you can actually look at what specific metabolites are being secreted under what conditions. And there is a lot of interesting follow-up analysis one can do on this. But I wanna summarize this just by showing that the emerging uh, network that we, you know, we, we looked at by analyzing this costless interaction. So this is a network of what organism could feed which other organism in this set of organisms we analyzed based on costless secretions. And the picture that emerged here is that there is a dense network of possible uh, interactions that emerge spontaneously between different species that um, may not require organisms to give up anything, uh, anything valuable, but are just emergent property of the system. And somehow this was similar to the result that in parallel, Alvaro Sanchez, and, and you'll hear about this, um, uh, found in this, uh, organ in this community um, uh, grown from on simple carbon sources uh, from plants and uh, soil. And, and this is one of the illustration from that work, which you'll hear, I'm sure more, but what is interesting is that again, the, the same picture emerged that 
on each organism could grow on the spent medium of each other organism, uh, somehow suggesting again that there, there is really, there are a lot of dense networks of exchange out there. And, and this is somehow, I, sh I must admit, very different from what I was expecting initially. Uh, that is that it's not necessarily individual targeted interaction, but there is probably a dense network of possibilities. Now, um, and as we start thinking about this with these models, um, yeah, I, I think I have, yeah, uh, 50 more minutes. So. Um, as we, we start thinking of whether, in addition to looking at the natural interactions in uh, communities, we could use flax balance models to also purposefully design uh, cross-feeding interaction between species. Um, and the idea was that, you know, when, when we look at these natural interactions uh, through stoichiometry, we really look at many different organisms, many environments, and, and we look at what are the possible outcomes, but we wanted to do this in a more targeted way and also potentially get insight into what, what I like to think of as deep symbiosis, where the exchange metabolites are not necessarily uh, byproducts and of, uh, I mean, end results of byproducts of uh, specific pathways such as amino acids, but more convoluted interactions that you may not be able to look at or find uh, intuitively such as exchange of two amino acids again. So let me show you, you'll see in a second what I mean. So the idea, and this is, uh, sorry, work by Megan Thomas, uh, another former student in the lab with the Yanis Pascalidis and others. Um, and the idea here was the following. We took E. coli and you can ask the following question. The, um, you have a certain number of reactions in E. coli, about a thousand, but you can force E. coli to use a smaller number of either internal reactions or exchange reactions. So imagine uh, the way I think about this is, is you have a knob, you can say, okay, instead of using a thousand internal reactions, now you're allowed to only, only use 900. And you can ask, how well can you do? Uh, and you can tweak also the number of exchange reaction, how many metabolites you can transport from the external environment. And at some point you can imagine, let's say focus on the internal reaction. If you uh, turn this knob too much to the left, right, you, you decrease the number of possible reactions too much. At some point, the organism will not be able to grow. You might see at some point a decreasing growth if you limit the number of reactions. And at some point, there is no way for the organism to grow. But then um, one can ask, the same question for a pair of organisms. So you can start with two E. coli that are initially exactly the same. And you can impose these constraints on the internal reactions on both of these, but now each of them could choose a different set of reactions to use. And now you say, okay, I limit to, let's say 7% of the original number of reactions they can use. But now this um, you know, top organism could choose one set of reactions. These other organisms could choose another set of reactions. And what we were wondering was whether we could find a constraint that would not allow an individual organism to grow, but would make it possible for the pair of organisms to grow together, again, in an obligate synergistic cross-feeding interaction that would be now induced by our arbitrarily tuning the number of possible reactions. And again, this was done using classical FBA in this multi-compartment model. And I'll show you a couple of outcomes of this analysis. This was done using um, mixed integer programming, linear programming, where in addition to the variables representing each flux, we had Boolean variables representing whether or not each um, reaction is present in each of the two organisms. And, and I'm not gonna go into the detail of the, of the optimization. It wasn't uh, completely trivial and it gets pretty um, time consuming as you go to full genome scale models. Uh, so it's, it's, there is, I think, interesting computational work to be done in terms of trying to improve this uh, kind of algorithms. But let me show you first the outcome that we got from looking at the core metabolism of E. coli. So this is a simplified model of E. coli metabolism. And what was fascinating is that one of the solutions that the algorithm found was these two E. coli, I would say, subspecies, right? So these are species that are uh, limited in their capabilities. And you may recall here, this is glycolysis, this is the TCA cycle, but here, each of the two, two organisms uses a different half of the TCA cycle. This species uses one half, this other species using this, uses this other portion. And the exchange with each other, multiple um, metabolites, including pyruvate here, but also some of the byproducts of this, you know, this intermediate byproducts of the TCA cycle. And what is interesting here is, you know, there's, there's a few things. One is um, that uh, 
it would have been very difficult to come up with uh, such a scheme for a possible uh, cross-feeding without the algorithm. This is again, not the exchange of two amino acids. This is uh, what again, I call deep symbiosis where two organs exchange interest, uh, uh, metabolites that are, uh, are known to be uh, transportable, but are part really, really of central carbon metabolism. And there are multiple exchanges that are required for this to happen. Uh, the other part that is interesting is that in nature, there are indeed organisms that do half of the TCA cycle. The incomplete TCA cycle, as we hinted to, um, some of these are related to the uh, cap capabilities of producing amino acid through these uh, reactions. But it's quite interesting that one of the solutions of this algorithm really resembles some of these half TCA cycle strategies that are found uh, in some marine bacteria. Now, when you go to uh, genome scale models, this is much more complicated and it's really impossible to visualize the whole network. So this is another way of, way of visualizing what happens. So what you see here, again, is the number of exchange reaction, the, the limit on the exchange reaction and the limit on intracellular reactions. So you can imagine, right, you start from, this is where you have in this corner top right, all the reactions are possible and you gradually can decrease the number of allowed exchange reactions or internal reactions and these uh, uh, areas, shaded areas in green and blue, represent the feasibility and the growth rate that is possible um, as you do this. And as you can see, if you start with one organism, right, one organism is feasible in this region. So what this means is that right, if you decrease the number of reactions to below about 250, one E. coli cannot grow anymore on its own. Uh, same if you decrease uh, to this it seems like a Pareto frontier, this exchange reaction, uh, if you decrease them too much, the single organism cannot grow. But this is where you can see again what we we're hinting to before, that if you have two organisms and each of, the, each of them has these limitations, then there is a much larger space where the two organisms can grow if they grow together and they exchange metabolites, even under constraints uh, below this 250 thresholds, up to 210 or so, or so where uh, yeah, individual organisms would not be able to grow, but the two organisms can grow together. And then there is a lot of data again. Uh, imagine for each of these cases, you have this uh, genome scale models of the E. coli networks, and you can look at what is the structure of these networks, what metabolites are exchange exchanged and so on. And this is just to exemplify the kind of insight you can get. You can see that there are regions in this space as shown here, where acetate is one of the key uh, exchange metabolites, which is not surprising. Again, acetate comes back again, but there are regions when you go to the extreme, uh, you know, you push this pair of organs to the limit, then it turns out succinate, uh, again, one of the TCA cycle intermediate uh, is one of the metabolites you would exchange, you expect to be exchanged in order for these two organs to coexist. And there are areas where some um, amino acids need to be exchanged. So probably the two organisms will do, will perform complementary metabolic functions and exchange amino acids. Uh, and again, there is much more. One thing that I, you can't really see here, but I just wanna um, highlight is that there is an interesting, very thin layer here between the one organism and the two organism uh, regions where one organism is still possible and two organisms of course are possible but uh, there is a, an area here where the two organisms growth rate is faster than the one organism, single organism growth rate under those conditions. So what this would imply is that if you were to put a um, chemostat uh, experiment and force this organism to grow at a certain rate, there would be a situation where the two organisms would outcompete the single organisms, hinting to the possibility, right, that this could be a transition where even if a single organism could grow on its own, but cross-feeding could be evolutionarily advantageous and, and give an advantage to a pair of synergistic organisms. It's, you know, this is uh, not, not saying anything about the details of how this could happen in real life, but it's showing that in principle, there is this um, overlap that would give an advantage to the two organism solution rather than the single organism solution. Okay, we have uh, five more minutes and I will um, tell you a little more about another aspect of this genome scale model. So, uh, right, we dealt so, so far only with organisms that are very well characterized um, 
you know, well-built models such as E. coli, other organisms for which we had very good models. But um, as we hinted to, right, we want to start understanding complex microbiomes or more complex microbial communities. And one of the limitations that we have to be aware of is that in many of these cases, the uh, knowledge about the metabolic capabilities of these organisms is much more limited than what we have for E. coli or yeast and so on. So the question is, can we get around some of these limitations? And um, David Burns and another former student in the lab did some really nice analysis using uh, what we call metabolic percolation in order to address this question. And this, I think, is a really interesting area because um, if you think about this, when you have a metabolic network that is not working, if you do flux balance analysis and you cannot produce a certain amino acid, the network will just not grow and will, will give you zero information of why it's not growing. So it's a little bit like, I think of it as a broken computer. And if you don't know, you know where to start, you know that one element in the computer is missing, but the computer is not working. Uh, doing diagnostic could be very challenging and so on. And, and this is all with the situation we face when you build a flux balance model and it's not working, it's very challenging to find out why. And of course there are methods for doing this. You can look at pathway by pathway, uh, but the idea uh, that David started thinking about is that um, one could uh, think of the problem of biomass production as a percolation problem where metabolites that are present in the environment could be present and um, chosen with a certain probability. And then you can ask about the probability of producing a given metabolite. And you can ask this for any metabolite that is part of the biomass of an, of an organism and uh, systematically choose uh, many, many different random environments based on these probabilities and ask what is the chance that by giving as inputs these different metabolites, I'll be able to produce one of these biomass components. And the advantage of this is that um, even if the network has some holes, you'll occasionally add some of these metabolites by chance, and you'll get an overall picture of how producible a metabolite is um, given all these different uh, chances of different metabolites from the environment uh, being available. And this is illustrating, for example, how much more robust this algorithm is regular, uh, relative to regular FBA. So for example, if you remove uh, randomly reactions from a network um, um, with the, you know, the fraction being, let's say, one in 100 or one in 10, um, FBA will soon uh, not be able to give you really accurate prediction of uh, the growth rate, but the producibility will tell you whether or not an organism can grow even after you remove a pretty large number of reactions from the network. So it doesn't give you an accurate prediction of the growth rate, but it will tell you what is the producibility of each metabolite in the network in a way that is uh, very robust. And I'll illustrate one of the applications of this. Uh, this was done again, uh, you know, circling back to the human oral microbiome. Um, and I'm showing here just a big uh, heat map of 456 strains from the human oral microbiome and 88 metabolites that are part of their biomass. And um, the darkness of the red shade here indicates how uh, producible each metabolite was for each of these strains. So uh, this uh, is a, basically a map of the metabolic capabilities of all these different organisms uh, based on this percolation algorithm. And I'll, uh, there is a lot of information here that could be compared then to, for example, co-occurrence of different organisms in microbiomes, and we started doing this. But I wanna illustrate one specific example that was quite interesting. One of these oral microbes is uh, what is called TM7. You can't really see it from here, but there is a set of organisms that are not, um, are uncultivated bacteria. So these are organisms that are, uh, cannot be grown in the lab on a, on, on a medium like E. coli and many other bacteria. They depend on something else that uh, is unknown and they can only be cultivated in, um, cooperate in uh, together with another organism, in this case, actinobacteria. And there is a lot of laborious work uh, at the Foresight and other places to find these partnerships. And there is also uh, very recent efforts that allow to sequence these TM7 organisms uh, through metagenomic sequencing or single cell sequencing, something that was unthinkable of a few years ago. But now we have the full genomes of this organism, so we could compute this producibility. 
And what we found analyzing the reproducibility and the capabilities of this TM7 um, uncultivated bacteria and the host, the actinobacteria, we found putative metabolites that are complementary between these two. So for example, um, uh, the host, the actinobacteria could provide vitamins and amino acids to the TM7. And what is interesting is that there are cell wall components that could be exchanged potentially also from the TM7 to the host, producing a two-way interactions that gives rise to a lot of uh, testable predictions and that gave rise to uh, you know, some follow-up studies. But this is just to illustrate how one can expand these ideas of flux balance modeling beyond just computing the detail uh, growth rate and using it to start analyzing real complex microbiomes and their metabolic capabilities. And I think it's time to stop. I'll just hint to the fact that what we'll talk about Monday um, is about uh, how you extend, you know, go beyond this uh, um, compartmentalized model and look at dynamic flux balance modeling where you can start thinking of really uh, not just a more um, realistic way of how to model exchange between organisms, but will allow, will, this will allow us to look at the dynamics and also the spatial structure of communities and a lot more. So I'll stop here and uh, see if there is any question. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Floor is open for questions. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, so, so for for the example, uh, last example, I mean, uh, the cross fading between TM7 and, and the host. Uh, have you done, you know, try to uh, validate the findings here in in, in vitro? Um. So I haven't, this is, I mean, we're doing experiments, but this is well beyond the kind of capabilities we have. I think there are only a couple of labs that can do this kind of experiments because, and this is just really fascinating work that is being done for, for example, at the Forsyth Institute, but just being able to isolate these TM7 organs, which are very small to deal with the host is a whole mm -hmm. art in itself. Um, so there is, uh, I think, uh, listed here, there is some evidence from preliminary studies, uh, for example, uh, that there is gene expression studies where it's really, it was found that some of these, um, for example, n acetyl d is really implicated in gene expression of the host in co-cultivation with TM7. So uh, there, there are now a lot of uh, efforts to try and characterize some interactions. And, and I think it will be very interesting to see if all of this is valid. So yeah, that, mm -hmm. is that we are not doing this, but it is being done and that there is a lot of interest. These TM7 are a fascinating, very big clade in the tree of life that has it just this starts being characterized. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's definitely very interesting to delineate uh, which is the metabolite uh, among all of this potential uh, cross metabolite is it, it, playing the the key role of the interaction that that would be really fascinating yeah thank you thank you there was a raise hand uh, by Miguel Rodriguez please yes thank you uh Daniel, I, I have a question about uh, well I, I don't know if it might be more relevant for the DFBA, but I, I will ask uh, anyway. So you, you explicitly model, you have been showing how to explicitly model syntrophy and uh, sharing some, some of these uh, metabolites. Um, but uh, is, is there a way to also explicitly model the fact that competition has a very strong attractor for one, one, domina one dominating uh, species? Yes, yes, and uh, absolutely. And as you hinted to, the answer is going to be dynamic FBA. In dynamic FBA, this comes very naturally, as we'll see, because um, you know, I can just hint to this, right? In dynamic FBA, do this stepwise approximation of the growth curve where you solve flux balance time by time. At each time point, you predict the growth rate and you know how much nutrient is being depleted. Um, so if you have multiple organisms in the same environment, this is a little bit like a consumer resource model uh, where you keep track of the nutrient extracellularly and each organism will try to use it in its, its own best capabilities, but they will all compete for the same nutrient and therefore competition will come as a very natural outcome of this simulation, which is why 
now basically most of what we do, and I think dynamic FBA is really the way to go for modeling communities. If I can, I don't see any raised hands. So if I can ask an, another question, are, are these, uh, is there a way to explicitly model also uh, toxic byproducts in the, the accumulation? I don't know. Yeah. At which byproducts become toxic. Yeah, that's another very good question. The, the short answer is no. Uh, I mean, the you can think of right reactions. If you block internal reactions and there is no way for a metabolite to go, this will give a an infeasible solution in FBA. So that is a little bit similar to toxicity, but not really. I mean, toxicity, if you think about this, is really about a metabolite having a very high concentration and starting to do stuff that it shouldn't be doing inside the cell. But by definition, then FBA, regular FBA, does not have any notion of concentration inside the cell. So we really cannot do that. Um, you know, th there are kind of, uh, you know, just hint to the fact that if you look at things like shadow prices that give you sensitivity of the biomass production rate to changes in the constraints and including the mass conservation constraints, you start having a notion of concentration inside the cell. You can do this also with thermodynamic flux balance models where you can put back the concentrations. So, so in principle, I think it will be possible to do this, but I think it's, we're not there yet. And I, I think it's a super important question. Uh, but the other thing I'll say is that even if you have the concentrations, you need to know somehow what compounds do to proteins, why they're toxic. So if you have knowledge in advance, you can model the uh, kind of rising of a toxicity in a certain situation. But whether we can predict the novel, the toxicity, I think that's even more challenging. And I think that's a beautiful question, but I don't think that, I think that's really beyond FBA. It would require structural modeling or other approaches. I don't seem to see any further question. I sorry, I have a question, oh, yeah, but I cannot I cannot find the, the thing to raise to raise my hand. No problem. Um, Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, my question is to be related to what um, was asked before, and I I wanted to ask like um, if I understood well in this um, in the in the balance analysis, like you use uh, genomic data, like so already sequenced uh, organisms. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was wondering just if this could be applicable to uh, non-cultivated uh, organisms, but um, let's say if this if it would be too much of a stretch to apply this to max or to uh, differently sequenced uh, organisms. I'm thinking of the unculturable and uh, extreme, extreme environments, my, yes. microbial communities. Yes, yes, beautiful question. I think, you know, again, the answer until a few years ago was no, um, because all of these FBA models really are based on a knowledge of the genome. And without that, you know, there, there may be other ways through phenotypic characterization, but I don't think, I think you really need the genome. But what is amazing now is that with the new technology of single cell sequencing, right? If you can se sequence a single cell. Uh, and I think that starts being possible with, with the bacteria. But the other thing that I think will really change this dramatically, and there are some beautiful examples already out there, is that from uh, deep metagenomic sequencing, yeah. now you can get enough resolution to close individual genomes. So even, you know, in, in a metagenome, if you have an organism that is uncultivated, you may have enough information to determine its, its genome. So I think that will open up uh, huge possibilities in terms of looking at this unculturable through flux balance. Yeah, I was, and then, um, I was thinking perhaps help guiding like the, the, the culturability of these organisms. Right, right. Yeah. I think that would be absolutely fascinating. Again, you know, this is what we were trying to do here. Uh, the problem, I just want to put a caveat there is that we, we know nothing about this on culture abilities, right? And, yeah. and there are many different hypotheses. If metabolites is what determines those, then yes, FBA can help. But there could be, you know, signaling molecules, uh, protein factors, um, you know, all sort of other things that are beyond FBA. And if those, you know, for those cases, FBA will not be able to say much. Thank you very much.
Yeah, I have a related question, Daniel. So you, you mentioned sorry, about sorry, the... Uh, sorry, there's a, there's a question from Martina. Oh, ah, okay. We'll raise the hand and then... No, we'll but get back it's to okay. You. I mean, it's okay. If it's related, I can wait. No problem. Okay, please go ahead. Then. Yeah, so me, can, can I ask or I... Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Martina. Yeah, so... so so I, yeah, my question is about the uh, reconstructing model. I mean, which is related to the previous question about the uh, reconstructing model from metagenomics. I, I mean, uh, even if the, we, we can't identify the, uh, the genome, the specific genome from the metagenomics, is that possible or is there any work um, to you know, reconstruct uh, the model from the metagenome you know, by using a, you know, uh, the conception of, of a super bus? You know, not compartmentalized. You know, we, we, we probably don't have the enough information about uh, the genome of each bacteria in the metagenome, but it's possible to construct uh, a superbug like model, you know, from the metagenomics. Is that possible? Yeah. yeah Thank yeah. you, Daniel. So, yeah, very, great question. The, um, it is possible, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about this next time. Um, we, there, there are some approaches that essentially do a little bit of that. Um, but it's not clear to me that I think, yeah, it's not clear to me that they, that you, you really miss something and destroy something. So I'll tell you very briefly, one analysis we did a few years ago was looking at yeast that has compartments and we compared FBA of yeast with compartments to an FBA of yeast where you destroy all the compartments. So it's a little bit like a simulation of exactly what you said, where you decompartmentalize the model. And what we found is that the decompartmentalized yeast um, you make a lot of mistakes in the predictions, basically because anything that depends on energy production across the membrane, oxidative phosphorylation doesn't work anymore. So I think it might be possible still to do ecosystem flux balance models. I don't know that anybody has actually done this, uh, but it could be possible if you keep track maybe also of meta compartments. But there are other approaches, network expansion based, which we'll talk about that actually do a little bit of that. So the answer is that it's not clear. It's a very interesting area and more to come on this. Yes, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, Martina. Yeah, hi. Um, so my question is, so for example, uh, I don't know, pH and temperature can change uh, uh, the availability of the byproducts, these kind of things. Is it possible to integrate uh, these things in the flux balance analysis, the dynamic one, I don't know, in general. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, a, it's a very good question. The, the, it's hard. I mean, it's not, technically it's not impossible. I think there's, there's been a little bit of work out there on temperature. Um, I mean, the tricky part of temperature is that it changes so many things, right? You could, in principle, try to put the, some constraints on um, right, the rate of reaction based on the Arrhenius equation and try to figure out some way of putting the, the temperature in there. But, but you know, if you think about this, there is denaturation of proteins or you know, suboptimal. So there's so many things that could be happening. And I think it, will, it would be very difficult. It's, it's a very painful thing for me because I, and many others, I think, because it, there is a lot of important applications uh, of how micro communities will change with temperature, for example, climate change and so on. But unfortunately, I don't think there is a very effective way of incorporating temperature. And similar for pH, uh, we actually, we had did some work, uh, which is unpublished, but on trying to simulate exactly what are the molecules that are being secreted and how this will induce changes in pH in the medium. So this is in principle possible, but, but it, it's very complicated. And uh, one of the things is that, let's say, proton exchange and so on is very hard to keep track of. Um, so I think for pH, there is hope. For temperature, is much harder. I would love, you know, if anybody had ideas of how to do this, I think that would be hugely important. But so far, I think, we, you know, we, it's, it's not been possible. Okay, thank you. Great. I think we had a very lively and interactive uh, uh, lecture uh, with Daniel. Uh, with more to come uh, uh, over the next days. Um, and so thanks, thanks again, Daniel. And Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we'll basically move directly to the next uh, lecture by Mercedes Pascual.
Mercedes, I think you're here already. Um, yes, I'm here. Good Hi. morning. <laughs> or good afternoon, whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, all yeah, so I guess uh, we are. Tony, I just want to check that you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you well and I can see your slides. Great, great. Okay, thank you. Okay. See you in a short while. <laughs> 
Welcome back, everybody, for uh, the last lecture uh, of today's session. Uh, we welcome back again Daniel Fisher, uh, who will uh, uh, lecture on uh, ecology and evolution in high dimensions. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. So again, please um, put questions in the chat, and I will try to keep an eye on them. And as Antonio will prompt me if I haven't seen uh, um, I uh, haven't seen one of them. Um, so um, yesterday we talked about some um, and assembled communities, which a lot of speakers have talked about, and particularly talked about the effects of having many islands with migration um, uh, between them and what the effects of that are. So what I'm going to talk about first today is how one gets to some of the results that I talked about, the dynamical mean field theory. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go to that in, in huge detail. It's, it's quite technical and difficult to actually solve the the dynamical mean field equations. So I will give what they are and sort of motivate it and then sort of give some heuristics about those. But if you're interested in that in, in detail, it's in this paper in um, uh, PNAS from Michael Pierce and Atish Agarwala who'll be involved in all of this uh, um, um, all of this work. The, um, some of the recent things that I'm gonna um, uh, mention or come towards, I won't really get to is current work, which is also involves Aditya and Maharavan, who were, if we were all in Trieste together, you would uh, um, meet since he's at the, at the workshop. Um, at the school. Okay, so after talking about um, that, I'll then talk about some of the robustness of this uh, phase that comes that I showed last time, this spatiotemporally chaotic um, uh, chaotic phase. And then I'll turn to things that are really um, uh, open and, and ongoing, um, asking about the question of whether communities like this can evolve or how they evolve in the future, and then make some brief comments about phenotype um, um, uh, models, um, and where particularly in the focus in the context of bacteria and phage um, um, and phage interactions. Okay. So just uh, um, first remind of what the um, um, of what the model is. So we have K strains, K closely related strains labeled I equals one to K. These all exist on I islands, alpha equals one to the total number of islands. The islands are all identical. Um, the populations of on island I, sorry, on island alpha of strain I is N and the total per island N alpha is, is equal to big N, which is roughly a, uh, um, uh, a constant kept by the overall limits on resources. The frequencies which we'll use or the fractional abundances are the new I alphas, which are just the ratio of the on that island to N. So those are the basic dynamical variables that we'll uh, um, work with. Okay, then there is a small migration rate between islands. It's small compared to the typical growth rates on the islands, which are of order one or actually of order one over root K, but um, um, uh, the M is small compared to, uh, um, uh, to compared to those. Um, and that's actually, it's important to be relatively small for the, um, uh, for the behavior of this phase. Okay. Then there um, can be some selective differences between the types. They just overall grow faster than others or slower than others, the SI, and that's gonna have some variance sigma S squared. And mostly I'm going to ignore this, but I'm gonna come back and say some things about it towards the end. The interactions, they're only within the islands. They don't depend on the island. So there's matrix VIJ. We also can have an interaction of a type um, with itself, a strain with itself, which is much stronger, potentially with a, um, which would be then minus a Q. But since we're interested in closely related strains where there's no particular reason for that to be stronger, we're gonna mostly set this to be equal to uh, um, zero. Okay. Well, then the crucial parts with the Vs, instead the Vs are random, so I have to tell you the um, statistics of the Vs. So the average of the Vs is uh, um, zero, as is the average of the Ss. And then the, um, the variance should be one, and this just sets the, uh, um, uh, sets the time scale um, uh, here. So this basically just gives you the time um, scale. Okay, but then and then the V's are independent except for correlations across the um, across the diagonal. So, in particular, the correlation of the effect of what J does to I with the effect of what I does to J, and that has this parameter gamma. And we're going to particularly focus on gamma negative, which is sort of motivated by particularly by the predator prey um, um, uh, uh, context. But I'll say something about um, things being more general. So, we're looking at these anti-symmetric correlations. Then gamma in this. Uh, um, um, in this range. And the canonical value for the stimulations and things is a gamma of minus 0.8 um, would be a good value. Okay. So what is the basic, uh, um, um, the basic dynamics then? So here's my dynamics. So there's the overall growth rate. That'll depend on growth minus death. That'll depend on the selective differences. It'll be a niche interaction if we include it, but we're mostly not so we mostly ignore that. And then there's the interaction with all the others on the same, uh, um, um, on the same island. Um, and then there is this piece, 
which is the Lagrange multiplier, whose role is to keep the total n on that island being uh, um, being fixed at um, n. So that acts on each island separately, and is going to be in you know transient things at least is going to be dependent on time. Okay. And then there is the part from the migration, and the crucial feature in the migration <clears throat> is that the migration comes from all islands to all other islands. So the total migration in them will come from all of the other islands, be the sum over the same strain on all of the other um, islands, which is basically going to be the island average and the limit that i is very um, large. Okay. We're going to take entirely deterministic equations with no stochasticity. There is a possibility of local extinctions. We'll sort of add that uh, in if the news, since they're the fraction of the population, become less than one over n. So this is less than one um, individual, but they can get repopulated by migration from the um, uh, from the others. And so we can understand the effects of this, but we're initially not going to include that and take n to infinity. Okay. So I showed last time from um, uh, simulations that what this system um, goes into is it goes into a spatiotemporally chaotic phase. Some fraction of the uh, um, all the strains go globally extinct. It turns out to be a small fraction. Um, usually a small fraction depends on parameters. Um, they, they go globally extinct, but the surviving ones that persist they form a, they go into a chaotic steady state after some initial transients. And the crucial part of that chaos is it's desynchronized across the islands. And the reason is if you have chaotic dynamics on two islands, there's a positively up one of exponent and the coupling between them from the migration is relatively small, then they, um, um, you will, they will tend to uh, um, uh, uh, desynchronize. And that happens all except the, mi the migration is quite large. So we've got this, this phase, and I'll just show the one of the figures that showed from last, uh, um, um, from last time. So this is one type, one strain across 10 of the uh, um, islands, and this is plotting on a log scale. And that's because the natural bouncing around is on the log scale because the growth rates um, and death rates uh, um, vary. So this is bouncing around. They can bloom up to high abundances here. So they all have these, uh, um, um, each of them has a bloom. Um, they all bloom up to high abundance, but then mostly go down and sort of hang out down near, um, down near here. Now, what stops them going too low? Well, is the input here from the migration, which is sort of called the migration floor, which is this curve here. It's bouncing around because that's an average over all the islands. And this is this new bar coming in. So that stops them going too, uh, um, too low. Okay. They can go extinct, but I put the extinction threshold down here. So that's the condition that the population's migration is big enough the product of those. So that's the extinction threshold that they can go, that they can go below. And you notice here, actually, um, the, the global population goes below that, but some of them are surviving and they uh, um, uh, repopulate this island that actually went, um, um, where it went extinct there locally. Okay, so the crucial part here, as far as the, the, you know, the qualitative features, is that the fluctuations on each island are on a log scale. They're fluctuating over the log scale, uh, um, um, log scale here. And that log scale is set by the size of the, um, um, the size of the migration. So the range this goes over here, these fluctuations, is a range of log one over m, will basically be the uh, um, the range of the fluctuations. So if m is small, they can go over a big uh, um, a big range. Okay, um, and the um, oftentimes, in fact, if many of the uh, the strains, most of the time, they sort of hang out near the migration um, um, near the migration floor, um, but they occasionally then bloom up to high uh, um, abundances. Now the blooms are high abundances. That of course happens on a linear scale because what comes into this is on a linear scale. So these blooms then will actually dominate the average. If I look at this strain and I look at the average, it's going to be dominated by the bits when it's way up here. So at any given time, only a small number of islands will uh, um, will dominate. Okay, and those crucial then are the blooms because of course it's when it blooms that it can give um, a migrants into the other islands. When it's down here, it's not going to give much migration. It doesn't matter much, but when it's up here, it's important. When it's up here, of course, also when it has the biggest effects on the other strings. Okay, um, so the, um, um, the, the this crucial bit is going to be understanding some of what these blooms uh, um, uh, blooms are and how they get there, and they get there in a, a very irregular um, way, as you can see from the wiggles um, uh, uh, wiggles in here. Okay, so these blooms then, as they dominate the um, average, the dom uh, average of the islands, they also dominate the average over the um, um, uh, over time, so they also dominate the average of nu i alpha on the one island of t, averaged over time. And I'm going to use this angular brackets to mean average over um, um, average over over time. So they'll dominate this, and then of course, since all the islands are equivalent, something that overall islands will give you um, should give you this island uh, um, 
um, uh, the xylem average. Okay. Okay, so how do we um, um, understand this behavior? So the, the goal is to try to understand this, uh, um, um, uh, this behavior. Okay. Well, the nice thing here is that we can do a systematic uh, um, a theory of this. And the systematic theory is strictly within the limit that the number of strains goes to infinity and the number of islands goes to infinity. Initially, we'll also take the population size to infinity, but we can um, uh, handle that um, um, afterwards. And this is coming under the general approach is make things as simple as possible and then add features. And of course, one of the features we want to be able to add is local, uh, um, uh, local extinctions. Even with the deterministic dynamics, so when n is infinite, I can still have global extinctions. I can have all the strains on all the island, islands, one strain on all the islands just keeping coming down and, uh, um, and die out. So I can still have the global, uh, um, um, global extinctions. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, what we do, as I mentioned in the last time, is we focus on one type, one strain on one uh, um, island. So that's um, um, uh, alternating between strains and types. Um, so one strain strain i on one island. And since the statistics are independent of the island, I'm just going to drop the um, alpha index and there and call it mu i. Okay. So we have this, the dynamics of this has several, uh, um, um, has several parts. Okay. So first, it's got the sort of obvious things in its uh, growth rate. So here it's growth rate. It's got the si. It's got this interaction with itself, if we take uh, that into account. But then it has, um, and then it's got the Lagrange multiplier, which keeps the population on the island uh, um, uh, constant, okay? And then it's got the migration coming from all, all the other islands um, and the migration out um, from there, okay? But then the effects of all of the interactions with all the others are coming from these two pieces uh, here. And I've shown this piece with a double minus sign because gamma is negative. So this overall sign will be, um, um, will be negative, um, negative there. Okay, so what are, um, what are these? Okay, so the way we try, you could try to understand this is we add a type and we add one type, um, a, a, a new type, and I'm going to call that um, a type uh, um, a type zero, um, just to distinguish it from the uh, um, others. So we put that in and we ask, what are the effects of the others? Okay, so the effects of the others, um, um, all the other ones on the same islands, of the others, what will they do? Well, the effects of the others will give it a, an effect in its uh, um, uh, growth rate, um, which is going to be, it's going to be where the zeta naught is going to come from. Okay, and that's going to be the sum over all the other strains of V naught J times nu J of, uh, of T. So that's going to be the, the, uh, the sum of the others. And this is going to be something which is going to be approximately Gaussian. It's the sum of a large number of things. The Vs are independent. So there's a large number of things. This is going to be approximately, um, um, this is going to be approximately Gaussian. Okay. And it's going to be Gaussian and it's going to have some correlations. So it's going to have mean zero. So the, the average is going to be zero. Um, equals zero, and then it's going to have some um, covariance. So it's going to have a covariance, which we're going to call C of T and T prime, okay, which is going to be the average of the um, zeta of, uh, um, of, of T, um, uh, zeta of T prime. Okay, now that zeta, of course, because we've got the, um, the, the this is coming in for the zeros, that's going to have a, um, a zero in it. Um, but the statistics of it is going to be the same for, um, um, uh, for, for all of them. Okay, but we'll have to um, think carefully about what the effects of the, um, the particular type um, are. Okay. So that's the one type, okay? So that's this part um, here, how it's interacting. Okay. But then there is a really crucial part, and the really crucial part is the feedback of this on the other types, on the other strains. Where is that feedback going to um, uh, uh, going to come from? Okay. So I now imagine that, that this new new is now growing. So it has some time dependence, and we're going to want to look at its effects on the presence of the future. So we've got new um, the new naught, um, which is going to um, have some um, time dependence, and I'm going to look at this say in the past. So I'm going to call that uh, um, uh, t prime. And what does that do? Well, what this will give rise to, this will give rise to an extra force on the other islands. So this will give rise to on each of the other islands, it will give some delta j, j zeta j of uh, um, at that time. 
Okay, and what's that going to be? Well, what that's going to be, that's going to be equal to then the just the sum, sorry, the Vj naught is coming from this island times nu naught of, uh, of T prime. Okay, so that's going to be the, uh, um, uh, the zeta. Okay. Now, what's that going to do? Well, that's going to change the new j on the, of the other strain. So this is going to then result in a change. This is going to result in a change. Okay, delta nu j. Okay, and we're interested in what that change can be at later times. So this, of course, can be at later times there with the t bigger than t prime. So that's its effect. Okay, well, what will its effect be? Well, roughly speaking, the effect of each one on each of the others is small because they're a very large number and there's a total number, the effect of each one is small. So we can approximate this effect here of this delta nu j. Is it gonna be the extra force, which is the zeta j times delta, the derivative of nu j at t with respect to zeta j t prime. Okay, so this is like the response. This is the response of, uh, um, of J to the um, changing the force on it, changing the zeta on it, right? Because the other ones, this is the force um, that the other ones are feeling. Um, we've now got the other ones that are feeling they are those. And so they'll get this extra force. Okay, So this is the, the effects of there. Okay. But what does this do? This is now change the new J. So the changing of the new J then, that'll give us a, a, a change back of the an extra sort of force on, on new naught, but now this force on new naught is going to be at this later time. Well, well how's it going to do that? Well, that's just got the VJ naught. We've now just got to sum this up here. Okay, so we've now got this is V naught J. So it's the feedback back coming on this. And then we've got the sum over all, uh, um, all J. Okay, so that's our extra force that we're going to, uh, um, um, that we're going to get. That's the extra force back on the uh, um, 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 on new naught. Okay, so what is that term? This term is going to have some average value. Why is it going to have an average value? Because we've got these two things here, which are correlated. This one is correlated with that. And then it's correlated exactly with this parameter um, um, uh, gamma. Okay, so what is this going to? Uh, um, uh, this is going to be in the limit of large numbers. Then this is going to be just the sum on j. Okay, of now we're going to get this parameter gamma coming from that averaging times this um, average of nu um, uh, j with respect to um, uh, zeta j at t in t prime. Okay, and this is then going to be times, um, and this is going to be then um, our quantity, which is just going to be r of t t prime, okay, times the new naught. At uh, um, uh, sorry, the, the New York T prime I've got I'm already there. Okay, so this is the quantity here. What this is here is this is this whole bit um, uh, coming in here. So this is this whole part. All of that is going to come down and give us the R. Okay, and sorry, I've got the gamma in the R, um, um, the R there. Um, so I've got the gamma times the um, um, the R. Okay, so what is the R? R is then going to have to be equal to this. Okay, so we now have a self consistency condition. So the crucial part here is we have the self consistency conditions. Self consistency for this approximation. And that's that statistically all the, the strains are equivalent. So there's nothing special about this one that I called uh, um, zero. So this self consistency has to be that this R. So here I applied the R into this equation. I applied the R, I applied the zeta. The zeta had some correlations. The R was a coming from a response, right? So this R here is a response. So that's the response, okay? And the C here is the correlations. Okay, so those have to be determined uh, um, um, uh, self-consistently, and th those are the zeta, and of course, then this, I have to determine the self-consistently, so I have to find the statistics of each of the new j, statistics for each of those. I have to compute the correlations, and then the self-consistency is that c of t and t prime is going to be the sum on j of the um, average of new j 
t um, nu j of t prime. Okay. And this is then the average over all of the noise. So this is really the average over all of the effects of the, um, uh, of the zeta j. Okay, so that's, that's the correlation function. And then I have similar for the response function, which I've already uh, um, um, written loud in terms of this, which is the sum on j of the uh, um, d nu. T prime, and then obviously I have to integrate those effects over all previous uh, um, over all previous times. Okay, so the effect in here, this is the effects of all the others. It's a Gaussian random variable with with, with correlations in it. I've got this response from the feedback of I on the other types and back again on the on type I. This is of course time lagged. There can be general time lag there, so it's integral all the way up to uh, um, T. And the coefficient of that coming from the correlations in the V's. Of the effect of i on j and the effect j on back on i has this uh, um, coefficient here a um, minus uh, um, gamma so this is a negative effect so this is a feedback effect that stops nu getting large okay so this effect here this effect here really is this kill the winner um, um, uh, kill the winner effect okay the effect on the others is the when the new i is big so when new i gets large that has the effects on the others they then do well and they give the feedback on this. Okay, so that brings it back down again and that's responsible for the, um, this dynamics up here. That's crucially responsible for this part here, which is the turnaround and stops them getting too big. Okay. If I do have the Q as well, the Q also of course stops them um, um, getting too big, but uh, for most of the time at least, we're just gonna um, um, ignore this term. Um, and um, um, it doesn't matter unless it's particularly large. Okay, so it has to be larger than the other effects to matter. And I say that's corresponding to assuming niche, niches, which we specifically don't want, to, uh, um, uh, don't want to do. Okay, so this is the basic structure then of the, um, of the dynamical um, I mean field theory. Um, just one last second. Um, okay. um, this is the, the basic structure of the, of the dynamical field, meal, field dynamical mean field theory. And now our task is a simple task, seemingly simple task, that one has to figure out then self-consistently these, uh, um, uh, these two functions. And so we have to get these, once we figured out the new, we assume something and then we solve, okay? Then we've got an additional self-consistency. We then with the migration, so if I then plus adding the migration, Okay, so how do I do that? I assume some new i um, bar, generally will be dependent on t. So I assume some new i bar, then I compute, I get the actual new i's coming, um, uh, coming out from, uh, um, from that. And then this has to be equal to uh, um, that. So I compute the new, um, and then I have to make it self-consistent. So the time average of the, uh, um, um, of the new, well, sorry, that's actually it's the average of the islands. Um, um, the one over i times the sum on the islands of, uh, of new i has to be equal to new bar. Okay, and of course I need to adjust that. So I assume new bar, I get a new i, and then I have to adjust until I get this. Okay, so what's gonna happen? Well, there are gonna be some news which go extinct. So sometimes we will get that this will go extinct. Um, and so I'll have some fraction here where it's uh, um, extinct. So some strains with no solution which is big, bigger those and those go globally extinct. Sorry, Daniel. Daniel, can, yes. can I make a question? So, yes. Uh, so the nu i are uh, broadly distributed. Uh, you said that uh, at any given time uh, there is one uh, few few of them that will dominate the sum. Yes. Right? Yes. So, is this approach uh, uh, does? Is there any problem with this approach where you take uh, where you assume essentially that uh, things are self-averaging? Yes. yes. 
So the condition that one needs is that the number which are large at any time is big. And the number which is large at any time is basically going to be the total number divided by this factor because they're roughly uniform on that scale. So the condition we actually need is not that k be much bigger than one, but k be much bigger than this parameter here, this, this log. Okay, but this is this is a, you know, a modestly a modestly large parameter. In practice, the with you know in modest k that one can see this a phase. So like I've got here, in practice, it often is only dominated by a few of them. Okay, so this is not in the regime where the mean field theory is strictly valid. And associated with that also, we have these fluctuations because the number of islands is not very large. Okay. So this is showing from modest numbers, one can do it for larger numbers, and there's ways of trying to get um, um, convergence numerically. So that's a good, a good point, is that strictly speaking, I did have many large at the same time. However, it turns out they turn around fast enough that only having a small number large at the same time, the behavior is essentially the same. But that's one of those things that we can put in afterwards and understand, uh, um, um, understand that. Yeah, thank you. That's an important question. There's a raised hand by Amu. Oh, yeah. Um... I guess, could you remind me what you took to infinity um, in terms yeah. of population? So the things I took to infinity is k to infinity. So that gets around this problem that Matteo just, um, just raised. That means I always have a large number of, um, um, affecting all the others. And that's coming in here, the fact that I've got a sum over large number of roughly independent things. Okay. Um, yes, so and then the, I also took the number of islands to, um, um, uh, to infinity. Um, and the reason I can do that is then I can treat the um, self-consistently of the number of islands. I can treat this as something which doesn't depend much on the islands. These are going to be roughly independent of each other because of the, the chaos, the un uncorrelated chaos. And so I'll get something which is well-behaved average there. But again, one can, I'll, I'll make something you can go on number of islands. So then the Lagrange multiplier then, what, at what level is it keeping... Um... The, the, okay, so I also have to adjust the uh, um, uh, the epsilon. Okay, I need to adjust that um, that as well. That I can do as I go along with the um, um, uh, with the dynamics. It's part of the same uh, um, same thing. So I better put that also in uh, um, um, in here. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm finding the new of x. This is I get this, and I also get uh, um, um, and I also have to get the um, epsilon of t. Sorry for not having said that on um, that part. Thank you. The upsilon t um, will be because again the, the the large number of types in the statistics being the same. The upsilon t can be the same on each island after um, transient. Thank so you. I'm, I'm now going to simplify um, uh, simplify things. So some strains have gone um, globally extinct, and then the assumption is that the rest go to a, a, a statistical steady state. Okay, the statistical steady state, and that means that, for example, the correlation function will just be a f function of t minus t prime. Okay, the response function will also just be response function of t minus t prime. Okay, the um, epsilon will be approximately constant. Okay. So I'll have a, th those, uh, um, uh, those simplifications and each new bar, it'll still depend on I, okay? Um, this will also go to a, a, a constant, but depends on I, depends on the strain. Okay, but it'll lose its time dependence. So now I've got a time translation variant problem and I can try to solve that, okay? Now I'd just like to make a side note for people who've seen the number mean field theory in spin glass context or other contexts. Usually in people, the situation people do, you can take these um, a correlation response function, you can go back in and work it out and you can directly get a self-consistent equation for the correlation response function. And once you've done that, you no longer need to do the stochastic dynamics. Here, we don't have that behavior. Here, you have to do the full stochastic dynamics. You have to assume a zeta. You have to do the stochastic dynamics, understand the statistics of the new, get the average of it, get the correlations of it. These quantities here both have long tails in time. This has a long tail in time. This has long tails in time. And you have to work through all those self consistently. And that's what's hard. Okay, so the, the real challenge here is sort of the applied math problem now of going and trying to understand this um, uh, self consistently. So that's the, done in, in detail in this um, 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 in the PNAS paper. 
So we have to assume we get a steady state and then we work out all of these things ultimately. Okay? So what I want to just do is I want to do a bit of the, um, uh, a bit of the heuristics um, to give a flavor of, of that. And since the, the distributions are on abroad, the natural thing is to look at the log variables, to look on a log scale. Okay, so I'm going to define Li is going to be um, the log of a new i. Okay, so L actually got, I mean, goes negative because the new is bounded by um, the new is bounded by one. And then I can write that I've got the log i um, um, uh, dot here. So this is now just going um, uh, just going up and down. So it has this part coming from the, um, uh, the zeta i um, of t minus the um, epsilon, which is roughly a constant. And then it has this feedback um, effect of the uh, um, of the r times the um, up to t. Um, this is now t minus t prime of uh, um, the n. Well, what is the n? The n is going to be e to the now l at an earlier time, right? And there you see the exponential weighting, if you like, in terms of the natural variables, which are the, um, uh, the l's. Okay, then there's going to be part, the other part, which is just going to be the minus the migration out. But then the important thing is that the migration in, the migration in has this average coming in um, here, which is now just a constant. But now, of course, that's divided by n. So that means this has an e to the minus l here. Okay, has an e to the minus l of t. Okay, so these are all functions of t. Has an e to the minus l of t. So what does this do? Okay, this one here cuts it off at the top end, right? When l gets large, it cuts it off. This one here gives you a floor that you're not likely to go down much below this. Okay, so this term here, this term here keeps L usually being um, uh, bigger um, than um, log one over M times this new I bar. Okay, so what is that? That's this exactly in this picture, um, uh, this picture here. That's exactly what this floor is. So that's this floor, which is set by, uh, um, um, which is set by this. We have to adjust that floor self consistently. If this is a not very good type, then I'll go up and come down. Okay. Oh, and I should I, let me put in the uh, um, leave in the SI um, um, in here. Okay. So what do I want to do? Well, I want to divide this into two things. I want to look at this, and then it's going to have some average value. Okay. So in the steady state, that's going to have some average value, but that's going to depend on i. So I have a quantity then, which I'm going to call psi i, okay? And that's going to have several parts. It's going to be si plus the average over time. This is going to be the average over time, um, the um, uh, minus the epsilon, okay? And then of course, I've also got a part of the zeta which isn't average over time. So I've got an extra part which doesn't average. Um, so I can write zeta as the average um, uh, zeta plus some eta, where the average of eta equals zero. Okay, so I have some other part there, and the eta has the correlations associated with the remainder part of the uh, um, of this. Okay. So now this will depend upon the i, and this I'm going to call the bias. Okay, what is that? Well, in connection of things that Stefano Alcina talked about, what this is, this is just the invasion eigenvalue from small numbers. Why is that? Well, if I look back up at my um, equation here, if I look where nu is small, and it's been small in the past, this is what's going to determine how it invades. Okay, so this is exactly the invasion uh, um, uh, 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 the invasion eigenvalue. Okay, so this is the invasion eigenvalue. Okay. Now the surprising thing is. Well, the not surprising thing is if, if, if minus psi i, if it's strongly negative, so it's strongly negative, they'll get they go extinct. Okay, but psi i can be less than zero, but bigger than some critical, um, um, uh, critical value, which is negative. It can be in that range, it can still persist. Okay, so a crucial thing here is even things that are biased downwards on average, even things that are biased downwards on average can um, persist. And in fact, they can be biased down quite strongly on, uh, um, 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 on average. And the reason that they, um, um, uh, that they persist, sorry, 
Um, the reason that they persist here is associated with what this uh, um, um, uh, form is here of what comes on. Okay? So even though on average they're going downwards, they're being pushed down towards there, they've got um, this effect here which stops them. Okay? But in order for that to work, in order for that to work, they have to burst upwards. So they have to, even though they hang out down near here, if the psi is quite strongly negative, they hang out down near here, but occasionally they burst upwards. Those blooms are crucial. Without those blooms, you don't survive. Okay. So you need order to keep the new eye bar up, you have to um, bloom. And in order for this to happen, they need to have occasional blooms. Okay, and those blooms then is what dominates the new eye, um, uh, the new eye ball. Okay, so you work have to work out the statistics of those blooms. That's a, that, that's subtle, and the reason that's subtle is that these R and Cs have long range uh, um, uh, correlations in time. So the R and the C here and the correlation function both have long range correlations in time. They decay with a two thirds exponent over some range. They have two other different regimes as well, um, and it gets and life gets very complicated. But the crucial thing is one has to understand the statistics of these blooms. Okay, and that's a rare event. Uh, um, um, uh, calculation, and they say this is coming from this is going to be the average of e to the li, right? Um, so it's the exponentially weighted average is dominated by when the l is anomalously close to zero, anomalously low. Okay, so this is now uh, uh, um, the um, uh, this is now the the problem that one has to uh, um, uh, that one has to solve. Okay, so I'm not going to go into more of that. This gives you a sort of qualitative picture of the uh, um, uh, behavior. Um, it turns out that most of them actually persist with most of the parameter range, unless the migration gets large. You actually get most of them persi persisting. Only a few of them um, uh, uh, go extinct. Most of them persist. You can work out what this is, how it depends on the parameters, at least roughly. So this is all doing asymptotics. There's almost no things you can write down exactly. You can write down sort of bounds on things, which really give you useful results. But the crucial thing is understanding the statistics of these blooms. The crucial thing is seeing how they give rise to long time correlations in the response and correlation functions. Okay, so that's that. That's the basic uh, um, um, uh, basic behavior. Okay, so I just want to I think add a um, add a page here. Um, okay. Okay. So what we want to just ask about is the robustness of this phase. Okay, so um, uh, Roy, Felix Roy and collaborators have looked at this um, for gamma equals zero, so independent interactions and um, Q being uh, um, uh, positive, but not um, uh, too large. Um, well, it's, it's order K, root K, but not, um, not too large. Okay, and they find similar behavior. There's some um, differences associated with what happens, how they turn around when they get large. So if something comes up and when it gets large, it's turned around by the cue um, rather than by the response, but uh, rather than by the feedback, but the behavior is qualitatively similar. Okay, so it seems as if this actually applies over very large parts of the sort of phase diagram in the basic, uh, um, basic model. Okay. So that's one part, but another part of looking at the robustness is what happens if I have finite number of islands. Okay, so if it's finite n, finite um, population on each island, okay, then if, um, if mn, so the total migration into each island is large, okay, then it's still okay. You, so ex, some extra ones um, uh, go extinct, but most of the strains still um, persist. Okay, a few extras go extinct if the new bar falls below 1 over n. Okay, as I had in the figure. Okay, finite number of islands, and finite number of islands as well. Then what you do is you get the, the, the survival time, um, the uh, survival time in this population goes as e to the um, i um, uh, uh, a number of islands, so exponentially long, divided by some characteristic scale, which depends upon the bias of that type. It depends on log m, and it depends on log n. And again, figuring out what this uh, um, um, this is takes quite a bit of uh, um, uh, quite a bit of work. Okay, and one can check that numerically: ten islands and you know a hundred types. Um, I've forgotten what it is, eighty or something like that, have survive very long times, and some of them will survive as exponentially long times as the number of islands get large. Okay. So even though this is asymptotics, and in fact 
it's asymptotics in log variables. In some sense, it's asymptotics in log variables. It turns out that it's very uh, um, robust and so works over large, large ranges. We could add other features. We could add in um, some extra environmental stochasticity. We could add slight differences from island to island. Um, uh, 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 Felix and, and company have looked a bit at uh, on that. And again, the behavior seems to persist. So we really seem to have this robust phase for an assembled community with correlations in the interactions which are not strongly competitive, right? Gamma being positive, it's gone for more competitive interactions. This certainly is gonna persist for some positive gamma. We may persist in some sense all the way up to gamma just below one, um, but that we don't know yet. Okay, so we don't know how persistent this will be if I put in say interactions via um, chemicals in the, uh, um, um, in the environment. So that's still a lot of questions associated with that. Okay. So I want to um, um, to talk in the last bit about uh, um, um, whether this such a community can um, um, can evolve. But let me just pause here if there are questions at this uh, um, um, at this stage. Um, and I say I certainly don't expect you to understand this in, in detail, but to understand sort of spirit and how one does the the calculations and sort of the heuristics. Okay. So let's now ask the absolutely crucial question. We assume it was an assembled community. We let things go extinct, it stayed, but we wanna know, is this phase stable to evolution? Okay, and also can evolution give, uh, um, uh, give rise to this? Okay. So how do I want to, um, uh, want to evolve it? I want to take, just choose some strain I. Um, okay, so I'm to, we're gonna first look at this. We're gonna look at slow evolution. That's the hardest case as far as the um, things persisting. So we're gonna add one mutant at a time, uh, one mutant at a time, and we're gonna take type I and it's gonna to mutate to some type um, um, I tilde. So this is the mutant, it has a given parent and these will be correlated in some way. Their S's and the V's will be correlated in some way with a strength, with a strength rho. So root one minus rho squared is essentially like the difference between them, um, between the, the parent and the mutant. Okay? Now one has to do these correlations in the right way to keep the sort of cystics and so on um, in there. This bit we have some um, analytic understanding of it mostly, um, um, uh, uh, mostly numerical okay? at this stage. Okay, so this is now looking at the, um, what, uh, the, what happens. So I start with some number of types here. I start with number, some number of strains initially here. Those, uh, um, some fraction go extinct. So there's the rapid extinction here on the ecological time scales. Then we, we let it equilibrate and then we add one more. Okay, so we've add this mutant. We let it then equilibrate. Um, that'll drive some extinctions. Um, possibly some new extinctions. And of course, a crucial thing, if we're adding one, sometimes it'll drive the parent out, but much of the time, the parent and the offspring um, coexist and the mutant um, uh, coexist. They're slightly different from, um, uh, uh, from each other. Okay. And then I pick another random parent, I do the same thing again. So this is looking what, uh, um, uh, what happens. And if you start with a small number of types, you tend to get that it goes extinct. If you start with an intermediate number, it sort of fluctuates around and then starts uh, um, going up. And if you start with larger numbers, it just goes up. So this suggests that there's sort of roughly a threshold at which you need a threshold in the complexity that you need before it starts to take off. Now, where this is, it will depend upon the migration rate. It depends on much more details about the uh, model. We don't understand this quantitatively. We understand qualitatively what it's associated with. Okay? So when you go in here, the number of types tends to plummet. If you start with small numbers, you basically, it's exponentially rare um, in a small, a large exponential factor in order to get up and get going. Okay, so this behavior one won't see unless one sort of gets the community going in some way. But one could do that in various, uh, um, um, uh, various ways we haven't explored in detail. 
Okay. There's a very subtle thing, and this is what Aditya um, Mahadavan is working on, as to how the invasions actually occur. So how does a new type come in? And that turns out to be rather hard. And if it's too close to its parent, it's even, it's even harder. Um, for this, we haven't uh, ex um, explored the details of that um, yet, but say that we're working on now. Okay. So what happens? Is this something which is persistent? Well, here's now looking on longer time scales. So this is, of course, sometimes the, it doesn't invade at all, I should say. Um, sometimes the mutant doesn't come in. Um, so it equilibrate often the parent mutant, mutant some that sometimes, um, or even often, the mutant fails and doesn't invade. And sometimes it does. Um, if does, sometimes it replaces the parent. Can replace the parent. Okay. So what happens then? Well, depending on what the correlation is, so this is now putting in independent ones that's assembling the community more. This is very highly correlated ones, tiny differences between the parent and the offspring. Um, there, you don't really see much happening yet. Um, mostly happens here is that the, the, the mutants replace the, the parent. But as soon as you get, you decrease the correlations by a tiny bit, you start getting, if you add, you lose a half. Um, and so you just go up at a steady uh, um, rate. Actually, for, for these ones, sorry. Um, um, uh, you go even faster than that, okay? So this, this tends to come up fast. You get the community, which gets richer and richer as it goes along. Okay. However, this here, we assume there were no generalist mutations. What does that mean? You can do better in general by having all of your Vs larger or having all the Vs against you being less negative. Okay, but the bigger the population, the number of the community is, the less likely you are to have that uh, um, um, uh, to have that happen. Okay, so this has no generalist uh, mutations. What do I mean? We mean that the SIs, there's no SIs. The SIs are all zero. Okay, and SI would just mean that you'd better in general. If your SI is bigger than your parent, you're doing better your, than your parent in general. Okay. So what happens now if we put in generalist mutations? Okay. So we're going to do this, but we're going to make a variance of the sigmas. Um, uh, so the variance of the sigmas is going to be much less than uh, um, uh, one. That's the assumption initially that things are already pretty well adapted. They're pretty well adapted. But what then happens is you can still go out into the tail. So if I look at the distribution of the, uh, um, of the S's, so I look at the distribution of the uh, um, S's here, distribution of the, uh, the S's. So that's, I'll say it's some Gaussian, um, uh, Gaussian distribution initially, okay? Well, even very early on, if I look at the ones that, uh, um, that survive, I'll tend to not, most of these ones down here won't survive. So they'll go, um, uh, they'll go extinct. And as I go up, I will start to get, um, as, I, as I evolve and start to add types, I'll start to get that this distribution will tend to concentrate more and more towards the tail as I go up further, it'll concentrate even more towards the tail and it'll keep creeping up towards the tail. So this I go with successive, um, uh, successive invasions. Um, I go along and I start pushing it out towards the tail. Okay. What happens then is one can see that um, and you can look at the, um, uh, uh, the correlations here. If you look at the mean of the, pop, the um, S's that come in, so this is the generalist mutations, then you, that, that goes gradually upwards. You push further and further out into the, uh, um, further and further out into the tail, okay? The process also gets slower and slower because if you're an S here, if you find a smaller S, most of the time your mutant will have a smaller S, right? So when, once you get up in this regime here, okay, the most of the mutants, um, um, in fact, even the successful mutants. So the S of the mutant will be less than the S of the parent. Nevertheless, if it has good Vs, so it has good interactions, it can, uh, um, uh, it can invade. Okay? But generally, it's more likely to invade if its S is, uh, um, S is larger because it's got an overall average, high average growth rate or higher bias. Okay? So what happens in this case is it continues to diversify. It continues to diversify, it just gets slower and slower. So it's harder and harder to invade. It slows down, but we have a um, analytic understanding of this. And for at least for the Gaussian tails here, it should keep on growing um, um, indefinitely, um, but um, just getting more gradually slower and slower. Okay, so even if you allow the generalist mutations, this phase can still exist 
it evolves more slowly, it gets harder and harder to invade. That's of course a general property. If your things have evolved for the same in constant conditions, it will tend to get harder for new things to come in. Interestingly, if you didn't put specifically these generalist mutations in, that doesn't really matter. This just keeps on going up and the statistics don't change substantially. And the reason sort of is, is there are so many ways to do well up here that uh, um, it doesn't really, doesn't, doesn't really gain to sort of do better um, overall. You do better about whichever the current ones, uh, um, uh, current ones are. So it keeps going up uh, um, in a steady rate. A substantial fraction of all of the invaders can, uh, um, uh, can come in. When I get down so, here, most invaders fail. So most mutants fail, but you get, um, uh, you get, you get some and you, this will continue to grow. And this only grows logarithmically in, uh, um, um, uh, logarithmically in time. Could I ask a question? Yes. So if you, uh, so on some of these figures, the x-axis is successful invasions and some of them is time. So is time the same as attempted invasions or? Yeah, this is, um, what, this is uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so this time here, this is proportional to attempted, um, attempted invasions. And we haven't put in all the subtleties which you've thought about of, the, of that invasion process. Um, we allow them to come in at substantial numbers to make, it, uh, um, um, uh, uh, to, to make it easier to run things at a reasonable time. Okay, so this is the number of, of attempted invasions. Sorry, I should have said that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're not allowing reinvasion. So if something goes extinct, it stays extinct. So if you drive extinctions, then the um, um, they, they'll stay. They'll stay extinct. Okay, other other questions here. Okay. So if um, the the last thing I want to um, uh, talk about. And again, there's even less of just a tiny bit of a flavor on it is the question about the interactions. Okay, so everything we've done so far, everything we've done so far is that the phenotype of type I is defined by the interactions. Okay, so by the whole set of Vij with all of the others and the, and the, um, and similarly, so this is the phenotype uh, of, of type I. So that's a very weird thing to do. We can't just, have, we shouldn't be defining our phenotype by interactions. We should define it by some properties of the organism. Okay, so we want to look at phenotype models where the interactions are determined by properties of the organisms. Okay, so for this, I'm gonna go explicitly back to the bacteria and phage model. So I have now bacterial strains whole bunch of bacterial strains indexed by I, phage strains indexed here by ML, and the populations um, of the bacteria and the phage, and the bacteria dynamics, um, uh, uh, growth rate, um, killing by the phages, so the H's are all positive, um, competition with the other bacteria, uniform competition, no niche-like interactions. The phages will die without food, they will then grow with the, uh, um, uh, with the effects of bacteria, and the specificity to the extent that there is, is contained in these. Okay, and these then will have some average value. This is one species of phage, one species of uh, bacteria, right? So these are both of them a, a one, uh, um, a one species um, uh, of each and just strains. So they're not specialists. They, of course, they could evolve to be specialists, but we don't start off with them being, uh, um, being specialists. Okay, so what will the correlations look like? Will there be some average value, the F, and then so they're just only slightly different from each other, there'll be some small variations, delta F and delta H. Okay, and these will be, um, uh, those will be strongly correlated. Okay, now wh where do we think these are coming from? Well, this is now where I'm gonna put in the phenotype. Okay, so I'm gonna put a D-dimensional phenotype. Okay, and if you like crudely, this is the, this is the, this is the A is labeling the amino acids. Crude way in a receptor. So the bacteria has a receptor, the phage has a tail, and the tail binds to the receptor. And depending on how well it binds, that'll determine it. So we're doing the absolutely simplest thing here. There is only one phenotypic property of each. The bacteria has a receptor, the phage has a tail. That's a D dimensional thing, so it's just a string of numbers. The, and then the binding strength is just the, the I'm defining these in a way that they have energies. So it's just the binding between these. So this is the binding strength of the um, phage tail of type L to the bacteria of type I. Okay. And then I'm gonna assume that what the interactions do, what this, this interaction do, they, they will give rise through some function, 
to some function, the way that the bacteria harm the phage and the way that the phage feed on the bacteria. Okay, so the simplest thing to do would be to assume that it's a linear, um, um, a linear function. So the simplest is if this is linear. Okay, so if this is linear, a linear, then I get a low rank matrix. So my rate matrix of interactions, my matrix of interactions is gonna end up being low rank. Okay, and then you can't get much diversity. It's gonna be rank D um, limits the diversity. But what if I put in something which is somewhat more biologically um, uh, uh, biologically motivated? So if I look at what the effects of the, of the phage are on the bacteria, you know, if they don't bind much, it doesn't do much. Um, if they bind um, strongly, it, it, it does something. And if they bind more strongly, it sort of saturates. Once they're being killed, they're killed. It doesn't matter. Okay. For the phage, I want to put in a bit um, different function. Again, it's going to have this, um, um, uh, this behavior. Um, it's going to have similar behavior um, down here. Of course, it only affects it when the bacteria does, so it'll start coming up, okay? But one can imagine this will keep coming up harder. How well it binds might more strongly affect the, uh, um, um, the phage. It can keep doing better even once the bacteria has already um, died because it can get in more effectively and so on and maybe produce more. So these functions are different from uh, um, each other, but the fact that I've both got functions, they both depend on the, uh, um, on the same thing. So they both depend on the Gs. Right? This implies that these are correlated. Of course, it forces correlations in there. Okay, but it's correlation just coming from this phenotype and I can look at it being in there. Okay. So the only thing I know so far, roughly, is that if, um, uh, if D is bigger than about six, this is just numerically, um, uh, D is bigger than around six, so very low dimensional phenotypes. And, you, and for some functions H, and uh, um, uh, of G and F of G, at least for some functions, you get diversity continues to grow. So you get the similar behavior to uh, um, what I showed uh, um, um, up here. You get similar behavior to what uh, um, um, goes on, on here. You actually don't get this. You actually get something which is more like this. You get something more like this case, it's sort of bouncing around quite a lot. Sometimes it can have plunges, but it keeps on going up. Okay. So this leads rise to a very interesting conjecture that even with a low dimensional phenotype, okay, so D is not large, D is going to be some modest number, even with a low dimensional phenotype, and then deterministic um, interactions that are determined just by those phenotypes, that looks as if it give, can give rise to a continuously um, um, increasing phase, and it is of this, this spatial temporal decaudic phase. Okay, so it really is this, uh, um, um, this phase. And in fact, they do tend to do somewhat better as generalists. They, the back phage particularly tend to do somewhat uh, um, push towards the upper, um, upper end, but nevertheless, they don't become so generalist that, that's, that limits the uh, um, diversity, and they don't become particularly specialist either. You can look at the specialist and generalist correlation. Okay. So what have I um, um, done? I hope I've, I've um, got across some things. Okay. So the first thing is the value of trying to look at really simple models to get an idea of what can happen. And if something can happen in a simple model, then I would say that's not so surprising that we might see it in, in uh, nature. It doesn't mean we understand it, but it means we are not so surprised. Okay. There was one um, uh, a quantus I looked at uh, on the first day, um, which I've already sort of summarized as far as looking at evolution in a, a sort of snowscape where you continually change it. Okay. But the bit which ties much more into this um, school generally is the last two days where I've looked at these random lotka Volterra models. I motivated the randomness as coming from strains that were very closely um, related. So things were sums and differences of uh, um, the two effects. They were not much um, different overall, so the SIs were small. There were no niche interactions. I did not assume anything special about the interactions of a strain with its siblings being any stronger on average than its interactions with its 23rd cousins. Okay, so that was, that, that was the basic model. And then in those models, we now have a solid analysis and a very good theoretical understanding of the spatially temporal chaotic phase that can exist in those. 
when the correlations are in the sort of anti-symmetric di direction, but it seems to persist more generally if I have a bit of niche interactions or interactions via chemicals, which will give rise to uh, that with via resources which you're trying to consume. Okay. So that's the part which is, which is uh, solid. Um, and one can think about what its predictability is for, um, uh, for nature. One thing I forgot to um, um, say in talking about that um, uh, robustness um, was that we would really like to add, um, um, or put it in as a question mark, um, real spatial structure so that my um, uh, interaction, my things can't move all over the place. And this is particularly um, relevant in the, uh, um, uh, in the ocean where things are getting moved around by uh, um, uh, turbulence. Okay, and so certainly if one wants to make contact with reality, one has to think about, um, think about that. Okay. The other bits on this question about it can, whether it can evolve, it is certainly again possible that these models can evolve higher and higher um, um, diversity. Under what circumstances that tends to get slower and slower, we don't, uh, um, we don't know. Um, the specific assumptions about everything, interact with everything that is responsible for some of that slowing down. And if one goes away from that and looks at more sort of hierarchical interactions like I guess Josh or Waits particularly talked about, then uh, um, maybe the diversity can increase more, um, uh, more easily. And then the very last bit, which is even more speculative in connection with these phenotype models, is that you do not need high dimensional nano phenotype to get diversity, okay? So in my sense in which I talked about before of what matters, this is the dimension of the nano phenotype, right? So this was the nano, uh, um, uh, the nano phenotype. Um, uh, it was the only things that matter in this, uh, um, uh, in this model, which is determine how they interact with each other. And that's sufficient, at least in principle, to give rise to increasing, uh, um, uh, increasing diversity. And you don't need to have high dimension, um, um, high dimensions to do that. Okay. This turns out to be somewhat hard to find if you, if you choose the wrong, um, the wrong functions or if you choose functions that maybe are nicer than the one, more reasonable than the ones which, which I used, it's going to be harder to get it. But uh, um, um, I think that's, there's a lot to be still understood in, uh, in this. So there's a huge number of open questions, a lot of interesting directions. Some of those we're trying to uh, um, um, trying to pursue, and there's still more needed on understanding the things that I have uh, um, um, have talked about. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop uh, um, stop there, and apologies for going on um, too long and for going too fast on uh, um, um, on much of it. But as I hope, I at least got some of the flavor uh, flavor across. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's. Uh... See whether there are any further questions from the audience. So you mentioned if you change H of G and F of G, that is it, so that does that increase the um, the dimension needed to have uh, diversity? Well, it, it does increase the dimension, and it's not clear with at least some H and G, which sort of are reasonable forms, it's not clear you actually get this diversification at all. What you do is you get things that look more like, uh, um, uh, more like this. You start with a, uh, some number, you know, the numbers sort of hang out for a while, maybe it gets a bit more diverse and then it crashes and it's hard to get it back, okay? And even if you start with bigger numbers, you get similar things coming down. By the way, I should mention, if you take the perfectly anti-symmetric model on one island, you get the same thing. No matter how big a number you start with, um, the, the, there's an overall tendency for it to decrease. That model is not stable to, uh, um, to evolution, even within the very perfect anti-symmetric model there. Okay, it's not stable, it tends to go down. We don't have a general understanding of in what cases models will go up, in what cases they'll go down. Okay. That's like understanding, you know, when you take a microscopic model and you ask, does it form a superconductor or an insulator or something else? We have no idea how to do that still in physics. But what we do know is if something happens, then a whole bunch of other things happen as well. And so here, once it sort of starts going up, we have some understanding of whether it'll continue. When the, with the generalist mutations, we have some understanding that once it goes, starts going up, then it'll tend to slow down in a particular way. And we can sort of predict how this, uh, um, um, uh, how this does, uh, um, does that. Um, and so the, we have some um, understanding of that with the phenotype models, I don't have much understanding. The subtle thing, is you have to, these can't be perfectly correlated. These can't be equal to each other. They have to be some different function. So you need sort of sufficient correlations, but not too much. I think if you put in a little bit of extra um, kinds of uh, um, uh, phenotypes coming in as well, so it isn't just as one quantity, it's maybe two quantities, two different proteins, say, are important. 
then you can maybe be able to get it more, more easily, okay? So this is now where I'm gonna to appeal to biology. Okay? Everything that we see is conditional upon evolution. And looking back conditional upon evolutionary success over long times, things are gonna look special. They're gonna look at the special things that happened. Okay? So my feeling is if one has a sort of, you know, choice of models or models in different regimes, with one of which can give rise to um, continuing, ev continuing evolution, diversification, and the other one can't, then the longer term effects of the, the evolution, which are ones which are often the things that just happen to have happened and made the evolution keep going, is going to mean that one is going to end up in sort of a phase where things wander around. Okay. So the concrete thing I would say is in my, the random landscape models with just a single strain, there I believe there's a family of models also a generic family where you don't have um, uh, continued evolution with small um, feedback, okay, small ecological feedback. However, if you had such a system, it's also much less responsive to environmental changes. It's much more, um, be more, more likely to be destroyed by environmental changes. If you have one which tends to wander around, it'll wander around differently in different locations, and it's much more likely to be robust to environmental changes. So my sense is that the long-term evolution will drive these systems in a, in a way that will tend to uh, um, be the ones that, uh, um, um, uh, that have these kinds of, uh, these kind of properties. Okay? That does not mean there's evolutionary pressures to do that. What it means is that the ones which happen to be successful for very long times, and by producing lots of um, offspring in the sense of many types of bacteria or many types of insects, that those ones are going to be ones that along the way somehow got these properties but it doesn't mean there's necessary evolutionary pressures for it to do that. So I was getting more into the philosophical questions. Are there some, some concrete questions on some of the, the sort of analysis or the sort of ways of trying to, trying to do things? Okay, well, I said, if, if you have follow-up questions and a couple of you sent some really good um, follow-up questions um, uh, previously, I'm happy to answer them by, by email and they all may also prompt some things that might come up in the, in the discussions um, at, the, at the round table. So. Thank you. Thank you very much for these and preceding lectures. Uh, it's been a long day. And uh, thank you everybody who has followed our lectures today. And, um, We'll meet again on next Monday. Thank you. Have a good weekend, Bye. everyone. Nice.